Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Gardens of the Moon by Stephen Erickson, performed by Ralph Lister. Book Three The Mission Marionettes dance afield beneath masterly hands. I stumble among them, crossed by the strings in tangled two step, and curse all these fools in their mad pirouette. I shall not live as they do. Oh no, leave me in my circled dance. These unbidden twitchings you see, I swear on Hood's grave, is artistry in motion. Sayings of the Fuel Thene Buell Birth date unknown. Chapter 8 He stepped down then among women and men, the sigil stripped in her foul cleansing. There on the blood-soaked sand spilled the lives of emperor and first sword. So tragic this treachery. He was of the old guard, commanding the honed edge of empire's fury. And so in stepping down but not away, he remained the remembrance before her eyes, the curse of conscience she would not stand. A price was placed before him that he glanced over in first passing, unknowing and so unprepared, in stepping down among women and men. He found what he'd surrendered and damned its reawakening. The Bridge Burners Tok the Younger A quarter hour before dawn, the sky held the color of iron shot through with streaks of rust. Sergeant Whiskey Jack squatted on a dome of bedrock up from the pebble beach, gazing out over the misty calm surface of Lake Azure. Far to the south, on the lake's opposite shore, rose the faint glow of Darujistan. The mountain crossing of the night just past had been unpleasant, the quall tossed about in the midst of three warring thunderheads. It was a miracle no one had been lost. The rain had since stopped, leaving the air cool and clammy. He heard the sound of boots, accompanied by a clicking noise behind him. Whiskey Jack turned and straightened. Kalam and a black maranth approached, picking their way through the mossy tumble of rocks at the base of the slope. Behind them rose the shadowed redwood forest, the patched trunks standing like bearded sentinels against the mountainside. The sergeant drew a deep breath of the chill morning air. Everything's fine, Kalam said. The green maranth delivered as ordered, and more. Fiddler and Hedge are two happy sappers. Whiskey Jack raised an eyebrow. He turned to the black maranth. I thought your munitions were getting scarce. The creature's face remained in shadow beneath the hinged helmet. The words that came from it seemed born from a cavern, hollow and faintly echoing. Selectively, bird that steals. You are well known to us, Bridge Burner. You tread the enemy's shadow. From the Maranth, assistance will never be scarce. Surprised, Whiskey Jack looked away, the skin tightening around his eyes. The Maranth continued. You asked of the fate of one of our kind, a warrior with but one arm, who fought at your side in the streets of Nathilog many years ago. He lives still. The sergeant took a deep breath of the sweet forest air. Thank you, he said. We wish that the blood you next find on your hands is your enemies, bird that steals. He frowned, then gave a brusque nod and turned his attention back to Kalam. What else? The assassin's face became expressionless. Quick, Ben's ready he said. Good. Gather the others. I'll be laying out my plan. Your plan, Sergeant? Mine, Whiskey Jack said firmly. The one devised by the Empress and her tacticians is being rejected, as of now. We're doing it my way. Get going, Corporal. Kalam saluted, then left. Whiskey Jack stepped down from the rock, his boots sinking into the moss. Tell me, Maranth, 
Might a squadron of your black be patrolling this area two weeks from now? The Moranth's head swiveled audibly toward the lake. Such unscheduled patrols are common. I expect to command one myself in two weeks' time. Whiskey Jack gazed steadily at the black armored warrior standing beside him. I'm not quite sure how to take that, he said eventually. The warrior faced him. We are not so unalike, he said. In our eyes, deeds have measure. We judge. We act upon our judgments. As in pale, we match spirit with spirit. The sergeant frowned. What do you mean? 18,739 souls departed in the purge of Pale. One for each Maranth confirmed as a victim of Pale's history of enmity toward us. Spirit with spirit, bird that steals. Whiskey Jack found he had no response. The Maranth's next words shook him deeply. There are worms within your empire's flesh, but such degradation is natural in all bodies. Your people's infection is not yet fatal. It can be scoured clean. The Maranth are skilled at such efforts. How exactly? Whiskey Jack paused, choosing his words carefully. Do you intend this scouring? He recalled the wagons piled with corpses, winding out of pale, and struggled against the ice tingling along his spine. Spirit with spirit, the Moranth answered, returning his attention to the city on the south shore. We depart for now. You will find us here in two weeks' time, bird that steals. Whiskey Jack watched the black Moranth walk away, pushing through the thickets surrounding the clearing where his riders waited. A moment later, he heard the rapid thud of wings, then the call rose above the trees. The Moranth circled once overhead, then turned north, slipping between the bearded boles and heading upslope. The sergeant sat down on the bedrock again, his eyes on the ground as the members of his squad arrived, hunkering down around him. He remained silent, seeming unaware that he had company his brow furrowed and jaw bunching as he ground his molars with a slow, steady precision. Sarge, Fiddler said quietly. Startled, Whiskey Jack looked up. He drew a deep breath. Everyone had gathered with the exception of Quick Ben. He'd leave Kalam to fill in the wizard later. All right. The original plan's been scrapped, since it was intended to get us all killed. I didn't like that part, so we'll do it my way, and hopefully get out alive. We ain't going to mind the city gates? Fiddler asked, glancing at Hedge. No, the sergeant answered. We'll put those Moranth munitions to better use. Two objectives, two teams. Kalam will lead one, and with him will be Quick Ben, and... He hesitated. And sorry. I'll lead the other team. The first task is to get into the city unnoticed. Out of uniform. He looked to Mallet. I take it the green delivered? The healer nodded. It's a local make, all right. Eighteen-foot fisher, four oars, should get us across the lake easy enough. Even a couple of nets included. So, we'll do some fishing, Whiskey Jack said. Coming into the harbour without a catch would look suspect. Anybody here ever fished? There was silence. Then Sorry spoke up. I have, a long time ago. Whiskey Jack stared at her, then said, Right, pick whoever you need for that. Sorry smiled mockingly. Whiskey Jack pulled his gaze from hers, with an oath under his breath. He eyed his two saboteurs. How much munitions? Two crates, Hedge replied, adjusting his leather cap. Cusses all the way down to smokers. We could cook a palace, Fiddler added, shifting about excitedly. Good enough, Whiskey Jack said. All right, everyone listen and pay attention, or we won't come out of this alive. In a secluded glade in the forest, 
Quick Ben poured white sand in a circle and sat down in its center. He took five sharpened sticks and set them in a row before him, pushing them to various depths in the loam. The center stick, the highest, rose about three feet. The ones on either side stood at two feet and the outer ones at a foot. The wizard uncoiled a yard's length of thin gut string. He took one end and fashioned a scaled-down noose, which he tightened over the center stick near the top. He ran the line to the left, looping it once over the next shaft, then crossed over to the right side and looped it again. He brought the string across to the far left stick, muttering a few words as he did so. He wrapped it twice and brought it over to the far right stick, where he tied a knot and cut the trailing string. Quick Ben leaned back and folded his hands on his lap. A frown creased his brow. Hairlock! An outer stick twitched, turned slightly, then fell still. Hairlock! He barked again. All five shafts jerked. The center one bent toward the wizard. The string tautened, and a low-pitched hum emanated from it. A cold wind swept across Quick Ben's face, stripping away the beads of sweat that had gathered in the last minute. A rushing sound filled his head, and he felt himself falling through dark caverns, their unseen walls ringing in his ears as if iron hammers clanged against the rock. Flashes of blinding silver light stung his eyes, and the wind pulled at the skin and flesh of his face. In some shielded part of his mind, he retained a sense of distance, of control. Within this calm, he could think, observe, analyze. Hellock, he whispered. You've gone too far, too deep. This warren has swallowed you and will never spit you out. You're losing control, Hellock. But these thoughts were for him alone. He knew the puppet was still distant. He watched himself continue, spinning, whirling through the caverns of chaos. Hairlock was compelled to match him, only upward. Abruptly, he found himself standing. Beneath his feet, the black rock seemed to swirl, cracked here and there in its slow convolutions by bright, glowing red. Looking around, he saw that he stood on a spire of rock, rising at an angle, its jagged apex a dozen feet in front of him. Turning, his gaze followed the spar as it sank down and out of sight, lost to billowing. A moment of vertigo gripped Quick Ben. He tottered, then as he regained his balance, he heard a chuckle behind him. He turned to see Hairlock perched atop the apex, his wooden body smeared and scorched, the doll's clothing ripped and frayed. Quick Ben asked, This is the spar of Andy, isn't it? Hairlock's round head bobbed. Halfway. Now you know how far I have gone, wizard. To the very foot of the warren, where power finds its first shape and all is possible. Just not very likely, Quick Ben said, eyeing the marionette. How does it feel, standing in the middle of all that creation, but unable to touch it, to use it? It's too alien, isn't it? It burns you with every reach. I'll master it, Hairlock hissed. You know nothing, nothing. Quick Ben smiled. I've been here before, Hairlock. He scanned the swirling gases around them, scudding on contrary winds. You have been lucky, he said. Though they are few in number, there are creatures who call this realm home. He paused and turned his smile on the puppet. They dislike intruders. Have you seen what they do to them? What they leave behind? The wizard's smile broadened at seeing Hairlock's involuntary jerk. So you have, he said quietly. You are my protector, Hairlock snapped. I'm bound to you, wizard. The responsibility is yours, nor will I hide the fact if I am taken. Bound to me indeed. Quick Ben lowered himself to his haunches. Good to hear your memories come back. Tell me, how fares Tattersail? The puppet slumped, looking away. 
Her recovery is a difficult one. Quick Ben frowned. Recovery? From what? The hound gear tracked me. Hairlock shifted uneasily. There was a skirmish. A scowl grew on the wizard's face. And? The puppet shrugged. Gear fled, sorely wounded by a mundane sword in the hands of that captain of yours. Tashrin then arrived, but Tattersail had slipped into unconsciousness by then, so his search for answers was thwarted. But the fire of suspicion has been stoked beneath him. He sends out his servants, and they stalk the Warrens. They hunt for signs of who and what I am. And why? Tashrin knows your squad is involved. He knows that you're trying to save your own skins. The puppet's mad gaze flickered. He wants you all dead, wizard. And as for Tattersail, perhaps he hopes her fever will kill her so he won't have to. But there is much he'd lose if she died without his questioning her first. No doubt he'd seek out her soul. He'd pursue what she knows into Hood's own realm. But she'd know enough to be elusive. Shut up for a minute. Quick Ben ordered. Back to the beginning. You said Captain Parron stabbed Gear with his sword? Hairlock scowled. I did. A mortal weapon. It shouldn't have been possible. He may well have dealt the hound a fatal wound. The puppet paused, then growled. You've not told me everything, wizard. There are gods involved in this. If you keep me in such ignorance, I might well stumble into the path of one of them. He spat. A slave to you is bad enough. Do you think you could challenge a god for mastery of me? I'd be taken, turned, perhaps even. Hairlock unsheathed one of his small knives. Used against you. He advanced a step, a dark glitter in his eyes. Quick Ben raised an eyebrow. Inside, his heart lurched in his chest. Was it possible? Would he not have detected something? A flavour? A hint of immortal presence? One last thing, wizard, Hairlock murmured, taking another step. Tattersail's fever crested just this night past. She screamed something about a coin. A coin that had spun. But now it has fallen. It has bounced. It has entered someone's hand. You must tell me about this coin. I must have your thoughts, wizard. The puppet stopped suddenly and looked down at the knife in his hand. Hairlock hesitated, seeming confused, then sheathed the weapon and squatted. What's so important about a coin? He growled. Nothing. The bitch raved. She was stronger than I had thought. Quick Ben froze. The puppet seemed to have forgotten that the wizard was present. The thoughts he now heard were Hairlock's own. He realized he was looking through the shattered window into the puppet's insane mind. And it was there that all the danger lay. The wizard held his breath as Hairlock continued, its eyes fixed on the clouds below. Gear should have killed her, would have, if not for that idiot captain. What irony! He now tends to her and puts his hand to his sword whenever I seek to come near. He knows I would snuff her life in an instant. But that sword, what god plays with this fool noble? The puppet spoke on, but his words dwindled into inaudible mumbles. Quick Ben waited, hoping for more, though what he had already heard was enough to set his heart pounding. This mad creature was unpredictable, and all that held him in check was a tenuous control the strings of power he had attached to Hairlock's wooden body. But with this kind of madness came strength. Enough strength to break those strings? The wizard was no longer as sure of his control as he had been. Hairlock had fallen silent. His painted eyes still flickered with black flame, the leaking of chaotic power. Quick Ben took a step forward. Pursue Tashrin's plans! he commanded. Then he kicked hard. The toe of his boot struck Hairlock's chest and sent the puppet spinning. Hairlock flew out over the edge, then fell downward. 
His outraged snarl dwindled as he disappeared into the yellow clouds. Quickben drew a deep breath of the thick, stale air. He hoped that his abrupt dismissal had been enough to skew Hairlock's recollections of the past few minutes. Still, he felt those strings of control growing ever more taut. The more this warren twisted Hairlock, the more power he would command. The wizard knew what he'd have to do. Hairlock had given it to him, in fact. Still, Quickben wasn't looking forward to it. The taste of sour bile rose into his mouth, and he spat over the ledge. The air stank of sweat, and it was a moment before he realized it was his own. He hissed a curse. Time to leave, he muttered. He raised his arms. The wind returned with a roar, and he felt his body flung up, up into the cavern above, then the next. As the caverns blurred by, a single word clung to his thoughts, a word that seemed to twist around the problem of Hairlock like a web. Quick Ben smiled, but it was a smile responding to terror. And the word remained, Gear. And with that name, the wizard's terror found a face. Whiskey Jack rose amid silence. The expressions arrayed around him were sober, eyes downcast or fixed elsewhere, closed into some personal, private place where swam the heaviest thoughts. The lone exception was Sorry, who stared at the sergeant with bright, approving eyes. Whiskey Jack wondered who was doing the approving within those eyes. Then he shook his head, angry that something of Quick Ben and Kalam's suspicions had slipped into his thoughts. He glanced away to see Quick Ben approaching. The wizard looked tired, an ashen tint to his face. Whiskey Jack's gaze snapped to Kalam. The assassin nodded. Everyone, look alive, he said. Load up the boat and get it ready. Mallet leading the way, the others headed down to the beach. Waiting for Quick Ben to arrive, Kalam said, the squad looks beat, Sergeant. Fiddler, Trots, and Hedge moved enough dirt in those tunnels to bury the Empire's dead. I'm worried about them. Mallet, he seems to be holding together so far. Still, whatever Sorry knows about fishing, I doubt any one of us could row their way out of a bathtub. And we're about to try crossing a lake, damn near big as a sea. Whiskey Jack's jaw tightened. Then he forced a casual shrug into his shoulders. You know damn well that any warrant opening anywhere near the city will likely be detected. No choice, Corporal. We row. Unless we can rig up a sail. Kalam grunted. Since when does the girl know about fishing? The sergeant sighed. I know. Came out of nowhere, didn't it? Bloody convenient. Quick Ben reached the Dome of Rock. Both men fell silent at seeing his expression. I am about to propose something you're going to hate, the wizard said. Let's hear it, Whiskey Jack replied, in a voice empty of feeling. Ten minutes later, the three men arrived on the slick, pebbled beach, both Whiskey Jack and Kalam looking shaken. A dozen yards from the water's edge sat the fisher boat. Trots was straining on the rope attached to the prow hook, gasping and moaning as he leaned forward with all his weight. The rest of the squad stood in a clump off to one side, quietly discussing Trot's futile efforts. Fiddler chanced to look up. Seeing Whiskey Jack marching toward them, he blanched. Trots! the sergeant bellowed. The bar guest face, woed tattoos stretched into illegibility, turned to Whiskey Jack with wide eyes. Let go of the rope, soldier. Kalam released an amused snort behind Whiskey Jack, who glared at the others. Now, he said, his voice harsh, since one of you idiots convinced everyone else that loading all the equipment into the boat when it's still on shore was a good idea, you can all man the rope and drag it into the lake. Not you, Trots. You get inside, get comfortable, there at the stern. Whiskey Jack paused. He studied Sorry's expressionless face. From Fiddler and Hedge, I expect this, but I thought I'd put you in charge of setting things up. 
Sorry shrugged. Whiskey Jack sighed. Can you rig us a sail? There's no wind. Well, maybe there will be, Whiskey Jack said, exasperated. Yes, Sorry answered. We have some canvas. We'll need a mast. Take Fiddler and make one. Now the rest of you, get this boat into the water. Trotz climbed inside and sat down at the stern. He stretched out his long legs and draped an arm over the splashboard. He bared his filed teeth in what might have been a smile. Whiskey Jack turned to a grinning Kalam and Quick Ben. Well, he demanded, what are you waiting for? The grins died. Chapter 9 Have you seen the one who stands apart, cursed in a ritual, sealing his kind? Beyond death the host amassed and whirling like a plague of pollen. He stands apart, the first among all, ever veiled in time, yet outcast and alone, a Talani mass wandering like a seed unfallen. Lay of Onos Tulan, Tok the Younger Tok the Younger leaned forward in his saddle and spat. It was his third day out from Pale, and he longed for the city's high walls around him. The rivy plain stretched out on all sides, cloaked in yellow grass that rippled in the afternoon wind, but otherwise featureless. He scratched the edges of the wound that had taken his left eye, and muttered under his breath, something was wrong. He should have met her two days past. Nothing was going as planned these days. What with Captain Parron vanishing before even meeting Whiskey Jack, and the story making the rounds about a hound attacking the second's last surviving mage and leaving fourteen dead marines in its wake. He supposed he shouldn't be surprised that this rendezvous had gone awry as well. Chaos seemed a sign of the times. Tok straightened and rose in his saddle. Though there was no true road as such on the plain, Merchant caravans had mapped a rough track running north-south along the western edge. Trade had since died out, but the passing of generations of wagons and horse trains had left its mark. The center of the plain was home to the rivi, those small, brown-skinned people who moved with the herds in a seasonal cycle. Though not warlike, the Malazan Empire had forced their hand, and now they fought and scouted alongside Caladan Brood's Tista Andi legions against the Empire. Moranth reports placed the Rivi far to the north and east, and Tok was thankful for that. He was feeling very alone out in this wasteland, yet loneliness was a lesser evil, all things considered. Tok's single eye widened. It seemed he wasn't so alone after all. Perhaps a league ahead, ravens wheeled. The man cursed and loosened the scimitar sheathed at his hip. He fought the urge to push his horse into a gallop and settled for a quick trot. As he neared, he saw trampled grass off to one side of the trader's track. The cackling laughter of the ravens was the only sound to break the stillness. They had already begun feeding. Tok reined in his horse and sat unmoving in his saddle hunched forward. None of the bodies he saw looked as if they were apt to start moving, and the raven's preoccupied squabbling was good evidence that any survivors had long gone. Still, he had a bad feeling about this. Something hung in the air, something between a smell and a taste. He waited, for what he wasn't certain, but a reluctance to move gripped him. All at once, he identified the strangeness he felt. Magic. It had been unleashed here. I hate this, he muttered, then dismounted. The ravens gave him room, but not much. Ignoring their outraged shrieks, he approached the bodies. They numbered twelve in all. Eight wore the uniforms of Malazan marines. But these weren't average soldiers. His gaze narrowed on the silver sigils on their helmets. Jakarta can, he said. Elites. They'd been cut to pieces. He turned his attention to the remaining bodies and felt a tremor of fear run through him. 
No wonder the Jakarta can had taken such a beating. Tok strode to one of the bodies and crouched beside it. He knew something of the clan markings among the Bargast, how each hunter group was identified through their woad tattooing. The breath hissed between his teeth, and he reached out to turn the savage's face toward him. Then he nodded. These were Ilgri's clan. Before the Crimson Guard had enlisted them, their home territory had been 1,500 leagues to the east, among the mountains just south of the Porul. Slowly, Tok rose. The Ilgres numbered among the strongest of those who had joined the Crimson Guard at Black Dog Forest. But that was 400 leagues north. So what had brought them here? The stench of spilled magic wafted across his face, and he turned, his eye fixing on a body he hadn't noticed before. It lay beside scorched grass. So, he said, my question's answered. This band had been led by a Bargash shaman. Somehow, they'd stumbled onto a trail, and this shaman had recognized it for what it was. Tok studied the shaman's body, killed by a sword wound in the throat. The unleashing of sorcery had been the shaman's, but no magic had opposed him. And that was odd, particularly since it was the shaman who had died, rather than whomever he had attacked. Tok grunted. Well, she said to be tough on mages. He walked a slow circle around the kill site and found the trail with little difficulty. Some of the Jakarta can had survived, and from the smaller set of boot prints, so had their charge. And overlaying these tracks were half a dozen moccasin prints. The trail veered westerly from the trader's track, yet still led south. Returning to his horse, Tok mounted and swung the animal around. He removed the short bow from its saddle holster and strung it, then knocked an arrow. There was no hope of coming up on the bargast undetected. Out on this plane, he'd be visible a long time before entering arrow range, and that range had become much closer now that he'd lost an eye. So they'd be waiting for him, with those damn lances. But he knew he had no choice. He hoped only to take down one or two before they skewered him. Tok spat again, then wrapped the reins around his left forearm and adjusted his grip on the bow. He gave the wide red scar crossing his face a vigorous, painful scratch, realizing that the maddening itch would return in moments anyway. Oh well, he said, then drove his heels into the horse's flanks. The lone hill that rose up before adjunct lawn was not a natural one. The tops of mostly buried stones encircled its base. She wondered what might be entombed within it, then dismissed her misgivings. If those standing stones were of the size she had seen rising around the mysterious barrows outside Genobaris, this mound dated back millennia. She turned to the two exhausted marines stumbling in her wake. We'll make our stand here. You with the crossbow. I want you lying up top. The man ducked his head in answer and staggered to the mound's grassy summit. Both he and his comrade seemed almost relieved that she had called a halt, though they knew their death was but minutes away. Lorn eyed the other soldier. He had taken a lance barb on his left shoulder, and the blood still flowed profusely down the front of his breastplate. How he had stayed on his feet in the last hour was beyond Lorne's understanding. He looked upon her with eyes dulled by resignation, showing nothing of the pain he must be feeling. I'll hold your left, he said, shifting his grip on the curved tulwar in his right hand. Lorne unsheathed her own longsword and fixed her attention northward. Only four of the six bargast were visible, approaching slowly. We're being flanked, she called out to her crossbowman. Take the one on your left. The soldier beside her grunted. My life need not be sheltered, he said. We were charged with your protection adjunct. Quiet, Lorne commanded. The longer you stand, the better protected I'll be, she said. The soldier grunted again. The four bargast were lingering now, just out of bowshot range. Two still carried their lances. The other two gripped short axes. 
Then a voice cried out far to Lorne's right, and she whirled to see a lance speeding toward her, and behind it, a charging bargast. Lorne brought her blade across her body and dropped into a crouch as she raised the weapon over her head. Her sword caught the lance's shaft, and even as it did so, she was turning, pulling her weapon to one side. The deflected lance sped past and cracked into the hillside off to her right. Behind her, she heard the crossbowman release a quarrel. As she spun back to the four charging bargast, there came a scream of pain from the other side of the mound. The soldier beside her seemed to have forgotten his wound, as he gripped his talwar with both hands and planted his feet wide. Attend, adjunct, he said. The bargast off to the right cried out, and she turned to see him spinning with the impact of a quarrel. The four warriors before them were no more than thirty feet away. The two with lances now launched them. Lorne made no move, realizing almost immediately that the one aimed at her would fly wide. The soldier beside her dropped away to his left, but not enough to avoid the lance as it thudded into his right thigh. It struck with such force as to drive right through his leg and embed itself in the earth. The soldier was pinned, but his only response was a soft gasp, and he raised his sword to parry an axe swinging at his head. In this time, Lorne had already closed with the bargast rushing at her. His axe was a shorter weapon, and she took advantage of this with a thrust before he came into his own range. He brought the copper-sheathed haft up to parry, but Lorne had already flicked her wrist, completing the feint and dipping under the axe. Her lunge buried the sword point in the bargast's chest, slicing the leather armor as if it were cloth. Her attack had committed her, and her sword was nearly wrenched from her hand as the savage toppled backward. Off balance, she staggered a step, expecting the crushing blow of an axe. But it did not arrive. Regaining her balance, she spun round to find her crossbowman, now wielding his tulwar, engaging the other bargast. Lorne snapped her attention to see how her other guard fared. Somehow, he still lived, though he faced two bargast. He'd managed to drag the lance out of the earth, but the weapon's shaft remained in his leg. That he was able to move at all, much less defend himself, spoke eloquently of Jakardakan discipline and training. Lorne rushed to engage the bargast on the man's right, nearest her. Even as she did so, an axe slipped past the soldier's guard and struck him across the chest. Scales snapped as the heavy weapon's edge ripped through armor. The soldier groaned and fell to one knee, blood spraying onto the ground. Lorne was in no position to defend him and could only watch in horror as the axe swung again, this time striking the man in the head. The helmet collapsed inward and his neck broke. He toppled sideways, landing at Lorne's feet. Her forward momentum carried her right over him. A curse broke from her lips as she sprawled, crashing into the bargast in front of her. She tried to bring the point of her sword up behind him, but he twisted lithely to one side and leaped away. Lorne took a wild swing at him, missing even as she fell. She felt her shoulder dislocate as she hit the hard ground, and the sword dropped from her numbed hand. Now, she thought, the only thing left to do is die. She rolled onto her back. With a growl, the bar guest was standing beside her, axe raised high. Lorne was in a good position to see the skeletal hand bursting from the earth beneath the bar guest. It grasped an ankle. Bones snapped, and the warrior screamed. Vaguely, as she watched, she wondered where the other two savages had gone. All sounds of fighting seemed to have stopped, but the ground rumbled with a growing, urgent thunder. The Barghest stared down at the hand, crushing his shin. He screamed again as the wide, rippled blade of a flint sword shot up between his legs. The axe left the warrior's hands as he frantically brought them down in an effort to deflect the sword, twisting to one side and kicking out with his free leg. It all came too late. The sword impaled him, jamming against his hip bone and lifting him from the ground. His dying shriek rose skyward. Lorne climbed to her feet with difficulty, her right arm hanging useless at her side. 
She identified the thundering sound as the beat of hooves and turned in the direction from which they came. A malazan. As that fact sank in, she swung her attention from the rider and looked around. Both her guards were dead, and arrows jutted from two bargast bodies. She took a shallow breath, all she could manage as pain spread across her chest, and gazed upon the creature that had risen from the earth. It was cloaked in rotting furs, and it stood over the warrior's body, one leg still clutched in its hand. The other hand gripped the sword, which had been pushed the length of the bargast body, the point emerging from his neck. I was expecting you days ago, Lorne said, glaring at the figure. It turned to regard her, its face hidden in shadow beneath the yellowed bone shelf of its helmet. The helmet, she saw, was the skull cap of some horned beast, one horn broken off at its base. The rider arrived behind her. Adjunct, he called out, dismounting. He came to her side, bow still in his hand, and arrow knocked. His lone eye glanced across Lorne, and seeming satisfied that her wound was not mortal, fixed on the massive but squat creature fainting them. Hud's breath! A Talano mass! Lorne continued glaring at the Talano mass. I knew you were about. It's the only thing that explains a Bargast shaman bringing himself and his hand-picked hunters into the area. He must have used a warren to get here. So where were you? Tok the Younger stared at the adjunct, amazed at her outburst. His gaze flicked back to the Talani Mass. The last time he had seen one was in seven cities, eight years past, and then it had been from a distance as the undead legions marched out into the western wastelands on some mission even the Empress could learn nothing about. At this close range, Tok eagerly studied the Talani Mass. Not much left of it, he concluded. Despite the sorcery, 300,000 years had taken their toll. The skin that stretched across the squat man's robust bones was a shiny nut brown in color, the texture of leather. Whatever flesh it had once covered had contracted to thin strips the consistency of oak roots. Such muscles showed through torn patches here and there. The creature's face, what Tok could see of it, bore a heavy chinless jawbone, high cheeks, and a pronounced brow ridge. The eye sockets were dark holes. I asked you a question, Lorne grated. Where were you? The head creaked as the eye mass looked down at its feet. Exploring, it said quietly in a voice born of stones and dust. Lorne demanded, Your name, Tulan? Onos Tulan. Once of the Tarad clan, of the Logros Talan. I was birthed in the autumn of the bleak year, the ninth son to the clan wetted as warrior in the sixth Jagat war. Enough, Lorne said. She sagged wearily, and Tok moved to her side. Glancing up at him, she scowled. You look grim. Then a small smile came to her lips. But good to me. Tok grinned. First things first, adjunct, a place for you to rest. She did not protest as he guided her to a grassy knoll near the barrow and gently pushed her to her knees. He glanced back to see the Talani mass still standing where it had first emerged from the ground. It had turned, however, and seemed to be studying the barrow. We must make your arm immobile, Tok said to the worn, weathered woman kneeling before him. I am named Tok the Younger, he said squatting down. She raised her gaze at this. I knew your father, she said. Her smile returned. Also a great bowman. He ducked his head in reply. He was a fine commander, too, Lorne continued, studying the ravaged youth who was now tending to her arm. The Empress has regretted his death. Not dead for sure, Tok interrupted, his tone tight and his single eye averted as he began removing the gauntlet from her hand. Disappeared. Yes, Lorne said softly. Disappeared since the Emperor's death. 
She winced as he pulled away the gauntlet and tossed it aside. I'll need some strips of cloth, he said, rising. Lorne watched him stride to one of the bar guest bodies. She had not known who her claw contact would be, only that he was the last left alive among Dujak's forces. She wondered why he had veered so sharply from his father's path. There was nothing pleasant or proud in being a claw, only efficiency and fear. He took a knife to the body's tanned leather armor, slicing it back to reveal a rough woolen shirt into which he cut. Then he returned to her side, a handful of long strips in one hand. I didn't know you had an eye mask for company, he said, as he crouched beside her again. They choose their own modes of travel, Lorne said, a hint of anger in her voice, and come when they please. But yes, he's an integral player in my mission. She fell silent, gritting her teeth in pain, as Tok slipped the rude sling over her shoulder and under her arm. I have little good to report, Tok said, and he told her of Paran's disappearance, and of Whiskey Jack and his squad departing without the captain in attendance. By the time he had finished, he had adjusted the sling to his own satisfaction and sat back on his haunches with a sigh. Damn, Lorne hissed. Help me to my feet. After he had done so, she wobbled a bit and gripped his shoulder to steady herself. Then she nodded. Get me my sword. Tog strode to the spot she'd indicated. After a brief search, he found the longsword in the grass, and his eyes thinned to a slit upon seeing the weapon's dusty red blade. He brought it to her and said, A notatarl sword adjunct, the ore that kills magic. And mages, Lorne said, taking the weapon awkwardly in her left hand and sheathing it. I came upon the dead shaman, Tok said. Well, Lorne said, Otataril is no mystery to you of the Seven Cities, but few here know it, and I would keep it that way. Understood. Tok turned to regard the immobile Imas. Lorne seemed to read his thought. Otataril cannot quench their magic. Believe me, it's been tried. The warrens of the Imas are similar to those of the Jackhut and the Forkrul Assail, Elder, Blood, and Earthbound. That flint sword of his will never break, and it cuts through the finest iron as easily as it will flesh and bone. Tok shivered and spat. I'll not envy you your company, adjunct. Lorne smiled. You'll be sharing it for the next few days, Tok the Younger. We've a long walk to pale. Six, seven days, Tok said. I expected you to be mounted. Lorne's sigh was heartfelt. The Bargast shaman worked his talents on them. A disease took them all, even my stallion, which I brought with me through the warren. Her lined face softened momentarily, and Tok could feel her genuine sorrow. It surprised him. All that he had heard of the adjunct had painted for him a picture of a cold-blooded monster, the gauntleted hand of death that could descend from anywhere at any time. Perhaps this side of her existed. He hoped he would not have to see it. Then again, he corrected himself, she had not spared her soldiers a second glance. Tok spoke. You'll ride my mare, adjunct. She's no war horse, but she's quick and long on endurance. They walked to where he'd left his horse and Lorne smiled. That's a Wiccan breed, Tok the Younger, she said, as she laid a hand on the mare's neck. So cease the modesty, else I lose trust in you. A fine animal. Tok helped her into the saddle. Do we leave the eye mask where it is? he asked. Lorne nodded. He'll find his own way. Now, let's give this mare the opportunity to prove herself. Wiccan blood is said to smell of iron. She reached down and offered her left arm. Mount up, she said. Tok barely managed to hide his shock. Share the saddle with the adjunct of the Empire? The notion was so absurd that he came near to laughing. I can walk, adjunct, he said gruffly. With such little time to waste, you would be better to ride on and ride hard.
You'll see pale spores in three days. I can manage a jog at ten-hour stretches. No, talked the younger. Lorne's tone brooked no argument. I need you in pale, and I need to hear all there is about the occupying legions, and Dujek, and Tashren. Better to arrive a few days late than unprepared. Now, grasp my arm, and let's be on with it. Tok complied. As he sank into the saddle behind Lorne, his mare snorted and stepped quickly to one side. Both he and the adjunct almost fell. They turned to see the Talan Imas standing beside them. The barrow has yielded a truth, adjunct, Onos Tulan said. Tok felt her stiffen. We are upon the right path, the Talan Imas replied. Something told Tok that the path the creature referred to had nothing to do with the trader's track leading south to Pale. He cast one final glance back at the barrow as Lorne silently swung the horse around, and then at Onos Tulan. Neither seemed likely to unveil their secrets, but Lorne's reaction had raised the hairs on the back of his neck, and the itch around his lost eye roused itself. Tok muttered a curse under his breath and began to scratch. Something the matter, Tok the Younger? Lorne asked, not turning. He thought about his reply. He said, The price of being blind, adjunct. Nothing more. Captain Parron paced in the narrow room. This was madness. All he knew was that he was being hidden, but the only answers to his questions would come from a bedridden sorceress locked in some strange fever, and a nasty puppet whose painted eyes seemed to fix on him with intense hatred. Vague memories haunted him as well. The feel of slick, cold stones scraping beneath his fingernails at a moment when all his strength had poured from his body. And then the hazy vision of a massive dog, a hound, in the room, a dog that seemed to breathe death. It had been seeking to kill the woman, and he'd stopped it. Somehow, he wasn't sure of the details. A suspicion nagged him that the dog wasn't dead, that it would be back. The puppet ignored most of his questions, and when it did speak to him, it was to voice dire threats. Apparently, though the sorceress was ill, her presence alone, her continued existence, was all that kept Hairlock from fulfilling those threats. Where was Whiskey Jack? Had the sergeant left without him? What would that do to Adjunct Lorne's plan? He ceased pacing and turned a glare on the sorceress lying in the bed. Hairlock had told Parron that she'd somehow hidden him when Tashrin arrived, the high mage having sensed the dog's presence. Parron had no memory of any of that, but he wondered how the woman could have managed anything after the beating she had taken. Hairlock had scoffed that the sorceress hadn't even been aware of opening her warren that one last time, that she'd done it all on instinct. Parron had the feeling that the marionette had been scared by that unveiling of power. Herlock seemed most eager for the woman's death, but was either unable to achieve it himself or too frightened to try. The creature had muttered something about wards she had raised about her person. Yet Parron found nothing to impede his ministrations when the fever had been at its worst. It had broken the previous night, and now Parron felt his impatience reaching some kind of threshold. The sorceress slept, but if she didn't awaken soon, he'd take matters into his own hands. Leave this hiding place, perhaps seek out Tok the Younger, provided he could avoid Tashren or any officers on his way out of the building. Parron's unseeing glare remained fixed on the sorceress, his thoughts racing. Slowly, a new awareness tickled the edges of his mind, and he abruptly blinked. The woman's eyes were open and they studied him. He took a half-step forward, but was stopped dead by her first words. I heard the coin drop, Captain. The blood drained from Parron's face. An echo flitted through his memory. A coin? he asked, his voice barely a whisper. A spinning coin? The voices of gods, 
he thought, of dead men and women, howls of hounds, all pieces of my memory's torn tapestry. Spins no longer, the woman replied. She pushed herself into a sitting position. How much do you remember? Scant, the captain admitted, surprised at himself for telling the truth. The puppet will not even tell me your name, he said. Tattersail, I've been, uh, in the company of Whiskey Jack and his squad. A veil of caution seemed to slip over her sleepy gaze. I was to take care of you until your health returned. I believe you did, Parron said, and I returned the favor, which evens the scale, sorceress. So it does. Well, now what? Parron's eyes widened. You don't know. Tattersail shrugged. But this is ridiculous, Parron exclaimed. I know nothing of what's happening here. I awakened to find a half-dead witch and a talking puppet for company, and of my new command, not a single sign. Have they left for Darugistan already? I can't give you much in the way of answers, Tattersail murmured. All I can tell you is the sergeant wanted you alive, because he needs to know who tried to assassinate you. We'd all like to know, in fact. She fell silent, expectant. Parron studied her round, ghostly, pale face. There was something about her that seemed to disregard her physical mundanity, overwhelmed it, in fact, so that the captain found himself responding in ways that surprised him. It was, he saw, a friendly face, and he couldn't recall the last time he'd experienced such a thing. It left him off balance, with only Tattersail to steady him, and that made him feel as if he were descending a spiral with a sorceress in the centre. Descending? Perhaps it was an ascent. He wasn't sure, and the uncertainty made him wary. I recall nothing of it, he said, and that wasn't entirely a lie, though it felt like it, with her heavy-lidded eyes steady upon him. I think, Parron added, despite his misgivings, there were two of them. I recall a conversation, though I was dead. I think. But you heard a spinning coin, Tattersail said. Yes, he answered, bewildered. And more, he thought. I went to a place, yellow, infernal light, a chorus of moans, a death's head. Tattersail nodded to herself, as if confirming a suspicion. A god intervened, Captain Parron, returned the life to you. You might think it was on your behalf but I'm afraid there wasn't any altruism involved. Are you following me? I'm being used, Parron stated flatly. She raised an eyebrow. That doesn't bother you? Parron shrugged and turned away. It's nothing new, he muttered. I see, she said quietly. So Whiskey Jack was right then. You're not just some new captain. You're something a lot more. That's my concern. Parron snapped, still avoiding her gaze. Then he faced her, his expression dark. And what's your role in all this? You took care of me. Why? Serving your god, are you? Tattersail barked a laugh. <laughs> Not likely. Nor did I do much for you in any case. Opon took care of that. Parron stiffened. Opon? The twins, he thought. Sister and brother, the twins of chance. He who pushes, she who pulls. Have they been in my dreams? Voices? Mention of my sword? He was still for a moment, then he strode over to the dresser. On it lay his sheathed sword. He laid a hand on the grip. I purchased this sword three years ago, though its first use came just a few nights past, against the dog. You recall that? Something in Tattersail's voice brought him around. In her eyes, he now saw fear. She made no attempt to hide it. He nodded. Yet I named the weapon the day I bought it. The name? Parron's grin was ghastly. Chance. The pattern has been long in the weaving, Tattersail said, closing her eyes and sighing. 
though I suspect even Opon could not have imagined your blade tasting its first blood on a hound of shadow. Paran closed his eyes, then he sighed. The dog was a hound. She looked at him and nodded. You've met Herlock? I have. Beware him, Tattersall said. It was his unleashing of a warren of chaos that left me fevered. If warrens are indeed structured, then Herlock's is diametrically opposed to mine. He's mad, Captain, and he vowed to kill you. Paran strapped on his sword. What's his role in all of this? I'm not sure, Tattersall said. That sounded like a lie, but Paran let it pass. He was coming in nightly to check on your progress, he said, but I haven't seen him the past two nights. How many days have I been out? Six, I think. I'm no more certain of time's passage than you are, I'm afraid. He strode to the door. All I know is, I can't just hide here forever. Wait! Paran smiled. Very well. He faced her again. Tell me why shouldn't I leave? The sorceress hesitated, then spoke. I still need you here, she said. Why? It's not me that Herlock's afraid of, she answered, seeming to find the words difficult. It's you, your sword, that's kept me alive. He saw what you managed to do to the hound. Damn, he hissed. Though essentially still a stranger to him, she had reached through to him with her admission. He tried to fight the compassion welling up inside him. He told himself that his mission overrode all other concerns, that he'd repaid his debt to her, if ever there was one, that she hadn't given him all the reasons he suspected existed for his staying hidden, meaning she didn't trust him. He told himself all these things, but none of it was enough. If you go, she said, Herlock will kill me. What have the wards about you? he demanded, almost desperately. Herlock said you've wards about you. Tattersale's smile was drawn. You think he'd just come right out and tell you how dangerous you really are? Wards? She laughed. <laughs> I've barely the strength to sit straight. If I attempted to open my warren in this state, the power would consume me, burn me to ashes. Herlock wants you kept in the dark about everything. The puppet lied. Even this rang like a half-truth in Paran's ears. But there was enough there that made sense, that gave reason to Herlock's hatred of him and the puppet's obvious fear. The greater deceit would come from Herlock, not Tattersale, or so he believed, though there was little to support that belief. Only, at least Tattersale was human. He sighed. Sooner or later, he said, unclipping his sword belt and returning it to the dresser. You and I will have to cut past all this misleading game-playing. Opon or no, we've a common enemy. Tattersale sighed. Thank you. Captain Parron? He eyed her warily. What? She smiled. It is good to meet you. He scowled. She was at it again. This seems an unhappy army, Lorne said, as they waited outside Pale's north gate. One of the guards had entered the city in search of another horse, while the remaining three stood muttering a short distance away. Tok the Younger had dismounted. He moved close to his horse and says, It is adjunct, very unhappy. Along with the dismantling of the second and sixth armies came a shuffling of commands. Nobody's where they were before. Right down to the greenest recruit. Squad split up everywhere. And now there's the rumour that the bridge burners are going to be retired. He glanced over at the three marines, saw their hard eyes on him and the adjunct. People around here don't like that, he said quietly. Lorne leaned back in her saddle. The pain in her shoulder had become a steady throb, and she was glad the journey was done, at least for the time being. They'd seen nothing of the Talani mass since the barrow, though she often sensed his presence, in the dusty wind, beneath the plain's cracked pan. While in the company of Tok the Younger, she had sensed the restless anger churning among the Malazan forces on this continent. In Pale, 
10,000 soldiers crowded the edge of revolt. The spies among them brutally removed, awaiting only High Fist Dujek's word. And the High Mage Tashren wasn't easing the situation by openly countermanding Dujek's instructions to his officers. Yet what troubled the adjunct the most was this vague tale of a hound of shadow doing battle with the second's last Kadra mage. There was a mystery there, and she suspected it was vital. The rest could be dealt with, provided she took charge. The adjunct was eager for her meeting with Tashren and this sorceress Tattersail. The name was familiar, tugging at memories that seemed born in her childhood. And around such evasive hints rustled a cloak of fear. But she was determined to deal with that when the time came. The gate swung open. She looked up to see the marine with a warhorse, and they had company. Tok the Younger snapped a salute, the energy behind it making Lorne wonder at his loyalty. The adjunct dismounted slowly, then nodded at High Fist Dujek. The man seemed to have aged a dozen years since she'd last seen him, thirteen months ago in Genobaris. A small smile came to Lorne's mouth as the scene emerged in her mind. The High Fist, a worn, weary, one-armed man. The Empress's adjunct, her sword arm in a sling. And Tok the Younger, last representative of the claw of Genobacus. One-eyed, and half his face scarred by fire. Here they were, representatives of three of the four empire powers on the continent, and they all looked like Hood's heralds. Misreading her smile, Dujek grinned. Good to see you too, adjunct. I was overseeing the resupply when this guard brought word of your arrival. His gaze grew thoughtful as he studied her, the grin fading. I'll find you a Danul healer, adjunct. Sorcery doesn't work on me, High Fist. It hasn't in a long time. A mundane healer is sufficient. Her gaze narrowed on Dujek. Assuming I'll have no need to unsheath my sword within the walls of Pale. I make no guarantees, adjunct, Dujek said casually. Come, let us walk. Lorne turned to talk the younger. Thank you for the escort, soldier. Dujek laughed, his eyes bright on Tok. Unnecessary adjunct. I know who and what Tok the Younger is, as does virtually everyone else. If he's as good a claw as he is a soldier, you'll do well to keep him alive. Meaning? Dujek gestured that they walk. Meaning that his reputation as a soldier of the second is the only thing preventing a knife across the throat. Meaning, get him out of pale. The adjunct eyed Tok. I will see you later, she said. Joining Dujek, who had passed beneath the gate's massive arch, Lorne matched his pace as they entered the city. Soldiers crowded the streets, directing merchant wagons and the mobs of citizenry. Evidence of the reign of death still scarred many of the buildings, but laborers had been set to work under the direction of marines. The nobility are about to be culled, Dujek said at her side. Tashren wants it to be thorough and public. Empire policy, Lorne replied stiffly. You're well aware of that, High Fist. Dujek glared at her. Nine out of ten nobles to hang, adjunct. Children included? Lorne stared at him. That seems excessive. Dujek was silent for a time, leading her down the main avenue, then heading uphill toward the Empire headquarters. Many faces turned to regard them stonily as they passed. It seemed Dujek's identity was known among pale citizens. Lorne tried to sense the atmosphere his presence created, but couldn't be certain if it was fear or respect. Or both. My mission, Lorne said, as they approached a three-story stone building, its entrance blocked by a dozen watchful marines, will take me out of the city soon. I don't want any details, adjunct, Dujek cut in. You do what you have to do, and just stay out of my way. His tone was unthreatening, almost pleasant, but Lorne felt her muscles tense. This man was being pushed, and Tashren was doing the pushing. 
What was the high mage up to? The whole situation stank of incompetence. As I was saying, Lorne continued, I won't be here long. When I'm here, however, and her voice hardened, I will make plain to the High Mage that his interference in the city's management will not be tolerated. If you need backing, you have it, Dujek. They stopped just outside the building's entrance, and the old man gazed steadily at her, as if weighing her sincerity. But when he spoke, his words surprised her. I can take care of my own problems, adjunct. Do what you will, but I'm not asking for anything. You'll permit the excessive culling of the nobility, then? Dujek's expression set into stubborn lines. Battle tactics can be applied in any situation, adjunct, and the high mage is no tactician. He turned and led her up the steps. Two guards opened the doors, which looked new and were banded in bronze. The high fist and the adjunct entered. They strode down a long, wide hallway marked by doors on either side every dozen feet or so. Marines stood guard before each one, hands on their weapons. It was clear to Lorne that the incident with the Hound had heightened wariness to an almost absurd degree. Then a thought struck her. High Fist, have there been attempts on your life? Dujek's grunt was amused. <laughs> Four in the last week, adjunct. You get used to it. All these marines here volunteered themselves. They don't even listen to me anymore. The last assassin was so badly chopped up, I couldn't even make out if it was a man or a woman. You've a lot of Seven Cities natives in your legions, High Fist. Aye, loyal to a fault when they want to be. Loyal to what, Lorne wondered, and to whom? Seven cities' recruits were being sent elsewhere these days. The Empress did not wish Dujek's soldiers to become aware that their homeland was on the brink of open rebellion. Such news might well tip the scales here on Genabacus, and that in turn would trigger Seven Cities itself. Both Lorne and the Empress were well aware how dangerous things had become, and they had to tread carefully indeed in their efforts to repair the damage. And it was now becoming obvious that Tayshren presented a major problem. She realized that she needed Dujek's support more than he needed hers. They arrived at the hall's end where stood massive double doors. The soldiers at either side saluted the high fist, then opened them. Beyond was a large chamber dominated by a hardwood table in its center. Maps, scrolls, ink, and paint jars crowded its surface. Dujek and Lorne entered, and the doors were shut behind them. Tayshren has been informed of your arrival, but will be delayed somewhat, Dujek said, sitting on the edge of the table. If you have questions regarding the recent events at Pale, ask them now. She knew he was giving her the opportunity to hear answers that didn't come from Tayshren, though as to whose version of the truth she would accept was up to her. Lorne began to appreciate Dujek's comment about battle tactics. She strode to a nearby chair and settled slowly into its cushions. Very well, High Fist. Small matters first. Have you encountered any difficulty with the Maranth? Dujek scowled. Funny you should ask. They're getting pretty high-minded about some things. I had a hard time getting the Gold Legions, their elite warriors, to fight Caladan Brood since they consider him too honorable to treat as an enemy. The whole alliance was on shaky ground for a while there, but in the end they marched. Soon I'll send the Black to join them. Lorne nodded. Similar problems with the green and the blue in Genabaris, she said, which explains why I came overland. The Empress suggests we make the most of the alliance, since it may not last. We haven't much choice. Dujek growled. How many legions will I have in the spring landing? Lorne hesitated, then said, Two. And a regiment of Wiccan lancers. The Wiccans and the Eleventh Legion will disembark at Nathilog. The Ninth will land in Nist and join with the conscript forces. 
The Empress trusts the latter reinforcements will be sufficient to break the Crimson Guard at Fox Pass, thus opening Brood's flank. Then the Empress is a fool, Dujek said, his tone hard. The conscripts are next to useless adjunct, and by this time next year, the Crimson Guard will have liberated Nist, Treat, one Eye Cat, Porul, Garalt, and... I know the list. Lorne rose abruptly. You'll receive two more legions next year, High Fist. That's it. Dujek thought for a time, his gaze on the map pegged to the tabletop. She knew he was lost in reordering, re-evaluating his plans for next season's campaign. That he'd entered a world of materiel and divisions, in second-guessing Caladan Brood and the commander of the Crimson Guard, Prince Kaz. Finally, he cleared his throat. Adjunct, is it possible to reverse the landings? The 11th and the Wiccan Lancers disembarking on the east coast, south of Apple. The 9th on the west coast, to Tulips. Lorne strode to the table and studied the map. Tulips, she thought. Why there? That made no sense at all. The Empress would be curious as to your revised plans, High Fist. Meaning maybe. Dujek rubbed the stubble on his jaw, then gave a sharp nod. All right, adjunct. First, the conscripts will not hold Fox Pass. The Crimson Guard will be into the Northlands by the time our reinforcements arrive. Much of that area is farmland pasture. As we retreat, pulling the conscripts back to Nist, we raise the countryside. No crops, no livestock. Whatever supplies Kaz will need, he'll have to bring with him. Now, adjunct, any army on the move, any army pursuing a routed army, is bound to leave its supply train behind, string it out in its haste to catch its enemy and deliver the killing blow. And that's where the Wiccan lancers come in. The Wiccan were born raiders, Lorne knew. In such countryside, they'd be elusive, striking quickly and with deadly consequences. And the eleventh? Where will they be in all this? A third will be stationed in Nist. The rest will be on the quick march, to Fox Pass. While Caledon Brood remains south of Black Dog Forest? That doesn't make sense, High Fist. You suggested using the Maranth for all it's worth, didn't you? Well, from Tulips, the Maranth and their call will be staging a massive lift. Dujek's gaze narrowed as he studied the map. I want the ninth south of Black Dog Swamp by the time I bring up my forces from here and place them south of Brood. A concerted push from the gold and black should push him right into our laps, while his allies, the Crimson Guard, are stuck on the wrong side of Fox Purse. You intend to transport an entire legion by air? Does the Empress want this war won in her lifetime or not? He pushed himself away from the table and paced. Mind you, he said, as if struck by sudden doubts. It may all be academic. If I were brood, I'd... His voice trailed away, and he faced the adjunct. Will the transport orders be reversed? Lorne searched his face. Something told her that the High Fist had just made an intuitive leap, and it had to do with Caladan Brood, and that as far as Dujek was concerned, it was indeed now academic. She also realized that this was something he wouldn't share with her. She scanned the map again, trying to see what Dujek had seen. But it was hopeless. She was no tactician. Trying to guess Dujek's thoughts was hard enough, but to try the same with Caladan Brood was impossible. Your plan, although brash, is now officially accepted on behalf of the Empress. Your request will be fulfilled. Dujek nodded half-heartedly. One thing, High Fist, before Tashrin arrives. There was a hound of shadow here. Yes, the man said. I wasn't here at the time, but I saw the mess the beast left behind. If not for Tattersail, it would have been far worse. 
Law saw a glint of horror in Dujek's eyes, and into her mind returned the scene from the coast road west of Itgo Khan, two years ago. I've seen the work of hounds before, she said, meeting his eyes. In that moment of locked gazes, they shared something profound. Then Dujek pulled his eyes away. This tattersail, Lorne said, to hide a pang of regret, must be a very capable sorceress. The only Kadra mage to have survived Tashran's assault or Moonspawn, Dujek replied. Indeed. To Lorne, that revelation was even more remarkable. She wondered if Dujek suspected anything, but his words put her at ease. She called it luck on both counts, and she might be right. Has she been a Kadra mage for a long time? Lorne asked. Ever since I took command, perhaps eight, nine years. The familiarity of Tattersail's name returned to Lorne then, like a mailed fist clenching her heart. She found herself sitting down again, and Dujek had taken a step toward her, genuine concern in his eyes. Your injury needs attending to, he said gruffly. I shouldn't have waited. No, no, it's all right. Weariness, that's all. He studied her quizzically. Would you like some wine, adjunct? She nodded. Tattersail, she thought. Was it possible? She would know when she saw the woman. She would know then. Nine years, she murmured. The mouse. I beg your pardon? She looked up to find Dujek before her. He offered her a goblet of wine. Nothing, she said as she accepted it. Thank you. As the double doors swung open, both turned. In strode Tashrin, his face dark with fury as he confronted Dujek. Damn you, the high mage grated. If you had a hand in this, I'll find it, and that is a promise. Dujek raised an eyebrow. A hand in what, high mage? he asked coolly. I've just been to the Hall of Records. A fire? The place looks like the inside of an oven. Lorne rose and stepped between them. High Mage Tashrin, she said in a low, dangerous tone. Perhaps you could tell me why this matter of some fire in some bureaucrat's chamber should override all other considerations? Tashrin blinked. I beg your pardon, adjunct, he said tightly, but within the Hall of Records were the city's census lists. His dark eyes swung past her to fix on Dujek, wherein all the names of Pale's nobility could be found. Unfortunate, the high fist said. Have you begun an investigation? My staff's services are, of course, entirely at your disposal. Unnecessary, High Fist, the wizard drawled sardonically. Why make all your other spies redundant? Tashrin paused, then stepped back and bowed to Lorne. Greetings, adjunct. I apologize for this ungracious seeming reunion. Save your apologies for later, Lorne said levelly. She faced Dujek. Thank you. For the wine and conversation, she said, noting with satisfaction, Tashrin stiffening at that. I trust there'll be a formal dinner this evening? Dujek nodded. Of course, adjunct. Would you be so kind as to request Tattersail's attendance as well? She felt yet another flinch come from the high mage, and saw in Dujek's gaze a new respect as he looked upon her as if acknowledging her own skills and this brand of tactics. Tashran interrupted. Adjunct, the sorceress has been ill as a result of her encounter with the Hound of Shadow. He turned a smile on Dujek, which I'm sure has been described to you by the High Fist. Not well enough, Lorne thought ruefully, but let Tashran imagine the worst. I'm interested in a wizard's evaluation of that event, High Mage, she said. 
which you shall have shortly. Dujek bowed. I will inquire as to Tattersail's health, adjunct. If you will excuse me, then, I can be on my way. He turned to Tashrin and gave a curt nod. Tashrin watched the one-armed old man leave the room, then waited for the doors to close once again. Adjunct, this situation is absurd, Lorne finished hotly. Damn it, Tashrin, where's your sense? You've taken on the craftiest bastard the Empire military has ever had the privilege of possessing, and he's eating you alive. She spun to the table and refilled her goblet. And you deserve it. Adjunct. She faced him. No, listen, Tashrin. I speak directly from the Empress. She reluctantly approved your commandeering the assault on Moonspawn. But if she had known you so thoroughly lacked subtlety, she would never have permitted it. Do you take everyone else for fools? Dujek is just one man, Tashrin said. Lorne took a large mouthful of wine, then set down the goblet and rubbed her brow. Dujek's not the enemy, she said wearily. Dujek's never been the enemy. Tashrin stepped forward. He was the Emperor's man, adjunct. Challenging that man's loyalty to the Empire is insulting, and it's that very insult that may well turn him. Dujek is not just one man. Right now, he's 10,000, and in a year's time, he'll be 25,000. He doesn't yield when you push, does he? No, because he can't. He's got 10,000 soldiers behind him. And believe me, when they get angry enough to push back, you'll not be able to withstand them. As for Dujek, he'll just end up being carried on the tide. Then he is a traitor. No, he's a man who cares for those he is responsible for and to. He's the best of the Empire. If he's forced to turn, Tashrin, then we're the traitors. Am I getting through? The High Mage's face was lined with a deep, disturbed frown. Yes, adjunct, he said quietly. You are. He looked up. This task the Empress has commanded of me, it weighs heavily, adjunct. These are not my strengths. It would do well if you dismissed me. Lorne gave that serious consideration. Mages, by nature, never commanded loyalty. Fear, yes, and the respect born of fear. But the one thing a mage found difficult to understand or cope with was loyalty. And yet there had been one mage, long ago, who had commanded loyalty. And that was the Emperor. She said, Hi, mage, we are all agreed. On one thing. The old guard must disappear. All who stood with the Emperor and still cling to his memory will ever work against us, whether consciously or unconsciously. Dujek is an exception, and there is a handful of others like him. Those we must not lose. As for the others, they have to die. The risk lies in alerting them to that fact. If we're too open, we may end up with an insurrection, the size of which could destroy the Empire. Apart from Dujek and Tattersail, Tatron said, we've cleaned out everyone else. As for Whiskey Jack and his squad, he's all yours, adjunct. With luck, Lorne said, then frowned as the High Mage winced. What's the matter? He rose. I peruse my deck of dragons nightly he said, and I'm certain that Opon has entered the world of mortal affairs. Tattersail's own reading did much to confirm my suspicions. Lorne looked at him sharply. She's an adept? Far more adept than I, Tashrin admitted. Lorne thought. What can you tell me of Opon's involvement? Darujistan, Tashrin replied. Lorne closed her eyes. 
I was afraid you'd say that. We need Darujistan, desperately. Its wealth, coming into our hands, would break this continent's back. I know, adjunct, but the matter is even worse than you realize. I also believe that, somehow, Whiskey Jack and Tattersail are in league with one another. Any word of what happened to Captain Parron? None. Someone is hiding him, or his body. I'm inclined to believe he's dead, adjunct, but his soul has yet to pass through Hood's gate, and only a mage could prevent that. Tattersail? The high mage shrugged. Possibly. I would know more of this captain's role in all this. Lorne hesitated, then said, He was engaged in a long, arduous search. Tayshran growled. Perhaps he found whatever he was seeking. Lorne eyed him. Perhaps. Tell me, how good is Tattersail? Good enough to be a high mage. Tayshran said, good enough to survive a hound's attack and to drive it away, even though I would not think such a thing possible. Even I would have difficulty managing that. Maybe she had help, Lorne murmured. I hadn't thought of that. Think on it now, Lorne said. But before you do... The Empress requests that you continue your efforts, though not against Dujek. You're needed here as a conduit in case my mission goes wrong in Darugistan. Do not involve yourself with managing the occupation of Pale. Further, you are to provide Dujek with details on Opon's appearance. If a god has entered the fray, he has a right to know and to plan accordingly. How can one plan anything with Opon in the game? Leave that to Dujak. She studied his face. Do you have difficulty with any of these instructions? Tayshrin smiled. In truth, adjunct, I'm greatly relieved. Lorne nodded. Good. Now I need a mundane healer and quarters. Of course. Tayshrin strode to the doors, then paused and turned. Adjunct, I am glad you're here. Thank you, High Mage. After he left, Lorne sank into her chair, and her mind travelled back nine years, to the sights and sounds experienced by a child, to a night one particular night in the mouse, when every nightmare a young girl's imagination could hold became real. She remembered blood, blood everywhere, and the empty faces of her mother, her father, and older brother, faces numbed by the realization that they had been spared, that the blood wasn't their own. As the memory stalked once again through her mind, her name rode the winds rustling in the air, as if clawing through dead branches. Lorne's lips parted, and she whispered, Tattersail. The sorceress had found the strength to leave her bed. She now stood at the window, leaning with one hand against the frame for support, and looked down on a street crowded with military wagons. The systematic plunder that quartermasters called resupply was well underway. The eviction of nobility and gentry from their familial estates for the stationing of the officer corps, of which she was one, had ended days ago, while the repairing of the outer walls, the refitting of sundered gates, and the clearing of moon rain continued apace. She was glad she'd missed the river of corpses that must have filled the city streets during the initial phase of cleanup, wagon after wagon, groaning beneath the weight of crushed bodies, white flesh seared by fire and slashed by sword, rat-gnawed and raven-pecked, men, women, and children. It was a scene she had witnessed before, and she had no wish ever to see it again. Now shock and terror had seeped down and out of sight. 
Scenes of normality reappeared as farmers and merchants emerged from hiding to meet the needs of occupiers and occupied alike. Malazan healers had swept the city, rooting out the birthing of plague and treating common ailments among all those they touched. No citizen would have been turned from their path. And sentiments began the long, perfectly planned swing. Soon, Tattersall knew, there'd be the culling of the nobility, a scourge that would raise to the gallows the greediest, least liked nobles. And the executions would be public, a tried and true procedure that swelled recruitment on a tide of base vengeance, with every hand stained by a righteous glee. A sword in such hands completed the conspiracy and included all players in the hunt for the next victim to the cause, the Empire's cause. She'd seen it run its course in a hundred such cities. No matter how benign the original rulers, no matter how generous the nobility, the word of empire, weighted by might, twisted the past into a tyranny of demons. A sad comment on humanity, a bitter lesson made foul by her own role in it. In her mind returned the faces of the bridge burners, a strange counterpoint to the cynicism with which she viewed all around her. Whiskey Jack, a man pushed to the edge, or rather the edge creeping on him on all sides, a crumbling of beliefs, a failing of faiths, leaving as his last claim to humanity his squad, a shrinking handful of the only people that mattered any more. But he held on, and he pushed back, pushed back hard. She liked to think, no, she wanted to believe, he would win out in the end that he'd lived to see his world stripped of the Empire. Quick Ben and Kalam, seeking to take the responsibility from their sergeant's shoulders. It was their only means of loving the man, though they'd never put it in such terms. In the others, barring sorry, she saw the same, yet with them there was a desperation that she found endearing, a childlike yearning to relieve Whiskey Jack of everything their grim place had laid upon him. She responded to them in a way deeper than she'd thought possible, from a core she'd long been convinced was burned out, the ashes scattered in silent lament, a core no mage could afford. Tattersale recognized the danger, but that only made it all the more alluring. Sorry was another matter, and she found herself avoiding even thinking about that young woman. And that left Parron. What to do about this captain? At the moment, the man was in the room, seated on the bed behind her and oiling his sword, Chance. They'd not spoken much since she had awakened four days ago. There was still too much distrust. Perhaps it was that mystery, that uncertainty, that made them so attracted to one another. And the attraction was obvious. Even now, with her back to the man, she sensed a taut thread between them. Whatever energy burned between them, it felt dangerous, which made it exciting. Tattersail sighed. Herlock had appeared this very morning, eager and agitated about something. The puppet would not answer their queries, but the sorceress suspected that Herlock had found a trail, and it seemed it might take the puppet out of Pale and on to Delrugistan. That was not a happy thought. She stiffened as the ward she had placed outside her door was tripped. Tattersail whirled to Parron. A visitor, she said. He rose, chance in his hands. The sorceress waved her hand over him. You're no longer visible, Captain, nor can anyone sense your presence. Make no sound and wait here. She strode into the outer room just as a soft knock sounded on the door. She opened it to see a young marine standing in the hallway. What is it? she demanded. The marine bowed. Hyphis Dujek is inquiring as to your health, sorceress. Much better, she said. That's kind of him. Now if you'll... The marine interrupted diffidently. If you answered as you just have, I am to convey the Hyphis's request that you attend a formal supper this evening in the main building. Tattersall cursed silently. 
She shouldn't have told the truth. Now it was too late. A request from her commander was not something that could be denied. Inform the High Fist that I will be honoured to share his company over supper. A thought struck her. May I ask who else will be present? High Mage Tashrin, a messenger named Tok the Younger, and Adjunct Lorne. Adjunct Lorne is here? Arrived this morning, sorceress. Oh, Hood's breath. Convey my reply, Tattersail said, struggling against a rising tide of fear. She shut the door, then heard the marine's boots. What's wrong? Paran asked from the opposite doorway. She faced him. Put that sword away, Captain. She walked over to the dresser and began rummaging through the drawers. I'm to attend a dinner, she said. Paran approached. An official gathering. Tattersail nodded distractedly. With Adjunct Lorne there as well. As if Tashrin isn't bad enough. The captain murmured. So, she's finally arrived. Tattersail froze. She turned to him slowly. You've been expecting her, haven't you? Parent started and looked at her with frightened eyes. She realized his mumbling hadn't been meant for her ears. Damn it, she hissed. You're working for her. The captain's answer was clear as he spun round. She watched him vanish into the bedroom, her thoughts a storm of fury. The threads of conspiracy now thrummed in her mind. So, Quick Ben's suspicions had been accurate. A plan was afoot to kill the squad. Did that make her life at risk as well? She felt herself nearing a decision. What that decision was, she wasn't sure, but there was a direction to her thoughts now, and it had the inevitable momentum of an avalanche. The seventh bell was ringing from some distant tower as Tok the Younger passed into the Empire headquarters. He showed his invitation to yet another grim-faced, intense guard, and was grudgingly allowed to continue on down the main hall to the dining chamber. Our knees churned in Tok's stomach. He knew the adjunct was behind the request, but she could be as unpredictable and as manipulative as the rest. Beyond the doors he now approached might as well be a pit filled with vipers, all hungrily awaiting his arrival. Tok wondered if he'd be able to keep anything down, and knowing the condition of his facial wound, he then wondered grimly if anyone else would be able to keep anything down. Among his fellow soldiers, his scars were barely noticed. Rare was the soldier in Dujek's army who did not carry a scar or three. Those few friends he had seemed simply thankful that he still lived. In the Seven Cities, superstition held that loss of an eye was also the birth of inner sight. He had been reminded of that belief at least a dozen times in the last couple of weeks. There had been no secret gift granted him in exchange for his eye. Flashes of searing light ripped through his mind every now and then, but he suspected that was no more than a memory of the last thing his eye had seen. Fire. And now he was about to sit among the loftiest company in the Empire, barring the Empress herself. Suddenly the wound was a thing of shame. He had sit there as testament to the horrors of war. Tok stiffened just outside the dining room door. Was that why the adjunct had invited him? He hesitated, then shrugged and entered. Dujek, Tashran, and the adjunct turned as one to regard him. Tok the Younger bowed. Thank you for coming, adjunct Lorne said. She stood with the two men near the largest of three fireplaces, in the wall opposite the entrance. Please, join us. We're now awaiting but one more guest. Tok strode to them, thankful for Dujek's grin. The high fist set his crystal goblet down on the mantel and deliberately scratched the stump of his left arm. Bet it's driving you half crazed, the old man said, his grin broadening. I scratch with both hands, Tok said. Dujek barked a laugh. Join us in a drink? Thank you. 
He noticed Lorne's appraisal as he accepted a goblet from Dujak. Taking the decanter from a nearby table, his glance crossed the high mage, but Tayshran's attention was fixed on the roaring fire behind Lorne. Has your horse recovered? the adjunct asked. Tok nodded as he filled his goblet. Doing handstands the last time I looked in on her, he said. Lorne smiled tentatively, as if unsure whether he was mocking her. I've explained your vital role in keeping me alive, Tok the Younger, how you loosed four arrows on the fly and brought down four bargast. He looked at her sharply. I didn't know I had the last two shots in me, he said. He sipped wine, resisting the urge to scratch his wound. Dujek grunted. Your father was also in the habit of surprising people. There's a man I miss. I too, Tok replied, looking down. The awkward silence that followed this exchange was mercifully broken by the arrival of the last guest. Tok turned with the others as the door swung open. He gazed at the woman standing in the entrance, then started. Was that Tattersail? He'd never seen her wearing anything but battle garb, and was now stunned. My, he thought wonderingly, she's not bad, if you like them big, that is. He half grinned. Lorne's response to Tattersail's appearance had sounded much like a gasp. Then she spoke. We have met before, though I doubt you'd remember. Tattersail blinked. I think I would have recalled that, she said cautiously. I think not. I was but eleven years old at the time. Then you must be mistaken. I'm rarely in the company of children. They burned the mouse quarter a week after you swept through it, Tattersail. Lorne's voice made everyone stiffen with its barely controlled rage. Those survivors, the ones you left behind, were resettled in Mock's Hole. And in those plague-ridden caverns, my mother, my father, and my brother died. The blood drained from Tattersail's round face. Bewildered, Tok glanced at the others. Dujek's expression was masked, but there was a storm behind his eyes as he studied Lorne. On Tayshran's face, as he looked upon the sorceress, there dawned a sudden light. It was our first command, Tattersail said quietly. Tok saw Lorne trembling and held his breath. But when she spoke, it was controlled, the words precise. An explanation is required. She turned to Hyphis Dujek. They were recruits, a cadre of mages. They were in Malar City, awaiting their new commander when the Master of the Claw issued an edict against sorcery. They were sent into the old city, the Mouse, to cleanse it. They were, her voice caught, indiscriminate. She swung her attention back to Tattersail. This woman was one of those mages. Sorceress, that night was my last with my family. I was given to the Claw the very next day. The news of my family's death was kept from me for years. Yet, her words fell to a whisper, I well remember that night. The blood. The screams. Tattersail seemed unable to speak. The air in the room had grown thick, stifling. Finally, the sorceress prized her gaze from the adjunct and said to Dujek, High fist, it was our first command. We lost control. I resigned from the officer corps the very next day and was posted with another army. She gathered herself. If it is the adjunct's wish to convene a court, I offer no defense and will accept my execution as a just penalty. Lorne replied, That is acceptable. She laid her left hand upon her sword and prepared to withdraw it. No, High Fist Dujek said. It is not acceptable. 
Lorne froze. She glared at the old man. You seem to forget my rank. No, I haven't. Adjunct, if it is your will that those within the Empire who have committed crimes in the Emperor's name must be executed, he stepped forward, then you must include me. Indeed, I believe High Mage Tashran also has his share of horror committed on the Emperor's behalf. And finally, there is the Empress herself to consider. Lassine, after all, commanded the Emperor's claw. She created it, in fact. More, the edict was hers, thankfully short-lived as it was. He turned to Tattersail. I was there, Tattersail. Under Whiskey Jack's command, I was sent down to rein you in. Which I did. She shook her head. Whiskey Jack commanded. Her eyes narrowed. This has the taste of a god's game. Duljek swung back to the adjunct. The Empire has its history, and we each are in it. In this, Tatian rasped, I must agree with the High Fist adjunct. There's no need to have all this official, Tattersell said, her eyes on lawn. I hereby challenge you to a duel. On my behalf, I shall employ all my magical skills in an effort to destroy you. You may defend with your sword, adjunct. Tok took a step forward. He opened his mouth and closed it again. He'd been about to tell Tattersell that Lorne carried an Ota Terrell sword, that the duel would be grossly unfair, that she'd die within seconds, as the sword devoured her every spell. Then he saw that the sorceress knew all that. Duljek rounded on Tattersail. Damn it, woman! Do you think everything hinges on how it's worded? Execution? Duel? None of it matters one whit. All that the adjunct does, all that she says, is on behalf of Empress Lassine. He spun to Lorne. You are here as Lassine's voice, as her will, adjunct. Tayshren spoke softly. The woman named Lorn, the woman who once was a child, who once had a family. He looked upon the adjunct with anguish in his eyes. That woman does not exist. She ceased to exist the day she became the adjunct. Lorne stared at the two men, her eyes wide. Standing beside her, Tok watched those words battering her will crushing the anger, shattering into dust every last vestige of identity. And from her eyes rose the icy clinical repose of the adjunct to the empress. Tok felt his heart pounding hard against his chest. He'd just witnessed an execution. The woman named Lorne had risen from the turgid mists of the past, risen to right a wrong, to find justice, and in that last act reclaim its life. And she had been denied. Not by the words of Dujek or Tashrin, but by the thing known as the adjunct. Of course, she said, removing a hand from her sword. Please enter, Sorceress Tattersail, and dine with us. The flat tone of her voice told Tok that her invitation had not cost anything and this horrified him, shook him to his very core. A quick glance showed a similar response from Tatian and Dujek, though the latter veiled it. Tattersail looked positively ill, but she nodded shakily in answer to the adjunct's invitation. Tok found the decanter and a spare crystal goblet. He walked up to the sorceress. I am Tok the Younger, he said, smiling, and you need a drink. He poured the glass full and handed it to her. Often, when we camped on the march, I'd see you lugging that travelling wardrobe of yours around. Now I finally see what was in it. Sorceress, you're a sight for a sore eye. A look of gratitude entered Tattersail's gaze. She raised an eyebrow. I hadn't realised my travelling wardrobe garnered such attention. Tok grinned. I'm afraid you've provided a standing joke in the second. Anything surprising, be it an ambush or an unplanned skirmish, 
The enemy invariably came from your travelling wardrobe, sorceress. Diljack guffawed behind him. I've often wondered where that phrase came from, and damn, I heard it a lot, even from my officers. The atmosphere in the room relaxed somewhat. Though undercurrents of tension still swirled, they seemed to be between Tattersail and High Mage Tatrin. The sorceress turned her gaze upon Lorne whenever the adjunct's attention was elsewhere, and Tok could see the compassion there, and his respect for her rose considerably. In her shoes, any look he gave Lorne would have been filled with fear. And whatever storm threatened between Tattersail and Tatrin seemed born of a difference in opinion coupled with suspicion. It didn't look personal. Then again, Tok considered, Dujek's steady presence may have been providing the leveling influence. His father had spoken much of Dujek, of a man who never lost his touch with the powerless or the less powerful. In dealing with the former, he always made his own failings an easy recognition. And with the latter, he had an unerring eye that cut away personal ambition with the precision of a surgeon removing septic flesh, leaving in its place someone who treated trust and honesty as givens. Studying Dujek's easy, relaxed rapport with the others in attendance, including himself, and then with the servants who filed in bearing trays of food, it struck Tok that the man had not changed perceptibly from the one Tok the Elder had called friend. And that impressed Tok deeply, knowing as he did the pressures that burdened the high fist. As soon as everyone was seated and the first course presented, it was Adjunct Lorne who took command, however. Dujek relinquished it without a word or a gesture, evidently confident that the earlier incident was now over as far as the adjunct was concerned. Lorne addressed Tattersail in that uncanny, flat voice. Sorceress, permit me to compliment you on besting a hound of shadow and on your timely recovery. I know that Tashrin has questioned you regarding this incident, but I would like to hear the tale from you directly. Tattersail set down her goblet and regarded her plate briefly before meeting the adjunct's steady gaze. As the High Mage may have explained, it's now clear that the gods have entered the fray. Specifically, they've become involved with the Empire's plans for Darugistan. Tok rose quickly. I believe, he said, I should excuse myself now, as what will be discussed here exceeds... Be seated, Tok the Younger, Lorne commanded. You are the claw representative here, and as such, you are responsible for speaking on its behalf. I am? You are. Slowly Tok sat. Please continue, sorceress. Tattersail nodded. Opon is central to this gambit. The twin jester's opening move has created ripples. I'm sure the High Mage would agree with this, and thus attracted the attention of other gods. Shadow Throne, Lorne said. She looked to Tashrin. The High Mage concurred. One could expect such a thing. I, however, have sensed nothing of Shadow Throne's attention upon us even though I pursued that possibility vigorously after the Hound's attack. Lorne exhaled slowly. Sorceress, please go on. The Hound's presence was triggered entirely by accident, Tattersail said, flicking a glance at Tashrin. I was doing a reading from my deck of dragons and came upon the card of the Hound. As with all adepts, I found the image animate to a certain extent. When I gave it my full concentration, it felt, she cleared her throat, as if a portal opened, created entirely from the other side of that card, from High House Shadow itself. She raised her hands and gazed steadily at the High Mage. Is this possible? The Shadow Realm is new among the houses, its full power not yet expressed. Well, whatever happened, a portal, a rent, the hound gear appeared. Then why, Tashran asked, 
Did it appear in the street? Why not in your room? Tattersell smiled. I can speculate. Please do, the adjunct said. I have wards about my room, Tattersell said. The innermost of these are high fear. Tashran started at that, clearly surprised. Such wards, Tattersell continued, create a flux, a tide of power that surges and ebbs like a pulsing heart, one that is beating very fast. I suspected these wards were sufficient to bounce the hound away from my immediate area, since in its transitional state, halfway between its realm and ours, the hound could not fully express its powers. Once it had arrived, however, it could, and it did. How did you manage to fend off a hound of shadow? Tashran asked. Luck, Tattersell replied without hesitation. Her answer hung in the air, and it seemed to talk that everyone had forgotten their meal. In other words, Lorne said slowly, you believe that Opon intervened? I do. Why? Tattersail barked a laugh. <laughs> if I could work that out, adjunct, I'd be a happy woman. As it is, her humor fell away. It seems we're being used. The Empire itself has become a pawn. Is there a way out? Dujek asked, his words a growl that startled everyone. Tattersail shrugged. If there is, it lies in Darugistan, since that's where Opon's gambit seems centred. Mind you, Hyphist, drawing us into Darugistan might well be what Opon seeks to achieve. Tok sat back, absently scratching his wound. There was more to it, he suspected, though he could find no discernible source for his suspicion. He scratched harder. Tattersail could be glib when she wanted to be. Her story had a straightforwardness to it. The best lies were the simple ones. Still, nobody else seemed unduly suspicious. The sorceress had shifted attention from her story to its implications for future action. She had everyone thinking past her, and the faster their thoughts raced, the farther behind they left their doubts about her. He watched her watching the others, and was the only one to notice the flash of triumph and relief in her eyes when Lorne spoke. Opon is not the first god seeking to manipulate the Malazan Empire, the adjunct said. Others have failed, come away bloodied. It's unfortunate the lesson was lost on Opon, and on Shadow Throne, for that matter. She sighed deeply. Tattersail, whatever your differences with the High Mage, it is necessary, no, vital, that you work together in seeking to discover the details of Opon's intervention. In the meantime, Hyphist Dujek will continue preparing his legion to march, as well as solidifying our hold on Pale. For myself, I will be leaving the city shortly. Rest assured, my mission has goals identical to yours. Now, one last thing. She turned to talk. I wish to hear the clause evaluation of the words that have been exchanged here. He stared in surprise. He had assumed the role she had expected of him without even realizing it. He sat straight and glanced at Tattersail. She now looked nervous, drawing her hands beneath the table. He waited until their gazes locked and held before he turned to the adjunct. In so far as she knows it, the sorceress speaks the truth, he said. Her speculations were genuine although concerning the dynamics of magic, I am at a loss. Perhaps High Mage Tashrin could comment on that. Lorne seemed vaguely disappointed with Tok's evaluation, but she nodded anyway and said, Accept it, then. High Mage? Tashrin released a slow breath. Accurate, he said. Speculation is sound. Tok refilled his goblet. The first course was removed almost untouched, but as the second course arrived, 
Everyone turned their full attention to it, and conversation ceased. Tok ate slowly, avoiding Tattersail's eyes, though he sensed them upon him time and again. He wondered at his own actions, deceiving the adjunct to the Empress, the High Mage, and the High Fist all in one shot struck him as rash, if not suicidal. And his reasons for doing so were not entirely rational, which made it all the more distressing. The second had a long, bloody history. More times than Tok could count, someone had come through for someone else, whatever the odds. And more often than not, he had been there on the plain outside Pale, and he had watched with a thousand others the Kadra being torn apart, hopelessly outmatched. That kind of waste didn't sit well with the second. And though he was a claw, the faces that surrounded him, the faces that looked upon him in hope, despair, and, at times, fatal resignation, those faces had been mirrors of his own, and they defied the claw at every turn. The years in the claw where feeling and caring had been systematically assailed, those years failed to withstand the day-in, day-out reality that was the Second Army. This night, and with his words, Tok had given something back to Tattersail. Not just for her, but for the cadre. It didn't matter if she understood, and he knew she must be feeling bewildered by his actions. None of that mattered. What he'd done, he'd done for himself. He sat up. Now that's odd, he thought. My wounds stopped itching. Feeling lightheaded, Tattersail wobbled every now and then as she walked down the hall toward the door to her room. She knew it wasn't the wine. With her nerves as frayed as they were, that fine vintage had tasted like water and had had as much effect. Adjunct Lorne had raised in the sorceress memories she'd spent years burying. For Lorne it had been a pivotal event, but for Tattersail it had been just one nightmare among many. Still, it had pushed her where other crimes had not, and as a result she'd found herself attached to the Second Army, the army she'd been sent to as a recruit, the closing of a circle, but in that time she had changed. That attachment, those twenty-odd years of service, had this night saved her life. She knew that Tok the Younger had lied for her, and the look he had given her prior to starting his evaluation had been a message she had understood. Though he had come to the second as a claw, as a spy, not even his years of training within that secret organization could withstand the new world in which he had found himself. Tattersail understood this all too clearly, for the same had happened to her. The sorceress in a cadre of mages who had entered the mouse quarter so long ago had cared naught for anyone but herself. Even her attempt to cut herself away from the horrors of which she had been part had been born of a selfish desire to flee, to absolve her own conscience. But the Empire had denied her in this. An old soldier had come to her the day after the slaughter in the mouse quarter. Old, nameless, a veteran sent to convince the sorceress that she was still needed. She well remembered his words. Should you ever outrun the guilt within your past, sorceress, you will have outrun your soul. When it finds you again, it will kill you. And then, rather than deny her desperate needs absolutely, he'd sent her into a veteran army, the fifth, until the time came for her to return, to the second, to a place under the command of Dujek One Arm. With that, she had been given a second chance. Tattersail came to her door and paused to sense the condition of her wards. All was well. Sighing, she entered her room, then leaned against the door as it closed behind her. Captain Parron stepped out from the bedroom, his expression wary and somehow shy. Not under arrest? I'm surprised. So am I, she replied. Hairlock was here, Parron said. He instructed me to give you a message. Tattershell studied the man's face, seeking a hint of what he was about to deliver. He avoided her gaze, 
and remained standing near the doorway into the bedroom. Well, she demanded. Parron cleared his throat. First, he was, um, excited. He knew of the adjunct's arrival and said she wasn't alone. Not alone? Did he explain that? Parron shrugged. Said the dust walks around the adjunct, the dirt shifts beneath her boots, and the wind whispers of frost and fire. He raised his eyebrows. Does that explain anything? Damned if I know. Tattersail strode to her dresser. She began to remove the scant jewellery she had donned for the dinner. I think it does, she said slowly. Did he say anything else? He did. He said that the adjunct and her companion were leaving Pale soon, and that he intended to track them. Sorceress. She saw that Parron was struggling with something, as if fighting his every instinct. Tattersail laid one arm on the dresser and waited. When he met her gaze, her breath caught. You were about to say something, she said, her voice low. Her heart was pounding all too fast, and she felt her body responding as if of its own accord. The look she had seen in his eyes had been clear in its meaning. I know something of the adjunct's mission, he said. I was to be her contact in Darugistan. Whatever had been building between them disintegrated as Tattersail's eyes went hard and anger darkened her face. She's going to Darugistan, is she? And you and she were to oversee the long-awaited demise of the bridge burners. Together, you thought you'd be able to kill Whiskey Jack, to cut down his squad from within. No. Parron took a step forward, but when Tattersail shot out her hand, palm facing him, he froze. Wait, he whispered. Before you do anything, just hear me out. Her Thea Warren surged into her hand, eager for release. Why? Damn Opon for letting you live! Tattersail, please! She scowled. Speak! Parron stepped back and turned to a nearby chair. Hands held out at his sides, he sat down and looked up at her. Keep those hands there, Tattersail commanded. Away from your sword. This has been the adjunct's personal mission, from the very start. Three years ago, I was stationed in Itgo Khan, officer corps. One day, every available soldier was mustered out and marched to a section of the coast road. Parron's hands had begun to shake, and the muscles of his jaw stood out. What we saw there, Tattersell, you would not believe. She recalled Quick Ben and Kalam's story. A massacre. A company of cavalry. Astonishment showed on Parron's face. How did you know? Go on, Captain, she grated. Adjunct Lorne arrived from the capital and took charge. She guessed that the massacre had been a... a diversion. We began upon a trail. It was not a clear one, not at first. Sorceress, may I lower my arms? Slowly. On the chair arms, Captain. He sighed gratefully and sat down his trembling forearms as she had instructed. Anyway, the adjunct determined that a girl had been taken, possessed by a god. Which god? Parron made a face. Come now, if you know of the massacre, is it hard to guess? That company was killed by shadow hounds. Which god? Well, Shadowthrone comes to mind, he said sarcastically. The adjunct believes Shadowthrone was involved, but the god that possessed the girl was the Rope. I know of no other name for him. The patron of assassins, Shadowthrone's companion. Tattersail dropped her arm. She had closed her warren a minute earlier, since it had begun to push hard, and she had feared she didn't have the strength to resist it much longer. You found the girl, she stated dully. Parron sat forward. Yes. Her name's sorry. You're aware of this, Parron said, sinking back into the chair. Which means that Whiskey Jack is also aware, since who else could have told you? He looked up into her eyes with a clouded expression. I'm now very confused. 
You're not alone, Tattersell said. So all this, your arrival, the adjuncts, it was all a hunt for the girl? She shook her head. That's not enough. It can't be enough, Captain. It's all that I'm aware of, Tattersell. She studied him for a moment. I believe you. Tell me, what are the details of the adjunct mission? I don't know, Perrin said, tossing up his hands. Somehow I was the one she'd be able to find, so my being with the squad would bring her to the girl. The adjunct's talents are many, Tattersell mused. Through the antithesis of sorcery, she might well possess the ability to have linked with you, especially if you'd been in her company for the past two years. Then why isn't she breaking down your door? Tattersell's eyes were on the jewellery scattered on the dresser. Opon severed the link, Captain. I dislike the thought of exchanging one set of shackles for another, Parron grumbled. There's more to this, Tattersell insisted, more to herself than to the captain. Lorne has a Talan I mass with her. Parron jerked upright. Hairlock's snide hints, she explained. I believe the mission was twofold. Kill Sorry, yes, but also kill Whiskey Jack and his squad. The Talan would not be involved if her plan concerned just you. Her Ototaral sword is sufficient to destroy Sorry, and possibly kill the rope as well, assuming that's who's possessing the girl. I would not like to believe that, Parent said. They are my command, my responsibility. The adjunct would not betray me so. Wouldn't she? Why not? The captain seemed at a loss to answer her, but there was a stubborn glower in his eyes. Tattersell reached the decision she had sensed was coming, and it left her cold. Hairlock left too early. The puppet was eager, too eager to pursue the adjunct and that Talan I mass. He must have discovered something about them, about what they're up to. Who is Hairlock's master? Parron asked. Quick, Ben. Whiskey Jack's mage. She looked to him. He's the best I've seen. Not the most powerful, mind you, but smart. Still, if the Talani mass comes on him unawares, he won't stand a chance, and neither will the rest. She paused, her eyes holding on the captain. I have to leave Pale, she said abruptly. Parron shot to his feet. Not alone. Alone, Tattersale insisted. I have to find Whiskey Jack, and if you're tagging along, then Lorne will find him too. I refuse to believe the adjunct presents any risk to the sergeant, Parron said. Tell me, can you succeed in killing Sorry, even with Quick Ben's help? The sorceress hesitated. I'm not sure I want to, she said slowly. What? It has to be Whiskey Jack's decision, Captain. And I don't think I can give any good reason for convincing you of that. I just feel it's right. She felt herself relying on instinct in this matter, but vowed to hold true to it. Even so, Parent said, I can't remain hiding here, can I? What do I eat? The bedding? I can get you out into the city, Tattersell said. None will recognize you. Take a room in an inn and stay out of your uniform. If all goes well, I'll be back in two weeks. You can wait that long, can't you, Captain? Parron stayed. And what happens if I just walk out of here and introduce myself to Dujek One-Arm? The High Mage Tashrin would shred your brain with truth-seeking sorcery, Captain. You've Opon's touch. And after tonight, Opon is now an official enemy of the Empire. And when Tashrin's done, he'll leave you to die, which is preferable to the madness that would grip you if he kept you alive. He'll show you that mercy, at least. Tattersell anticipated Parron's thoughts. Dujek might well seek to protect you, but in this, Tashrin outranks him. You've become a tool of Opon. And for Dujek, the safety of his soldiers takes precedence over his pleasure in frustrating Tashrin. So, in fact, he might not protect you at all. I'm sorry, Captain, but you're truly alone if you walk.
I'll be alone when you leave, too, sorceress. I know, but it won't be forever. She searched his eyes and felt compassion welling behind her own. Paran, she said, it's not all bad. Despite all the distrust between us, I'm feeling things for you I haven't felt for anyone in, well, in some time. She smiled sadly. I don't know what that's worth, Captain, but I'm glad I said it anyway. Paran gazed at her for a long minute, then said, Very well, Tattersall. I'll do as you ask. An inn? Do you have some local coin? Easily acquired. Her shoulders slumped. I'm sorry, but I'm exhausted. As she turned to the bedroom, her gaze fell on the dresser top one last time. Amid a small pile of underclothing, she saw her deck of dragons. It would be foolish not to do a reading, considering the decision she'd made. Paran spoke close behind her. Tattersale, how thorough is your exhaustion? She felt the heat in his words triggering a smoldering fire beneath her stomach, and her gaze slid away from the deck as she turned to face the captain. Though she voiced no reply to his question, her answer was clear. He took her hand, surprising her with such an innocent gesture. So young, she thought, and now he's leading me into the bedroom. She would have laughed if the act hadn't been so sweet. False dawn played the eastern horizon as Adjunct Lorne guided her mount and packhorse out from Pale's east gate. True to Dujek's words, the guards were nowhere in sight, and the gate had been left open. She hoped the few sleepy eyes that had followed her through the streets had only mild curiosity behind them. In any case, she was dressed in simple, unadorned leather armor. Her face was mostly hidden in the shadow cast by the plain bronze helmet's brow guard. Even her horses were a local breed, sturdy and placid, much smaller than the Malazan war horses with which she was most familiar, but a comforting ride nonetheless. It seemed unlikely that she would have attracted undue attention. More than one unemployed mercenary had left Pale since the Empire's arrival. The South Horizon was a jagged line of snow-capped mountains. The Tallinn Mountains would remain on her right for some time before the Rivy Plain swept past them and became the Catlin Plain. Few farms broke the flatlands around her, and those that did crowded the city's own lands. The Rivy people were not tolerant of such encroachments, and since every trade route that led to and from Pale crossed their traditional territory, those of the city wisely refrained from angering the Rivy. Ahead, as she walked her horses, the dawn showed its face with a streak of crimson. The rain had passed a few days back, and the sky overhead was silver blue and clear, a few stars dwindling as light came to the world. The day promised to be hot. The adjunct loosened the leather thongs between her breasts, revealing the fine male hauberk beneath. By midday, she would reach the first wellspring, where she would replenish her supply of water. She ran a hand across the surface of one of the bladders strapped to her saddle. It came away wet with condensation. She passed her hand across her lips. The voice that spoke beside her jolted her in the saddle, and her mount snorted in fear and sidestepped. I will walk with you, Onos Tulan said, for a time. Lorne glared at the Talani mass. I would rather you announced your arrival, she said tightly, from a distance. As you wish. Onos Tulan sank into the ground like so much dust. The adjunct cursed. Then she saw him waiting a hundred yards ahead of her, backlit by the rising sun. The crimson sky seems to have cast a red flame about the warrior. The effect jangled her nerves, as if she looked upon a scene that touched her deepest, oldest memories. Memories that went beyond her own life. The Talan Imas stood unmoving until she reached him then fell into step beside her. Lorne tightened her knees about the horse's shoulders and closed the reins until the mare settled down. 
Do you have to be so literal-minded, Tool? She asked. The desiccated warrior seemed to consider, then nodded. I accept that name. All of my history is dead. Existence begins anew, and with it shall be a new name. It is suitable. Why were you selected to accompany me? The adjunct asked. In the lands west and north of seven cities, I alone among my clan survived the 28th Jaggart War. Lorne's eyes widened. I thought those wars numbered 27, she said quietly. When your legions left us after conquering seven cities, and you marched into the wastelands, our bone casters sensed an enclave of surviving jaghards, Tool said. Our commander, Logros Talan, determined that we exterminate them. Thus we did. Which explains your decimated numbers upon returning, Lorne said. You could have explained your decision to the Empress. As it was, she was left without her most powerful army and no knowledge of when it might return. Return was not guaranteed, adjunct, Toole said. Lorne stared at the tattered creature. I see. The cessation of my clan's chieftain, Kig Avon, was accompanied by all my kin. Thus, alone, I am unbound to Logro. Kig Avon's bone caster was Kilava Onas, who has been lost since long before the Emperor reawakened us. Lorne's mind raced. Among the Malazan Empire, the Talani Mass were also known as the Silent Host. She'd never known an Imas as loquacious as this tool. Perhaps it had something to do with this unbounding. Within the Imas, only Commander Logros ever spoke to humans on a regular basis. As for the bone casters, Imas shamans, they stayed out of sight. The only one that had ever appeared was one named Ola Ethil, who stood alongside the clan chieftain Aitholos Ilm during the Battle of Kartul which had seen an exchange of sorcery that made Moonspawn look like a child's cantrip. In any case, she had already learned more of the Imas from this brief conversation with Tool than was present in the Empire Annals. The Emperor had known more, much more, but making records of such knowledge had never been his style. That he had reawakened the Imas had been a theory argued among scholars for years, and now she knew it to be true. How many other secrets would this Talan Imas reveal in casual conversation? Tool, she said, had you ever met the Emperor personally? I awakened before Galad Katan and after Onak Shendok, as with all the Talan Imas. I knelt before the Emperor as he sat upon the first throne. The Emperor was alone? Lorne asked. No. He was accompanied by the one named Dancer. Damn, she hissed. Dancer had died beside the Emperor. Where is this first throne, too? The warrior was silent for a time. Then it said, Upon the Emperor's death, the Logros to Lan I Mass gathered mines, a rare thing that was last done before the diaspora, and a binding resulted. Adjunct, the answer to your question is within this binding. I cannot satisfy you. This holds for all Logros to Lan I Mass and for all Kron to Lan I Mass. Who are the Kron? They are coming, Tool replied. Sudden sweat sprang out on the adjunct's brow. 
Logros's legions, when they first arrived on the scene, numbered around 19,000. They were believed now to number 14,000, and the majority of those losses had come beyond the Empire's borders in this last Jaghat War. Were another 19,000 Imas about to arrive? What had the Emperor unleashed? Tool? she asked slowly, almost regretting her need to persist in questioning him. What is the significance of these Kron coming? The year of the 300th millennium approaches, the warrior replied. What happens then? Adjunct, the diaspora ends. The great raven called Crone rode the high winds above Rivy Plain. The northern horizon was now a green-tinged curve, growing more substantial with every hour of flight. Weariness weighed down her wings, but the heaven's breath was a strong one. And more, nothing could assail her certainty that changes were coming to this world, and she drew again and again upon her vast reserves of magical power. If ever there was a dire convergence of great forces, it was now and in this place. The gods were descending to the mortal soil to do battle. Shapings were being forged of flesh and bone, and the blood of sorcery now boiled with a madness born of inevitable momentum. Crone had never felt more alive. With these unveiling of powers, heads had turned, and to one Crone flew in answer to a summons she was powerless to ignore. Lord Anamanda Rake was not her only master, and for her this only made things more interesting. As for her own ambitions, she would keep them to herself. For now, knowledge was her power. And if there was one secret more alluring than any other she might covet, it was the mystery surrounding the half-human warrior called Caledon Brood. Anticipation lifted Crone's wings with renewed strength. Steadily, Black Dog Forest spread its verdant cloak over the north. Chapter 10 Kalor said, I walked this land when the Talan Imas were but children. I have commanded armies a hundred thousand strong. I have spread the fire of my wrath across entire continents and sat alone upon tall thrones. Do you grasp the meaning of this? Yes, said Caledon Brood. You never learn. Conversations of War Second in Command, Kalor, speaking with Warlord Caledon Brood. Recorded by Outrider Herlakel, Sixth Army. Vimkaros Inn stood just beyond Eltrasan Square, in the opal quarter of Pale. That much Tok knew from his wanderings through the city. But for the life of him, he could not think of anyone staying there whom he knew. Yet the instructions for this mysterious meeting had been clear. He now approached the ostentatious structure warily. He saw nothing suspicious. The square was crowded with the usual gentry and merchant shops. Of Malazan guards there were few. The culling of the nobility had done much to cloak Pale's atmosphere with a shocked stillness that hung about people like invisible yokes. The past few days Tok had kept much to himself, carousing with his fellow soldiers when the mood took him, though those times seemed rarer these days. With the adjunct gone and Tattersail reported missing, Dujek and Tashren were involved in mutually exclusive responsibilities. The High Fist was busy restructuring Pale, and his newly formed Fifth Army, while the High Mage sought Tattersail, evidently without much success. Tox expected that the peace between the two men would not last. Since the dinner, he had stayed away from anything official, choosing to eat with his comrades rather than dine with the officers, as was now his privilege as ranking Claw. The less noticed he made himself, the better, as far as he was concerned. He entered Vimkaros Inn and paused. Before him was a roofless courtyard with paths winding among a rich garden. Clearly, the inn had survived the siege unscathed. 
a wide central path led directly to a broad counter, behind which stood a corpulent old man eating grapes. A few guests walked the side paths, moving among the plants and conversing in low tones. The message had insisted he come dressed in local garb. Thus, Tok drew little attention as he strode to the counter. The old man paused in his snacking and bowed with his head. At your service, sir, he said, wiping his hands. I believe a table has been reserved in my name, Tok said. I am Render Khan. The old man studied a wax tablet before him, then looked up with a smile. Of course, follow me. A minute later, Tok sat at a table on a balcony overlooking the garden court. His only company was a decanter of chilled Saltoan wine, which arrived when he did, and he now sipped from a goblet, his lone eye surveying the people in the garden below. A servant arrived and bowed before him. Kind sir, the man said, I am to deliver the following message. A gentleman will soon join you who has been out of his depth yet not aware of it. He is now. Tok frowned. That's the message? It is. His own words? And yours, sir. The servant bowed again and departed. Tok's frown deepened. Then he sat forward, his every muscle tensing. He turned to the balcony's entrance, in time to see Captain Parron stride through. He was dressed in the manner of the local gentry, unarmed and looking quite fit. Tok rose, grinning. Not unduly shocked, I hope, Parron said as he arrived. They sat down and the captain poured himself some wine. Did the message prepare you? Barely, Tok replied. I'm not sure how to receive you, Captain. Is this according to the adjunct's instructions? She believes me dead, Parron said, his brow wrinkling. And I was for a time. Tell me, Tok the Younger, am I speaking to a claw or to a soldier of the second? Tok's eye narrowed. That's a tough question. Is it? Parron asked, his gaze intense and unwavering. Tok hesitated, then grinned again. Hood's breath. No, it damn well isn't. All right, Captain. Welcome to the defunct second, then. Parron laughed, clearly relieved. Now, what's all this about you being dead but not dead, Captain? Parron's humour vanished. He took a mouthful of wine and swallowed, looking away. An attempted assassination, he explained, grimacing. I should have died, if not for Mallet and Tattersail. What? Whiskey Jack's healer and the sorceress? Parron nodded. I've been recovering until recently in Tattersail's quarters. Whiskey Jack's instructions were to keep my existence secret for the time being. Tok, he leaned forward. What do you know of the adjunct's plans? Tok examined the garden below. Tattersail had known. She'd managed to keep it from everyone at the dinner. Remarkable. Now, he said quietly, you ask questions of a claw. I do. Where's Tattersail? Tok swung his gaze to the captain and held the man's eyes. The captain jerked his head. Very well. She travels overland to Darujistan. She knows a Talan I mass accompanies the adjunct, and she believes Lorne's plan includes killing Whiskey Jack and his squad. I do not agree. My role in the mission was to keep an eye on one member of the sergeant's squad, and that person was to be the only one to die. She gave me the command after three years of service to her. It's a reward, and I can't believe she would take it from me. There, that is what I know. Can you help me, Tok? The adjunct's mission, Tok said, after releasing a long breath, as far as I'm aware of it, involves far more than just killing Sorry. The Talani Mass is with her for something else. Captain, Tok's expression was grim. The days of the bridge burners are numbered. Whiskey Jack's name is damn near sacred among Dujak's men. This is something of which I couldn't convince the adjunct. In fact, she seems to think the opposite. But if the sergeant and the bridge burners are eliminated, this army won't be pulled back in line. 
it will mutiny. And the Malazan Empire will be up against High Fist Ducek with not a single commander who can match him. The Genabakan campaign will disintegrate and civil war may well sweep into the heart of the Empire. The blood had drained from Paran's face. I believe you, he said. Very well. You've taken my doubts and made of them convictions. And they leave me with but one choice. And that is? Paran turned the empty goblet in his hands. To Rujistan, he said. With luck, I'll catch Tattersail, and together we'll attempt to contact Whiskey Jack before the adjunct does. He glanced at Tok. Evidently, the adjunct can no longer sense my whereabouts. Tattersail forbade me to accompany her, arguing that Lorne would be able to detect me. But she also let slip that my death had severed the bonds between me and the adjunct. I should have made the connection sooner, but she distracted me. Into Tok's mind returned the memory of how she had looked that evening, and he nodded knowingly. I'm sure she did. Paran sighed. Yes, well. In any case, I need at least three horses and supplies. The adjunct is proceeding on some kind of timetable. I know that much. So she's not traveling with much haste. I should catch up with Tattersail in a day or two. Then together we can drive hard to the edge of the Tallinn Mountains, skirt them, and slip past the adjunct. Tok had leaned back during Paran's elaboration of his plan a half-smile on his lips. You'll need Wiccan horses, Captain, since what you've described requires mounts superior to those the adjuncts riding. Now, how do you plan to get past the city gates, dressed as a local, but leading Empire horses? Paran blinked. Tok grinned. I've got your answer, Captain. He spread his hands. I'll go with you. Leave the horses and supplies to me, and I guarantee we'll get out of the city unnoticed. But those are my conditions, Captain. Paran coughed. Very well. And now that I think on it, the company would be welcome. Good, Tok grunted. He reached for the decanter. Let's drink on the damn thing, then. The way was becoming more and more difficult, and Tattersail felt her first tremor of fear. She travelled a warren of high fear, and not even Tashren possessed the ability to assail it. Yet under attack it was. Not directly. The power that opposed her was pervasive, and it deadened her sorcery. The warren had become narrow, choked with obstacles. At times it shuddered around her, the dark walls to either side writhing, as if under tremendous pressure. And within the tunnel she struggled to shape, the air stank of something she had difficulty identifying. There was a tinge of sour brimstone and a mustiness that reminded her of unearthed tombs. It seemed to drain the power from her with every breath she took. She realized that she could not continue. She would have to enter the physical world and find rest. Once again she cursed her own carelessness. She had forgotten her deck of dragons. With them she would have known what to expect. She entertained once again the suspicion that an outside force had acted upon her, severing her from the deck. The first distraction had come from Captain Parron, and while it had been pleasant, she reminded herself that Parron belonged to a pawn. After that, she had experienced an unaccountable urgency to be on her way, so much so that she had left everything behind. Bereft of her warren, she would find herself alone on the rivy plain, without food without even a bedroll. The mindless need for haste she had experienced ran contrary to her every instinct. She was growing certain that it had been imposed upon her, that somehow she had let her defences down, left herself exposed to such manipulations. And that returned her thoughts to Captain Parron, to the servant of Opon's will. Finally, she could go no further. She began to withdraw her strained power, collapsing the warren layer by layer about her. The ground beneath her boots became solid, cloaked in spar-yellow grass, and the air around her shifted into the dull lavender of dusk. 
A wind brushed her face, smelling of soil. The horizon steadied itself on all sides. Far off to her right, the sun still bathed the Tallinn Mountains, the peaks glittering like gold. And immediately ahead rose an enormous silhouetted figure, turning to face her and voicing a surprised grunt. Tattersail stepped back in alarm, and the voice that emerged from the figure pushed the air from her lungs in a whooshing breath of relief. Then terror. Tattersail, Belladon said sadly. Tayshran did not expect you'd manage to come this far. Thus, I was anticipating detecting you from a distance. The Thelemen giant lifted his arms in an expansive, childlike shrug. At his feet was a familiar burlap sack, though the body within had shrunk since she'd last seen it. How has the High Mage managed to deny my warren? she asked. On the heels of her terror had come weariness, almost resignation. He could not do that, Belladon answered. He simply anticipated that you would attempt to travel to Darugistan, and as your Thea warren cannot function over water, he concluded you would take this path. Then what happened with my warren? Belladon grunted distastefully. The Talan Imas, who accompanies the adjunct, has created around them a dead space. Our sorcery is devoured by the warrior's eldering powers. The effect is cumulative. If you were to open your warren entirely, you would be consumed utterly, Tattersail. The Thelemen stepped forward. The High Mage has instructed me to arrest you and return you to him. And if I resist? Baladan answered in a tone filled with sorrow. Then I am to kill you. I see. Tattersail thought for a time. Her world seemed to have closed in now, her every memory irrelevant and discarded. Her heart pounded like a thundering drum in her chest. All that remained of her past, and her only true sense of her life, was regret. An unspecified, yet overwhelming regret. She looked up at the Thelemen, compassion brimming in her eyes. So where are this Talan and the adjunct, then? Perhaps eight hours to the east. The Imas is not even aware of us. The time for conversation is ended, Tattersail. Will you accompany me? Her mouth dry, she said. I did not think you one to betray a long-standing friend. Belladon spread his hands wider and said, in a pained voice, I will never betray you, Tattersail. The High Mage commands both of us. How can there be betrayal? Not that, Tattersail replied quickly. I once asked if I could speak with you at length, remember? You said yes, Belladon. But now you tell me conversation is ended. I had not imagined your word to be so worthless. In the dying light, it was impossible to see the Thelemen's face, but the anguish in his tone was plain. I am sorry. Tattersail. You are correct. I gave you my word that we would speak again. Can we not do this while we return to Pale? No, Tattersail snapped. I wish it now. Belladon bowed his head. Very well. Tattersail forced the tension from her shoulders and neck. I have some questions, she said. First, Tayshran sent you to Genabaris for a time, didn't he? You were searching through some scrolls for him. Yes. May I ask, what were those scrolls? Is it of vital significance now, Tattersail? It is. The truth will help me in deciding whether to go with you or die here. Belladon hesitated only a moment. Very well. Among the archives collected from the city's mages, all of whom were executed, as you know, 
were found some copied fragments of Gothos folly, an ancient Jaghut tome. I know of it, Tattersell interjected. Go on. As a Thelemon, I possess Jaghut blood, though of course Gothos would deny it. The High Mage entrusted the examination of these writings to me. I was to seek out information concerning the burial of a Jaghut tyrant, a burial that was in fact a prison. Wait, Tattersell said, shaking her head. The Jaghut had no government. What do you mean by a tyrant? One whose blood was poisoned by the ambition to rule over others. This Jaghut tyrant enslaved the land around it, all living things, for close to three thousand years. The eye mass of the time sought to destroy it, and failed. It was left to other Jaghut to attend to the sundering and imprisoning of the tyrant, for such a creature was as abominable to them as it was to Imas. Tattersail's heart now hammered in her chest. Belladon. She had to fight to push the words from her. Where was this tyrant buried? I concluded that the barrow lies south of here, in the Gadrobi Hills, directly east of the Rujistan. Oh, Queen of Dreams, Belladon, do you know what you've done? I have done as I was commanded by our High Mage. And that's why the Talan I mass is with the adjunct. I don't understand what you are saying, Tattersail. Damn it, you brainless ox, she rasped. They plan to free the tyrant, Lorne's sword, her Ota Terrell sword. No, Belladon rumbled. They would not do such a thing. Rather, they seek to prevent someone else releasing it. Yes, that is more likely. It is the truth of things. Now, Tattersail, our conversation is done. I can't go back, the sorcerer said. I must go on. Please, don't stop me. We are to return to Pale. Belladon said stubbornly. Your concern has been satisfied. Permit me to take you back, so that I may continue seeking the proper burial place for night chill. There was no choice left in Tattersail's mind, but there had to be a way out. The conversation had bought her time, time to recover from the ordeal of travelling by Warren. Belladon's words returned to her. If she accessed her Thea Warren now, she would be consumed, incinerated by the reactive influence of the Talan I mass. Her eyes fell on the burlap sack beside the Thelemen and saw from it a faint gleam of sorcery. A spell. My own spell, she thought. She recalled now a gesture of compassion, a spell of preservation. Is this my way out? Hood's breath, is it even possible? She thought of Hairlock, the journey from the dying body to a lifeless vessel. Shedinal, have mercy on us. The sorceress stepped back and opened her warren. Hythea magic blazed around her. She saw Belladon stagger back, then steady himself. He screamed something, but she could not hear him. Then he charged at her. She regretted the Thelemon's fatal courage as the fire blackened the world around her, even as she opened her arms and embraced him. Lorne strode to Tool's side. The Talani mass faced west, and a tension swirled about him that she could almost see. What is it? she asked, her eyes on the white fountain of fire rising above the horizon. I've never seen anything like that. Nor I, Tool replied. It is within the barrier I have cast around us. But that's impossible, the adjunct snapped. Yes, 
impossible to last this long. Its source should have been consumed almost instantly. Yet. The Talan Imas fell silent. There was no need for Tool to finish his sentence. The pillar of fire still raged in the night sky as it had for the past hour. The stars swam in the inky darkness around it, magic swirling in a frenzy as if from a bottomless well. On the wind was a smell that left Lorne slightly nauseous. Do you recognize the Warren, Tool? Warren's adjunct. Talan, Thea, Dunul, Driss, Tenes, Thelomentoblakai, Starvald Demelain. Starvald Demelain? What in Hood's name is that? Elder. I thought there were but three Elder Warrens, and that's not one of them. Three? No, there were many adjunct, all born of one. Starvald Demelain. Lorne wrapped her cloak tighter about herself, eyes on the column of fire. Who could manage such a conjuring? There was one, once. Of worshippers there are none left, so he is no more. I have no answer to your question, adjunct. The eye mass staggered as the pillar bloomed outward, then winked out. A distant thundering rumble reached them. Gone, Lorne whispered. Destroyed, Tool said. The warrior cocked his head. Strange, the source is indeed destroyed. But something has also been born. I sense it, a new presence. Lorne checked her sword. What is it? she demanded. Tool shrugged. New. It flees. Was this cause for worry? Lorne scowled and turned to the Talan Imas, but he had already left her side and was now... The adjunct glanced once more at the western horizon. There was a cloud blotting out the stars. It looked huge. She shivered. It was time to sleep. The Imas would stand guard, so she need not worry about surprise visitors. The day had been long, and she had over-rationed her water. She felt weak, an unfamiliar sensation. Her scowl deepened as she walked to the camp. Tool, standing immobile beside the flames, reminded her of his arrival two days ago. The fiery glimmer that jumped along his withered flesh and bone helm once again triggered something primordial in her mind, and with it came a deep, unreasoning fear of darkness. She stepped close to the eye mass. Fire is life, she whispered the phrase seeming to rise from the depths of instinct. Tool nodded. Life is fire, he said. With such words was born the first empire. The empire of Imas. The empire of humanity. The warrior turned to the adjunct. You've done well, my child. The grey pall of smoke hung unmoving over Black Dog Forest, a dozen leagues north of her, as Crone dipped her splayed tail and sank wearily toward the army encamped on the rivy plain. The tents marched outward like spokes from a central fortified hub, where stood a large canopy, rippling in the morning breeze. Toward this centre, the great raven descended. Her sharp gaze marked rivy plainsmen moving among the isles. Off on the eastern rim fluttered the banners of the Catlin horse, green and silver, to mark the mercenary contingent of Caladan Brood's main army. By far the greatest proportion of soldiers, however, were Tista Andii, and Amanda Rake's people, dwellers of the city within Moonspawn, their tall, dark-clad forms moving like shadows between the tents. 
Wheeled tracks led north to the forest fringes. Supply routes to entrenchments once held by the Malazans and now marking Brood's front lines. Rivy-driven carts moved forward an endless stream of supplies, while other wagons laden with the dead and the wounded entered the camp in a grim flow. Crone cackled. Magic bled from the main tent and stained the dusty air with a heavy, turgid magenta, the color of the Driss Warren, earth magic. Her wings now felt light and held a youthful spring as she beat the air. Ah! Crone sighed. Magic! Sweeping through the wards and traps, the great raven glided over the tent and thrummed rapidly as she dropped outside the entrance. No guard barred the doorway, which had been left pulled back and tied to a support pole. Crone hopped inside. With the exception of a small hanging at the far end, behind which squatted an army cot, no other divisions had been made within the tent. In the centre stood a massive table, its surface etched with the contours of the surrounding land. One man stood alone, leaning over it, his back to the doorway. An enormous iron hammer was slung across his broad back. Despite its size and evident weight, it looked almost toy-like against that span of muscle and bone. Power rolled from him in musky waves. Delays, delays, Crone muttered as she flapped up to land on the tabletop. Caladan brood, grunted distractedly. You sensed the storm of sorcery last night? She asked. Sensed. We could see it. The Rivy shamans seem somewhat disturbed, but they have no answers. We'll discuss that later, Crone. Now I must think. Crone cocked her head at the map. The west flank falls back in total disarray. Who commands that bargast mob? Brood asked. When did you fly within sight of them? Two days passed. I saw but a third of the original force left alive. Brood shook his head. Jorik Sharplance. Under him, five thousand Bargast and seven blades of the Crimson Guard. Sharplance? Crone hissed laughter. Full of himself, is he? He is, but the Bargast so named him. As I was saying, five legions of gold Moranth dropped into his lap three days ago. Jorik retreated under cover of night and bled off two-thirds of his army east and west. His Bargast have a knack of disappearing when no cover seems possible. Yesterday, his panicked mob did an about-face and met the gold. His Bargast moved in as pincers. Two Moranth legions wiped out the other three retreating to the forest with half their supplies scattered on the plain. Crone cocked her head again. Jorick's plan? Brood inclined his head. He's Crimson Guard, though the Bargast call him their own. Young, thus fearless. The raven studied the map. And the east? How holds Fox Pass? Well... Brute said. Mostly Stannis conscripts on the other side. The Malazans are finding them a reluctant ally. We'll see the Crimson Guard's metal in twelve months' time, when the next wave of Malazan marines disembark at Nist. Why not drive northward? Crone asked. Prince Kaz could liberate the free cities over the winter. The prince and I Agree on this, Brood said. He stays where he is. Why? Crone demanded. Brood grunted. Our tactics are our business. Suspicious bastard, Crone muttered. She hopped along the south edge of the map. Your underbelly remains for final grim scrutiny. Naught but rivy plainsmen between you and Pale and now forces walk the plain that even the rivy know nothing of. Yet you show little concern, warrior. Why is that, Crone wonders? 
I have been in communication with Prince Kaz and his mages, and with the Bargast and Rithi shamans. What was born on the plain last night belongs to no one. It is alone and frightened. Even now the Rivi have begun the search for it. Concerned? No, not by that. Still, there's much more going on in the south. Brood straightened. Anamanda is in the midst of it, Crone purred. Plotting and counterplotting, scattering broken glass in everyone's path. I've never seen him in a better mood. Enough gossip. You have news for me. Of course, master. Crone stretched her wings and sighed. She jabbed her beak at an itch, crunched a flea, and gulped it down. I know who holds the spinning coin. Who? A youth whose bliss is ignorance. The coin spins and turns a face to all those in his company. They've their own game, but it will converge with greater things. And so Opon's thin threads reverberate in spheres, otherwise immune to the jester's influence. What does Rake know? Of this, little. But you well know his dislike of Opon. He would cut those threads, given the opportunity. Idiot, Brood muttered. He thought for a time unmoving, like a shaping of stone and iron, while Crone ambled back and forth across the rivy plain, her long black talons scattering the wooden regiment and division markers like dominoes. Without Opon, Rake's power is presently unmatched, Brood said. He hangs over Darugistan like a beacon, and the Empress is sure to send something against him. Such a battle would. Level Darugistan, Crone chirped brightly. In flames numbering twelve, so fly the free cities, so much ash in the wind. Rake's disdain for everything beneath him has left us stumbling and flat on our faces one time too many, Brood said. He glanced at Crone and raised a hairless eyebrow. You're scattering my armies. Stop it. Crone stopped pacing and squatted. Once again, she sighed, Caladan Brood, the great warrior, seeks the bloodless way. Rake gets that coin, and he'll pull Opon right in, and spit the lord and lady on that lovely sword of his. Imagine the chaos that would ensue. A wonderful ripple that could topple gods and deluge realms. She heard her own excitement and reveled in its blatancy. Such fun. Quiet bird, Brood said. The coin bearer needs protection, now that Rakes recalled his mages. But who is there to match the Tista Andy? Crone asked. Surely you don't intend to leave your campaign here. Brood bared his filed teeth in a nasty grin. Ah, caught you out, I think. Good. You need taking down a notch or two, Crone. You don't know everything. How does it feel? I'll permit such torture from you, Brood, Crone squawked. Only because I respect your temper. Just don't push me too far. Tell me, who around here can match Rake's mages? This is something I must know. You and your secrets. How can I be a true servant to my master's wishes when he withholds vital information? What do you know of the Crimson Guard? Brood asked. Scant, Crone replied. A company of mercenaries held in high regard among such kind. What of them? Ask Rake's Tista Andy for their assessment, Crow. Crone's feathers arched indignantly. 
crow? I'll not take such insults. I'm leaving, returning to the moon, there to devise such a list of foul names for Caledon Brood as to stain the realms. Be gone with you, then, Brood said, smiling. You've done well. If only Rake wasn't even more stingy than you, Crone said, as she hopped toward the doorway. My spying skills would be used on you instead of on him. Brood spoke. One last thing, Crone. She stopped at the entrance and cocked her head. The warrior's attention had returned to the map. When you find yourself over the rivy plain far to the south, mark whatever powers you sense active there. But be careful, Crone. Something's brewing, and it stinks. Crone's cackle was her only reply, and then she was gone. Brood stood over his map, thinking hard. He remained unmoving for close to twenty minutes. Then he straightened. Stepping outside, he searched the sky. Crone was nowhere in sight. He grunted and turned to survey the nearest tents. Kalor, where are you? A tall grey man stepped around a tent and walked slowly up to Brood. The gold have bogged down in the forest, warlord, he said in a gravelly voice, his ancient lifeless eyes meeting Brood's. A storm comes down from the Laderon Heights. The Marath's calls will be grounded for some time. Brood nodded. I'm leaving you in charge, heading to Fox Pass. Callor raised an eyebrow. Brood stared at him and then said, Let's not get too excited. People will start thinking you're not as bored with all this as you make out to be. I'm meeting with Prince Kaz. A faint smile quirked Kalor's thin lips. What a madness, as Jorik Sharplans perpetrated now. None, so far as I'm aware, Brood answered. Ease up on the lad, Kalor. He pulled off the last one. Remember, you were young once too. The old warrior shrugged. Jorik's last success belongs to the Lady of Luck, if anything. It surely was not the product of genius. I'll not argue that one, Brood said. May I ask, what is the reason for speaking with Kaz in person? Brood looked around. Where's that damn horse of mine, anyway? Probably cowering. Callor said dryly. Word is, his legs have become shorter and stubbier beneath your prodigious self. I remain unconvinced that such a thing is possible, but who can argue with a horse? I need some of the prince's men, Brood said, heading off down an aisle. To be more precise, he said over his shoulder. I need the Crimson Guard's sixth blade. Watching Caladan Brood stride away, Kalor sighed. Rake again, is it, warlord? You'd do better to follow my advice and destroy him. You will rue dismissing my advice, Brood. His dull eyes followed Brood until he turned a corner and disappeared from sight. Consider that... My last warning. The charred earth crunched under their horses' hooves. The glance that Tok the Younger threw back over his shoulder was received with a grim nod from Captain Parron. They were nearing the source of last night's column of fire. As Tok had promised, leaving the city had proved a simple matter. None accosted them, and the gates had been left ajar. Their horses were indeed wicken bred lean and long-limbed. And though their ears flattened and eyes rolled, they held to the discipline of their reins. The still midday air was heavy with the stench of sulphur, and already a fine coat of ash covered the two riders and their horses. Overhead, 
The sun was a bright copper orb. Tox stopped his mount and waited for the captain to arrive. Parron wiped grimy sweat from his brow and adjusted his helmet. The camel felt heavy on his shoulders as he squinted ahead. They were heading toward the place where the pillar of fire had come from. The night just passed had been one of deep fear for Parron. Neither he nor Tok had ever witnessed such a conflagration of sorcery. Though they had camped leagues away, they had felt the heat pouring from it. Now, as they approached, all Parron could feel was dread. Neither he nor Tok spoke. Perhaps a hundred yards eastward rose something that looked like a misshapen tree stump, one gnarled, blackened branch reaching skyward. In a perfect circle around it, the grassy sward was untouched for perhaps five yards. A dark smudge lay in this unburned area, slightly off to one side. Parron nudged his mount forward, and Tok followed after unslinging and stringing his bow. As Tok caught up with the captain, Parron saw that his companion had knocked an arrow. The closer they approached, the less like a tree the charred thing looked. The limb that reached out from it had familiar lines. Parron's gaze narrowed some more. Then he cursed and spurred his horse. He closed the distance quickly, leaving behind a startled Tok. Arriving, he dismounted and strode up to what he now saw were two bodies, one gigantic. Both had been burned beyond recognition, but Parron held no illusions as to who the other was. All that come close to me, all that I care for, he thought. Tattersail, he whispered, then fell to his knees. Tok joined him, but remained in the saddle, standing in the stirrups and scanning the horizon. A minute later he dismounted and walked a slow circle around the embracing bodies, stopping at the dark smudge they'd seen from a distance. He crouched to study it. Parron raised his head and struggled to keep his eyes on the figures. The limb belonged to the giant. The fire that had consumed them both had blackened the arm for most of its length, but its hand was only slightly scorched. Parron stared at the grasping fingers and wondered what salvation the giant had reached for in its moment of death. The freedom that is death, a freedom denied me. Damn the gods, damn them all. Numbed, he was slow to realize that Tok called to him. It was an effort to rise to his feet. He staggered to where Tok still crouched. On the ground before the man was a torn burlap sack. Tracks lead from this, Tok said shakily, a strange expression on his face. He scratched vigorously at his scar, then rose. Heading northeast. Parron looked at his companion without comprehension. Tracks. Small, like a child's, only... Only what? The man hugged himself. Those feet were mostly bones. He met the captain's blank stare. As if the souls were gone, rotted or burned away. I don't know. Something horrible has happened here, Captain. I'm glad it's heading away, whatever it is. Parron turned back to the two entwined figures. He flinched. One hand reached up to touch his face. That's Tattersail, he said in a flat voice. I know. I'm sorry. The other one is the Thelemen High Mage Bellodan. It has to be. Tok looked down at the burlap sack. He took leave to come out in very nightchill. He added quietly, I don't think nightchill needs burying anymore. Tashrin did this, Parron said. Something in the captain's voice brought Tok round. Tashrin, and the adjunct. Tattersell was right. They would not have killed her otherwise. Only she didn't die easily. She never took the easy path in anything. Lorne's taken her from me, just like she's taken everything else. Captain? Parron's hand unconsciously gripped the pommel of his sword. That heartless bitch has a lot coming to her, and I mean to deliver it. Fine, Tok growled. Let's just be smart about it. 
Parron glared at him. Let's get going, Tok the Younger. Tok glanced one last time into the northeast. This wasn't over, he told himself, shivering. He winced as a savage, painful itch rose beneath his scar. Though he tried, he found he could not reach through to it. And a formless fire burned behind his empty eye socket, something he had been experiencing often lately. Muttering, he strode to his horse and climbed into the saddle. The captain had already swung his own mount and the trailing horse southward. The set of the man's back spoke volumes to Tok the Younger, and he wondered if he hadn't made a mistake in accompanying him. Then he shrugged. Well, he said to the two charred bodies as he rode past, it's done, ain't it? The plain below lay sheathed in darkness. Looking to the west, Crone could still see the setting sun. She rode the highest winds, the air around her bitter cold. The Great Raven had left Caladan Brood's company two days ago. Since then, she had detected no sign of life in the wastes below. Even the massive herds of Bedouin, which the Rivi were in the habit of following, had disappeared. At night, Crone's senses were limited, though it was in such darkness that she could best detect sorcery. As she winged ever southward, she scanned the land far below with a hungry eye. Others among her brethren from Moonspawn regularly patrolled the plains in service to Anamanda Rake. She had yet to see one, but it was only a matter of time. When she did, she would ask them if they detected any source of magic recently. Brood was not one to overreact. If something was happening down here that soured his palate, it could be momentous, and she wanted to know of it before anyone else. Fire flashed in the sky ahead of her, perhaps a league distant. It flared briefly, tinged green and blue, then disappeared. Crone tensed. That had been sorcery, but of a kind she'd never known. As she swept into the area, the air washed over her hot and wet, with a charnel stench that reminded her of, she cocked her head, burned feathers. A cry sounded ahead. Crone opened her beak to reply, then shut it again. It had come from one of her kin, she was certain, but for some reason she felt the need to hold her tongue. Then another ball of fire flashed, this time close enough to Crone that she saw what it engulfed, a great raven. Her breath hissed from her beak. In that brief instant of light, she'd seen half a dozen more of her brethren wheeling in the sky ahead of her and to the west. She thrummed her wings and angled toward them. When she could hear their panicked flapping about her on all sides, Crone called out. Children, attend to Crone. The Great Mother has come. The ravens voiced relieved cries and closed in around her. They all shrieked at once in an effort to tell her what was happening, but Crone's angry hiss silenced them at once. I heard among you Hurtle's voice, Crone said. Did I not? One male swept near her. You did, he replied. I'm Hurtle. I've just come from the north, Hurtle. Explain to me what has occurred. Confusion, Hurtle drawled sarcastically. Crone cackled. She loved a good joke more than anyone. Indeed. Go on, lad. Before dusk, Kinclip detected a flare of sorcery below her on the plain. It was odd, its feel. But clearly a warren had just opened, and something had issued onto the plain. Kinclip spoke to me of this, then investigated. I shadowed her from above during the descent and so saw what she saw. Crone, it has come to my mind that once again the art of soul-shifting has been exercised. Eh? Travelling on the ground, and having just come from a warren, was a small puppet, Hurtle explained, animate and possessing great power. When this puppet detected Clip, he gestured at her, and she burst into flames. Since then, the creature has disappeared into its warren, reappearing only to kill another of us. Why do you remain? Crone demanded. Hurtle chuckled. We would determine its course, Crone. 
Thus far, it seems to travel southward. Very well. Now that that's been confirmed, leave and take the others with you. Return to Moonspawn and report to our lord. As you command, Crone. Hurtle dipped a wing and slid off into darkness. His voice called out and was answered by a chorus. Crone waited. She wanted to be certain that they had all departed the area before doing some investigating on her own. Was this puppet the thing birthed in the Pillar of Fire? It didn't seem likely. And what kind of sorcery did it employ that no great raven could absorb? There was an eldering taste about this. Soul shifting was no simple cantrip, and it had never been common among the wizards, even when its techniques were known. Too many tales of madness born within the shifting. Perhaps this puppet had survived from these times. Crone thought about that. Unlikely. Magic bloomed on the plain below, then faded. A small magical force scampered from the spot, weaving as it ran. There, thought Crone, there lie the answers to my questions. Destroy my younglings, will you? Would you so easily disdain Crone? She crooked her wings and dropped. The air whistled around her. She raised a penumbra of protective magic that encapsulated her, just as the small figure ceased its march and looked up. Faintly, Crone heard a manic laugh rise up to meet her. Then the puppet gestured. The power that engulfed Crone was immense, far beyond anything she anticipated. Her defenses held, but she found herself buffeted, as if fists punched her from every direction. She cried out in pain, spinning as she fell. It took all her strength and will to thrust out her battered wings and catch a rising current of air. She voiced an outraged, alarmed shriek as she climbed higher into the night sky. A glance down revealed that the puppet had returned once again to its warren, for nothing magical was visible. Aye, she sighed. What a price to pay for knowledge. Elder Warren, indeed, the eldest of them all. Who plays with chaos? Crone knows naught. All things are gathering, gathering here. She found another stream of wind and angled south. This was something Anamanda Rake must know of. Never mind Caledon Brood's instructions that the Tista and E Lord be kept ignorant of almost everything. Rake was good for more than Brood credited him. Destruction for one, Crone laughed. And death! Good at death! She picked up speed, so did not notice the dead smudge on the land below her, nor the woman camped in its centre. There was no magic there to speak of, in any case. Adjunct Lorne squatted by her bedroll, her eyes scanning the night sky. Tool, was all that connected to what we witnessed two nights ago? The Talani Mass shook his head. I think not, Adjunct. If anything, this concerns me more. It is sorcery and it ignores the barrier I have set around us. How? she asked quietly. There is only one possibility, adjunct. It is Eldering, a lost warren of ages past, returned to us. Whoever its wielder might be, we must assume it tracks us. With purpose. Lorne straightened wearily, then stretched her back, feeling her vertebrae pop. Is its flavor Shadow Thrones? No. Then I will not assume it's tracking us, Tool. She eyed her bedroll. Tool faced the woman and watched in silence as she prepared to sleep. Adjunct, he said, this hunter appears able to penetrate my defenses and thus it may open its warren's portal directly behind us, once we are found. I've no fear of magic, Lorne muttered. Let me sleep. 
The Talani mass fell silent, but he continued staring down at the woman as the hours of night crawled on. Tool moved slightly as dawn lightened the east, then was still again. Groaning, Lorne rolled onto her back as the sunlight reached her face. She opened her eyes and blinked rapidly, then froze. She slowly raised her head to find the Talan Imas standing directly above her, and hovering inches from her throat was the tip of the warrior's flint sword. Success, Tool said, demands discipline, adjunct. Last night we witness an expression of elder magic, choosing as its target ravens. Ravens, adjunct, do not fly at night. You might think the combination of my abilities with yours ensures our safety. That is no guarantee, adjunct. The Talan I masked withdrew his weapon and stepped to one side. Lorne drew a shaky breath. A flaw, she said, pausing to clear her throat before continuing. Which I admit to, Tool. Thank you for alerting me to my growing complacency. She sat up. Tell me, doesn't it strike you as odd that this supposedly empty rivy plain should display so much activity? Convergence, Tool said. Power ever draws other power. It is not a complicated thought, yet it escaped us, the Imas. The ancient warrior swung his head to the adjunct. As it escapes their children, the Jaghats well understood the danger. Thus they avoided one another abandoned each other to solitude, and left a civilization to crumble into dust. The Forkral Assail understood as well, though they chose another path. What is odd, adjunct, is that of these three founding peoples, it is the Imas whose legacy of ignorance survived the ages. Lorne stared at Tool. Was that an attempt at humour? she asked. The Talani mass adjusted his helmet. That depends on your mood, adjunct. She climbed to her feet and strode to check her horses. You're getting stranger every day, Tool, she said quietly more to herself than to the Imas. Into her mind returned the first thing she had seen when she opened her eyes, that damned creature and his sword. How long had he stood like that? All night? The adjunct paused to test her shoulder tentatively. It was healing quickly. Perhaps the injury had not been as severe as she had first thought. As she saddled her horse, she chanced to glance at Tool. The warrior stood staring at her, what kind of thoughts would occupy someone who had lived through 300,000 years? Or did the Imas live? Before meeting Tool, she had generally thought of them as undead, hence without a soul, the flesh alone animated by some external force. But now she wasn't so sure. Tell me, Tool, what dominates your thoughts? The Imas shrugged before replying. I think of futility, adjunct. Do all Imas think about futility? No, few think at all. Why is that? The Imas leaned his head to one side and regarded her. Because, adjunct, it is futile. Let's get going, Tool. We're wasting time. Yes, adjunct. She climbed into the saddle, wondering how the Imas had meant that. Book Four Assassins I dreamed a coin with shifting face. So many youthful visages, so many costly dreams, 
and it rolled and rang round the gilded rim of a chalice made for gems. Life of Dreams, Ilbaras the Hag Chapter 11 The night held close as I wandered, my spirit unfooted to either earth or stone, unraveled from tree, undriven by iron nail, but like the night itself, a thing of air, stripped of light. So I came upon them, those masons who cut and carved stone in the night, sighting by stars and battered hand. What of the sun? asked I of them. Is not its cloak of revelation the warmth of reason in your shaping? And one among them answered, No soul can withstand the sun's bones of light, and reason dims when darkness falls. So we shape barrows in the night for you and your kin. Forgive my interruption, then, said I. The dead never interrupt, said the mason. They but arrive. Pauper's Stone, Darugistan Yet another night, yet another dream, Cropper moaned, with naught but a scant fire to keep this wanderer company. He held his hands over the flickering, undying hearth, that had been stoked by an elder god. It seemed an odd gift, but he sensed a significance to it. Grappa would understand this meaning, for rare and unwelcome is this frustration. The landscape around him was barren. Even the ploughed earth was gone, with no sign of habitation in sight. He squatted by the lone fire in a tundra wasteland, and the air had the breath of rotting ice. To the north and to the east, the horizon gleamed green, almost luminescent, though no moon had risen to challenge the stars. Krupper had never before seen such a thing, yet it was an image fashioned within his mind. Disturbing indeed, proclaimed Krupper. Are these visions of instinct then, unfurled in this dream for a purpose? Krupper knows not and would return to his warm bed this instant, were the choice his. He stared about at the lichen and moss-covered ground, frowning at the strange bright colours born there. He had heard tales of Red Spire Plain, that land far to the north, beyond the Laderan Plateau. Is this what Tundra looked like? It always pictured a bleak, colourless world. Yet peruse these stars overhead. They glisten with a youthful energy, nay, sparkle, as if amused by the one who contemplates them, while the earth itself hints of vast blushes of red, orange, and lavender. Krupper rose as low thunder reached him from the west. In the distance moved a massive herd of brown-furred beasts. The steam of their breath gusted silver in the air above and behind them as they ran, turning as one this way and that, but ever at a distance. He watched them for some time. When they came closest to him, he saw the reddish streaks in their fur and their horns sweeping down, then up and out. The land shook with their passage. Such is the life in this world, Krupper wonders. Has he travelled back then to the very beginning of things? You have, said a deep voice behind him. Krupper turned. Ah! Come to share my fire, of course. He saw before him a squat figure, covered in the tanned hides of deer or some such similar animal. Antlers stretched out from a flat skull cap on the man's head, grey and covered in fuzzy skin. Krupper bowed. You see before you Krupper of Darugistan. I am Pran Kohl of Kanigtol's clan among the Kron clan. Pran stepped close and crouched before the fire. I am also the white fox, Krupper, wise in the ways of ice. He glanced at Krupper and smiled. Pran's face was wide, the bones pronounced between smooth gold skin. His eyes were barely visible between tight lids, but what Krupper saw of them was a startling amber in color. Pran reached out long, supple hands over the fire. Fire is life, and life is fire. 
The ages of ice passes, Krupper. Long have we lived here, hunting the great herds, gathering to war with the Jaghut in the Southlands, birthing and dying with the ebb and flow of the frozen rivers. Krupper has traveled far, then. To the beginning and to the end. My kind give way to your kind, Krapa, though the wars do not cease. What we shall give to you is freedom from such wars. The Jaghut dwindle, ever retreat into forbidding places. The Fokrul assail have vanished, though we never found need to fight them. And the Kachin Chamala are no more. The eyes spoke to them with words of death. Pran's gaze swung back to the fire. Our hunting has brought death to the great herds, Krapa. We are driven south, and this must not be. We are the Talan, but soon the gathering comes, and so shall be voiced the right of Imas and the choosing of the born casters. And then shall come the sundering of flesh, of time itself. With the gathering shall be born the Talan I mass, and the first empire. Why, Krapa wonders, is he here? Prankel shrugged. I have come, for I have been called. By whom, I know not. Perhaps it is the same with you. But Krupper is dreaming. This is Krupper's dream. Then I am honored. Pran straightened. One of your time comes. Perhaps this one possesses the answers we seek. Krupper followed Pran's gaze to the south. He raised an eyebrow. If not mistaken, then Krupa recognizes her as a rivi. The woman who approached was perhaps middle-aged, heavy with child. Her dark, round face bore features similar to Pran Cole's, though less pronounced. Fear shone in her eyes, yet there was a grim determination about her as well. She reached the fire and eyed the two men, and most of her attention drawing to Pran Cole. Talan, she said. The Talan Warren of the Imas of our time has birthed a child in a confluence of sorceries. Its soul wanders lost. Its flesh is an abomination. A shifting must take place. She turned to Krapa and swept back the thick woven robe she wore, revealing her swelled stomach. The bare stretched skin had been recently traced in a tattoo. The image was that of a white-haired fox. The elder god walks again, risen from blood, spilled on consecrated stone. Kral came in answer to the child's need, and now aids us in our quest. He apologizes to you, Krapa, for using the world within your dream. But no younger god can influence this place. Somehow you have made your soul immune to them. The rewards of cynicism, Krapa said, bowing. The woman smiled. I understand, Pran Cole said. You would make of this child, born of Imas powers, a soul taken. Yes, it is the best we can manage, Tlan. A shapeshifter, which we too know as soul taken, must be fashioned. Cropper cleared his throat. Excuse, Krapa, please, but are we not missing someone vital to these plans? She strides two worlds, the Rivi said. Kral guides her now into yours. She is frightened still. It falls to you, Krapa, to welcome her. Krapa adjusted the sleeves of his faded threadbare cloak. This should not prove difficult for one of Krapa's charms. Perhaps the Reavy said, frowning. Her flesh is an abomination. You have been warned. Krapa nodded affably, then looked around. Will any direction do? Pran Cole laughed. I suggest south, the Reavy said. He shrugged, and with a bow to the two companions, he headed south. 
After a few minutes, he glanced back, but the fire was nowhere in sight. He was alone in the chill night. A full moon appeared on the eastern horizon, bathing the land in silver light. Ahead, the tundra rolled on as far as Krupper could see, flat and featureless. Then he squinted. Something had just appeared, still distant, walking with seeming great difficulty. He watched it fall once, then climbed back to its feet. Despite the luminescence, the figure looked black. Krupper moved forward. It had yet to see him, and he stopped when he was but thirty feet away. The rivy had been right. Krupper produced his silk handkerchief and wiped the sweat that had sprung across his brow. The figure had been a woman once, tall, with long black hair. But that woman had been long dead. Her flesh had withered and assumed the hue of dark wood. Perhaps the most horrific aspect of her was her limbs, which had been roughly sewn back onto her body. I, Grappa whispered. This woman had been torn apart once. The woman's head flew up and sightless eyes fixed upon Krupper. She stopped, her mouth opening, but no words coming forth. Surreptitiously, Krupper cast a spell upon himself, then looked at her yet again. He frowned. A spell had been woven about the woman, one of preservation. But something had happened to that spell. Something had reshaped it. Lass, Krupper barked, I know you can hear me. He didn't know, but decided to insist in any case. Your soul is trapped within a body that is not your own. It does not become you. I am named Krupper, and I will lead you to succor. Come. He spun round and began to walk. A moment later, he heard a shuffling behind him and smiled. Ah, he whispered, Krupper has charms indeed. But more, he can be harsh when necessary. The fire had returned, a beacon before them, and Krupa saw the two figures awaiting them. The vestiges of the spell he had cast upon himself made the Talan and the Rivi blinding to his eyes. Such was their power. Krupa and the woman arrived. Prankol stepped forward. Thank you, Krupa. He studied the woman and nodded slowly. Yes, I see the effects of the eye mass upon her. But there is more. He looked to the rivi. She was a mage once. The rivi moved close to the woman. Hear me, lost one. Your name is Tattersail. Your sorcery is Thea. The warren flows within you now. It animates you, protects you. She opened her robe once more. It is time to bring you back into the world. Tattersail stepped back in alarm. Within you is the past, Pran said, my world. You know the present, and the Rivi offers you to the future. In this place, all is merged. The flesh you wear has upon it a spell of preservation, and in your dying act, you opened your warren within the influence of Telan. And now you wander within a mortal's dream. Krapa is the vessel of change. Permit us to aid you. With a wordless cry, Tattersail staggered into Pran's arms. The rivi quickly joined them. My, Krapa breathed, but Krapa's dreams have taken a strange turn. While his own concerns are ever present, a haunting voice, once again, he must set them aside. Suddenly, Kral stood beside him. Not so. It is not my way to use you without just recompense. Krupper looked up at the elder god. Krupper asked for nothing. There is a gift in this, and I am glad to be part of its making. Kral nodded. Nevertheless, speak to me of your efforts. Ralic and Marilio... Seek to right an old wrong, Grappa said with a sigh. They think me ignorant of their schemes, 
but I shall turn such schemes to my purposes. Guilt rides this decision, but they are needed. Understood. And the coin bearer. Protection has been set in motion, though its final shaping is yet to come. I know that the Malazan Empire is present in Darujistan, covertly for the moment. What they seek is anything but clear, Krapa, even to them. Use this to your advantage when you find them. Allies might come from surprising quarters. I will tell you this. Two now approach the city. One is a Talan I mass, the other a bane to magic. Their purposes are destructive, but already forces are in play, attending to them. Seek knowledge of them, but do not openly oppose them. They are dangerous. Power attracts power, Krapa. Leave them to the consequences of their actions. Krapa nodded. Krapa is no fool, Kral. He openly opposes no one, and he finds power a thing to be avoided at all costs. As they spoke, the rivy woman had taken Tattersail in her arms. Pran Cole squatted nearby, his eyes closed and his lips forming silent words. The rivy woman rocked the desiccated body in rhythmic motion, chanting softly. Water stained the rivy's thighs. Aye, Krapa whispered. She prepares to give birth, in truth. Abruptly, the rivy tossed away the body. It crumpled in a lifeless heap. The moon now hung immediately overhead, so bright that Krapa found he could not look at it directly. The rivy had assumed a squatting position, moving with the rhythm of labor, her face sheathed in sweat. Pran Cole remained immobile, though his body was racked in shivering bouts that twisted his face with pain. His eyes opened wide, glowing bright amber and fixed on the moon. Elder God, Krapa said quietly, how much will this tattersail remember of our former life? Unknown, Kral replied. Soul shifting is a delicate thing. The woman was consumed in a conflagration. Her soul's first flight was carried on wings of pain and violence. More, she entered another ravaged body, bearing its own traumas. The child that is born will be like no other ever seen. Its life is a mystery, Krapa. Krapa grunted. Considering her parents, she will indeed be exceptional. Her thought came to him and he frowned. Kral, what of the first child within the rivi? There was none, Krapa. The rivi woman was prepared in a manner unknown to any man. He chuckled, including myself. He raised his head. This sorcery belongs to the moon, Krapa. They continued watching the labors of birth. To Krapa, it seemed they waited more hours in the darkness than any normal night could hold. The moon remained overhead, as if it found its position to its liking, or, he reconsidered, as if it stood guard over them. Then a small cry rose into the still air, and the rivy lifted in her arms a child furred in silver. Even as Krupper watched, the fur sloughed away. The rivy turned the child and placed her mouth against its belly. Her jaws bunched, and the remaining length of umbilical cord fell away. Pran Cole strode to stand beside Krupper and the elder god. The Talan looked exhausted. The child drew from me power beyond my control, he said softly. As the rivy squatted again in afterbirth, holding the child against her chest, Krupper's eyes widened. The mother's belly was smooth. The white fox tattoo was gone. I am saddened, Pran said. 
that I may not return in twenty years to see the woman this child shall become. You shall, Kral said in a low tone, but not as a Talan, as a Talan I must bone caster. The breath hissed between Pran's teeth. How long? he asked. Three hundred thousand years, Pran Kohl of Kanik Tol's clan. Krupa laid a hand on Pran's arm. You've something to look forward to, he said. The Talan stared at Krupa a moment. Then he threw back his head and roared with laughter. The hours before Krupa's dream had proved eventful, beginning with his meeting with Baruch, that permitted the revelation of the coin bearer, punctuated with the clever, if slightly dramatic suspension, of the coin's wax impression, a cantrip that had gone strangely awry. But soon after the meeting, droplets of now hardened wax pebbling the breast and arms of his coat, Krupa paused just outside the alchemist's door. Rold was nowhere to be seen. Oh my, Krupa breathed as he wiped sweat from his forehead. Why should Master Baruch find Crocus's name familiar? Ah, stupid Krupa. Uncle Mammoth, of course. Oh dear, that was close. All could well have been lost. He continued on down the hall to the stairs. For a time there, Opon's power had waxed considerably. Krupa smiled at his pun, but it was a distracted smile. He would do well to avoid such contacts. Power had a habit of triggering his own talents. Already he felt the urgings of the deck of dragons within his head. He hurried down the stairs and crossed the main hall to the doors. Roald was just entering, burdened beneath mundane supplies. Krupa noted the dust covering the old man's clothing. Dear Roald, you look as if you've just weathered a sandstorm. Do you require Krupa's assistance? No. Raoul grunted. Thank you, Krupper. I can manage. Will you be so kind as to close the doors on your way out? Of course, kind Raoul. Krupper patted the man's arm and strode out into the courtyard. The gates leading to the street had been left open, and beyond was a swirling cloud of dust. Ah, oh, yes, the road repairs, Krupper muttered. A headache had burgeoned behind his eyes, and the bright sun overhead wasn't helping matters any. He was halfway to the gates when he stopped. The doors! Krupper has forgotten to close the doors. He spun round and returned to the estate entrance, sighing as the doors closed with a satisfying click. As he turned away a second time, someone shouted in the street beyond. There followed a loud crash, but this latter sound was lost on Krupper. With that bellowed curse, a sorcerous storm roared into his head. He fell to his knees, then his head snapped up, eyes widening. That, he whispered, was indeed a malice and curse. Then why does House Shadow's image burn like fire in Krupper's skull? Who now walks the streets of Jerugistan? A count of knots unending. Mystery solved. More mysteries created. The pain had passed. Krupper climbed to his feet and brushed the dust from his clothing. Good that said affliction occurred beyond the eyes of suspicious beings, Krupper notes with relief. All upon a promise meant to friend Roald. Wise old friend Roald. Opon's breath is this time welcome, though begrudgingly so. He strode to the gates and peered into the street. A cart filled with shattered cobbles had toppled. Two men argued incessantly as to whose fault it was while they righted the cart and proceeded to refill it. Krupa studied them. They spoke well the Daru tongue, but to one who listened carefully, there was the hint of an accent, an accent that did not belong. Oh my, Krupa. He adjusted his coat, took a deep breath, then opened the gate and walked into the street. The fat little man with the flopping sleeves walked from the house's gate and turned left. He seemed in a hurry. 
Sergeant Whiskey Jack wiped the sweat from his brow with a scarred forearm, his eyes slits against the bright sunlight. That is the one, Sergeant, Sorry said beside him. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Whiskey Jack watched the man winding through the crowd. What's so important about him? he asked. I admit, Sorry replied, to some uncertainty as to his significance. But he is vital, Sergeant. Whiskey Jack chewed his lip, then turned to the wagon bed where a city map had been laid flat, its corners anchored down by chunks of rock. Who lives in that estate? A man named Baruch, Sorry answered. An alchemist. He scowled. How did she know that? Are you saying that fat little man is this Baruch? No. He works for the alchemist. Not a servant. A spy, perhaps. His skills involve thievery, and he possesses talent. Whiskey Jack looked up. A seer? For some reason, Sorry winced. The sergeant watched, bemused, as Sorry's face paled. Damn, he wondered. What on earth is going on with this girl? I believe so, she said, her voice trembling. Whiskey Jack straightened. All right, follow him. She nodded shakily, then slipped into the crowd. The sergeant rested his back against the wagon's sidewall. His expression soured as he studied his squad. Trotz was swinging his pick as if on a battlefield. Stones flew everywhere. Passers-by ducked and cursed when ducking failed. Hedge and Fiddler crouched behind a wheelbarrow, flinching each time the bargas pick struck the street. Mallet stood a short distance away, directing pedestrians to the other pavement. He no longer bellowed at the people, having lost his voice arguing with an old man with a donkey, wobbling under an enormous basket of firewood. The bundles now lay scattered across the street, the old man and the donkey nowhere to be seen, providing an effective barrier to wheeled vehicles. All in all, Whiskey Jack concluded, everyone with him had assumed the role of heat-crazed street worker with a facility he found oddly disturbing. Hedge and Fiddler had acquired the wagon, loaded down with cobbles, less than an hour after their midnight landing at a public dock on the lakefront. Exactly how this had been accomplished, Whiskey Jack was afraid to ask. But it suited their plans perfectly. Something nagged at the back of Whiskey Jack's mind, but he dismissed it. He was a soldier, and a soldier followed orders. When the time came, there would be chaos at every major intersection of streets in the city. Planting mines ain't gonna be easy, Fiddler had pointed out. So we do it right in front of everyone's nose. Road repair. Whiskey Jack shook his head. True to Fiddler's prediction, no one had yet questioned them. They continued ripping up streets and replacing the old cobbles with Maranth munitions encased in fire-hardened clay. Was everything going to be so easy? His thoughts returned to Sorry. Not likely. Quick Ben and Kalam had at last convinced him that their half of the mission was better off without her. She had tagged along with his crew, eyes never still, but otherwise offering little in the way of assistance. He admitted to feeling some relief that he'd sent her off on that fat man's trail. But what had pulled a 17-year-old girl into the world of war? He couldn't understand it. He couldn't get past her youthfulness, couldn't see beyond to the cold, murderous killer behind those dead eyes. As much as he told his squad that she was as human as any of them, the doubts grew with every question about her that he could not answer. He knew almost nothing about her. The revelation that she could manage a fishing boat had come from seemingly nowhere. And here in Darujistan, she'd hardly acted like a girl raised in a fishing village. There was a natural poise about her, a measure of assurance more common to the higher, educated classes. No matter where she was, she carried herself as if she belonged there. Did that sound like a 17-year-old girl? No, but it seemed to match Quick Ben's assertions, and that galled him. How else to match her with that icy-cold woman torturing prisoners outside Nathilok? 
He could look at her and part of him would say, Young, not displeasing to the eye, a confidence that makes her magnetic. While another part of his mind snapped shut. Young, he'd hear his own harsh pained laugh. Oh no, not this lass. She's old. She walked under a blood-red moon in the dawn of time, did this one. Her face is the face of all that cannot be fathomed, he thought. And she's looking you in the eye, Whiskey Jack, and you'll never know what she's thinking. He could feel sweat drain down his face and neck. Nonsense. That part of his mind lost itself to its own terror. It took the unknown and fashioned, in blind desperation, a visage it could recognize. Despair, he told himself, always demands a direction, a focus. Find the direction, and the despair goes away. Of course, it wasn't that easy. The despair he felt had no shape. It was not just sorry, not just this endless war, not even the treachery from within the Empire. He had nowhere to look for answers, and he was tired of asking questions. When he had looked upon sorry at Grey Dog, the source of his horror lay in the unveiling of what he was becoming. A killer stripped of remorse, armoured in the cold iron of inhumanity, freed from the necessity to ask questions, to seek answers, to fashion a reasonable life like an island in a sea of slaughter. In the empty eyes of this child, he had seen the withering of his own soul. The reflection had been unblemished, with no imperfections to challenge the truth of what he saw. The sweat running down his back beneath the jerkin felt hot against the chill that gripped him. Whiskey Jack lifted a trembling hand to his forehead. In the days and nights ahead, people would die by his command. He'd been thinking of that as the fruition of his careful, precise planning. Success measured by the ratio of the enemy's dead to his own losses. The city, its busy, jostling multitudes, unceasing in their lives small and large, cowardly and brave, no more than a game board, and the game played solely for the benefit of others. He had made his plans as if nothing of himself was at stake, and yet his friends might die. There, he had finally called them what they were, and the friends of others might die, and sons, daughters, parents. The roll call of shattered lives seemed unending. Whiskey Jack pressed his back against the sidewall in an effort to steady his reeling mind. Desperately, he lifted his gaze from the street. He saw a man at a window on the second floor of the estate. The man was watching them, and his hands were bright red. Shaken, the sergeant looked away. He bit into the side of his mouth until he felt a sharp stab of pain, then tasted blood. Concentrate, he told himself. Step back from that chasm. Concentrate, or you'll die. And not just you, but also your squad. They trust you to get them out of this. You've got to keep earning that trust. He drew a deep breath through his nostrils, then turned to one side and spat a mouthful of blood. He stared down at the red-slicked cobble. There, he hissed. It's easy to look at, isn't it? He heard footsteps and looked up to see Hedge and Fiddler arrive. Both men wore troubled expressions. You all right, Sarge? Fiddler asked quietly. Behind the two saboteurs, Mallet approached, his gaze calculating and fixed on Whiskey Jack's white, sweat-soaked face. The sergeant grimaced. We're behind schedule. How much longer? Their faces smeared with white dust and sweat. The two men looked at each other. Then Hedge answered, Three hours. We've decided on seven mines, Fiddler said. Four sparkers, two flamers, and one cusser. Will that bring down some of these buildings? Whiskey Jack asked, avoiding Mallet's eyes. Sure, no better way to block an intersection. Fiddler grinned at his companion. You got one in particular you want dropped? Hedge inquired. The estate behind you is an alchemist's. Right, Hedge said. That should light the sky all right. You've got two and a half hours, Whiskey Jack said. Then it's on to the Majesty Hill crossroads. Mallet stepped close. Another headache? He asked softly. 
Whiskey Jack closed his eyes, then gave a sharp nod. The healer raised a hand and passed it over the sergeant's brow. Just easing it a little, he said. The sergeant grinned ruefully. This is getting old, Mallet. You're even using the same words. A cool numbness flowed through his thoughts. Mallet's face was drawn. He lowered his hand. When we have time, I'll find the source, Whiskey Jack. Right. The sergeant smiled. When we have time. Hope Cal and Quick are doing okay, Mallet said, turning to watch the street traffic. You sent Sorry off? Yes. We're on our own. They know where to find us, all three of them. He glanced up at the estate window. The man with the red hands was still there, but now he was studying the distant rooftops. A cloud of dust rose between them, and Whiskey Jack returned his attention to the city map, where every major intersection, the barracks and Majesty Hill, had been circled in red. Mallet? Sarge? Bit the inside of my cheek again. The healer stepped close, once more raising his hand. Crocus Younghand strode south on Trallet's walk. The first signs of the upcoming Gedron fate had appeared. Dyed banners hung from clotheslines over the street, painted flowers and strips of bark framed doorways, and bushels of dried weeds had been tacked to walls at every crossing. Outlanders already filled the streets. Gadrobi herders, rivy traders, Catlin weavers, a mob of sweaty, shouting, excited people. Animal smells mixed with human, making the narrower alleys so redolent as to be almost impassable, which in turn crowded the main thoroughfares even more. In past years, Crocus had reveled in the celebration, pushing through the midnight crowds and filling his own pockets by emptying those around him. During the fate, worries of the Malazan Empire's exploits in the far north disappeared for a time. His uncle always smiled at that, saying the turn of the season gave the efforts of humanity their proper perspective. The mewling, petty acts, he'd say, of a short-lived and short-sighted species, Crocus, can do nothing to mar the great cycles of life. As he walked home, Mammoth's words returned to him now. He'd always looked upon his uncle as a wise, if slightly ineffectual, old man. Increasingly, however, he found himself troubled by Mammoth's observations. Celebrating Gedaron's rite of spring shouldn't be an excuse to avoid the pressures of reality. It wasn't just a harmless escape. It was a means of delaying the probable and making it inevitable. We could dance in the streets all year long, he scowled to himself, to a thousand great cycles, and with the same certainty reserved for the coming and going of seasons, the Malazan Empire would march through our gates. They'd end the dance with the edge of a sword, being industrious, disciplined people, impatient with useless expenditures of energy, grimly short-sighted. He came to a tenement and, nodding at the pipe-smoking old woman sitting on the steps, went inside. The hallway was empty, the usual crowd of children no doubt outside, playing in the streets, and a calming domestic murmur drifted out from behind closed doors. He climbed the creaking staircase to the first floor, Outside Mammoth's door, the scholar's pet winged monkey hovered, scratching and pulling desperately at the latch. It ignored Crocus until he arrived to push it aside. Then it squealed and flew in circles around his head. Being a pain again, eh? Crocus said to the creature, waving a hand as it flew too close and ended up snarled in his hair. Tiny, human-like hands gripped his scalp. All right, Moby, he said, relenting, and opened the door. Inside, Mammoth was preparing herbal tea. Without turning, he asked, Tea, Crocus? And as for that little monster who's probably riding your head, tell him I've had just about enough of him today. Moby sniffed indignantly and flapped over to the scholar's desk, where he landed with a belly flop, scattering papers to the floor. He chirped. Sighing, Mammoth turned with the tray in his hands, his watery eyes fixed on Crocus. You look tired, lad. Crocus slumped into the less ragged of the two chairs occupying the room. Yes, tired and in a dark mood. My tea will do its usual wonders, 
Mamut said, smiling. Crocus grunted, not looking up. Maybe, maybe not. Mamut stepped forward and laid the tray on a small table between the chairs. He sat down with a soft groan. As you know, I possess few moral qualms about your chosen profession, Crocus, since I question rights of any kind, including ownership. Even privileges demand responsibility, as I've always said, and the privilege of ownership demands that the owner be responsible for protecting his or her claim. My only concern, of course, is for risks you must perforce take. Mammoth leaned forward and poured tea. Lad, a thief must be sure of one thing, his concentration. Distractions are dangerous. Crocus glanced up at his uncle. What have you been writing all these years? He asked suddenly, gesturing at the desk. Surprised, Mammoth picked up his cup and sat back. Well, a genuine interest in education, then. Finally? As I've said before, Crocus, you possess the intelligence to go so far. And while I'm but a humble man of letters, my word will open to you many doors in the city. Indeed, even the city council is not beyond your reach, if you would choose such a direction. Discipline, lad, the very same requirement you've mastered as a thief. A crafty expression glittered in Crocus's gaze as it held on Mammoth. How long would it take, he asked quietly, to become known in such circles? Well, said Mammoth, it is the learning that matters, of course. Of course. In Crocus's mind, however, there rose the image of a sleeping maiden. Mammoth blew on his drink. With full-time studies and your youthful eagerness, I would hazard a year, perhaps more, perhaps less. Is there a need for haste? Just youthful eagerness, I suppose. In any case, you haven't answered me yet. What are you writing, Uncle? Ah. Mamet glanced at his desk, raising an eyebrow at Moby, who had opened an inkwell and was drinking from it. The history of the Rujistan, he said. I'm just beginning the fifth volume which opens with the reign of Ektalm, second to last of the tyrant kings. Crocus blinked. Who? Smiling, Mammoth sipped his tea. Usurper of Latast, and succeeded by his daughter Sandine, who brought on the rising time, and with it the end of the age of tyrants. Oh, right. Crocus, if you're serious about all this, de Rugistan's history is where we'll begin in the lessons. But that doesn't mean starting at volume five. It means starting at the very beginning. Crocus nodded. Born on a rumor, he said. At the desk, Moby squawked, then coughed. Mammoth shot him a glance, then swung his attention back to Crocus, expression veiled as he replied. Yes, lad, de Rugistan was born on a rumor, he hesitated. You've heard that saying elsewhere, recently? Someone mentioned it, Crocus said casually. Can't recall who, though. He could, in fact. It had been spoken by the assassin, Ralik Nom. Do you know what it means? Crocus shook his head. Mammoth leaned back. Drink your tea, my lad. The old man paused, then began. In the early cycles in this realm, three great peoples struggled for dominion, none of them human as we would know human. Bowing out early in the struggle were the Fulcral Assail, or the Crusail, as they are now known. Not through weakness, but, well, disinterest. The remaining two peoples warred endlessly. Eventually one fell, for they were a race of individuals battling as much among themselves as against their racial enemies. They were called the Jag Hut, though the term has degenerated these days to Jag or Shurl. While losers in the war... They did not disappear entirely. It said some jag huts survive to this day, though thankfully not on Genabacus. So, Mamut cupped his hands around his teacup. De Rujistan was born on a rumor. Among the indigenous Gadrobi hill tribes survived the legend that a jag hut's barrow lay somewhere in the hills. Now, the jag huts were possessors of great magic, 
creators of secret warrens and items of power. Over time, the Gadrobi legend made its way beyond the hills, into the Jenabakan north and the Catlin south, to kingdoms since crumbled to dust in the east and west. In any case, searchers came to the hills, at first a trickle, then hordes, entire tribes led by power-hungry shamans and warlocks. Every hillside was laced with trenches and boreholes. From the camps and shanty towns, from the thousands of treasure seekers arriving each spring, a city was born. To Rujistan, Krogus said. Yes, the barrow was never found, and the rumor has long since dwindled. Few are even aware of it these days, and those who are know better than to resume the search. Why? Mamet frowned. Rarely does a jaghut construction appear in the hands of a human, but it has happened, and the consequences have inevitably been catastrophic. The old man's frown deepened. The lesson is clear for those who would choose to recognize it. Crocus thought for a time. So the Crossail vanished, the Jag were defeated. What happened to the third people then? The ones who won? Why aren't they here instead of us? Mammoth opened his mouth to reply, then stopped, reconsidering. Crocus's eyes narrowed. He wondered what Mammoth had been about to reveal, and why he had chosen not to reveal it. Mammoth set down his cup. No one is certain what happened to them, Crocus, or how they became what they are today. They exist, sort of, and are known, to all who have faced the Malazan Empire, as the Talan Imas. Sorry pushed through the crowd, struggling to keep the fat man within sight. It was not that he was difficult to follow, but the girl was struggling against a storm within her head, which had been triggered by a single word uttered by Sergeant Whiskey Jack. Seer. It had felt as if a dark, compacted thing in her brain had burst open with that word, and now warred against all that surrounded it. Though it had initially come upon her with a force that seemed almost overwhelming, she could now sense its waning. Whatever it fought was winning the battle, yet faintly she thought she could hear the weeping of a child. I am Cotillion, she heard herself murmur, patron of assassins, known to all as the Rope of Shadow. The weeping grew fainter. The seer is dead. Part of her mind cried out at that, while another asked, What seer? I am within, yet apart. I stand at Shadow Throne's side, and he is named Amanas, and he is the Lord of Shadows. I am here as the Hand of Death. Sorry smiled and nodded to herself, once again in control. Whatever had challenged that was now gone, once more buried deep inside. The luxury of weeping, of anger, of fear did not belong to her, had never belonged to her. She drew a deep breath, and her senses narrowed to the task at hand. The fat little man was dangerous. The how and why of this remained to be answered, but every power hissed in alarm each time she caught a glimpse of him amid the crowds. And all that is dangerous, she told herself, must die. Beneath the second tier wall in the lakefront, the market along Salt Walk was at its usual frenzied peak. The sour heat, building all day in the cluttered avenues and alleys, was at its height. Sweating, exhausted merchants screamed curses at competitors over the heads of customers. Fights broke out every few minutes in one or another area, the turgid jostle of the crowds pulling the contestants apart long before the arrival of ill-tempered guards. Squatting on their grass mats, local rivy plainsmen called out in their nasal sing-song endless descriptions at intersections Gadrobi herders stood at tethering poles surrounded by braying goats and sheep, while others pushed wooden carts burdened with cheeses and clay jugs filled with fermented milk. Daru fishermen walked with spears of smoked fish, bobbing above their heads, streaming with buzzing flies. Catlin weavers sat behind waist-high fortresses, comprised of bolts of brightly dyed cloth. 
Gretfalan farmers stood in their wagons, selling the season's bitter fruits and sweet tubers. Woodsellers forced their ox-drawn wagons through the crowds, their children clinging to the stacked bundles of wood like monkeys. Dark-robed men and women from Callos sang out the clashing claims of their thousand sects of Drek, each holding aloft their sect's particular icon. Cropper strode down the market street with a jaunty step, his arms waving about seemingly of their own accord. Such movement, however, was no mere affectation. It disguised the gesturing required for casting spells. As a thief, it appeared that Crupper's tastes did not demand much. He stole food, fruit and sweets mostly, and it was to such desires of the palate that he had honed his skills of magic. As he walked, the chaotic dance of his arms was timed to catch apples flying from baskets, pastries leaping from trays, chocolate-covered cherries plucked from pans, all moving so swiftly as to be no more than blurs dodging bodies in their path. Inside the wide, flopping sleeves of his coat, pockets had been sewn, some large, some tiny. All that entered Crupper's hands disappeared up his sleeves, tucked into appropriately sized pockets. He strode on, a connoisseur of edible delicacies of a hundred cultures, an expression of sated contentment on his round face. Eventually, after a long, circuitous route, Cropper arrived at the Phoenix Inn. He paused on the steps and chatted with a lone thug standing there, removing from a sleeve a glazed honey ball. Then, taking a bite from the sweetmeat, he pushed open the door and disappeared inside. Half a block down the street, Sorry propped herself against the pitted wall of a tenement and crossed her arms. The fat little man was a wonder. She'd seen enough of his exquisite ballet to recognize him as an adept. Yet she felt confused, for the mind behind the man's facade hinted at capacities far greater than those he had shown. Confirmation that here, indeed, was a dangerous creature. From where she stood, She studied the inn. The man on the steps seemed to be screening everyone entering, but she couldn't detect any gesture that might indicate a thieves' cant. The conversations were brief, usually of mutual recognition. Nevertheless, she intended to enter the inn. It was the kind of place Whiskey Jack had sent Kalam and Quickbent to find, a haunt of thieves, strong arms, and assassins. Why the sergeant wanted to find such a place was a detail that hadn't been shared with her. The wizard and Kalam had suspicions about her, and she sensed that their arguments were swaying Whiskey Jack. If they could, they'd keep her out of everything, but she didn't intend that to happen. Pushing herself from the wall, Sorry crossed the street and approached the Phoenix Inn. Overhead, the afternoon had waned into a thick, heavy dusk, the smell of rain in the air. As she neared the front steps, The thug's attention focused on her. The man grinned. Following Cropper around, eh? He wagged his head. Girls shouldn't carry swords anyway. Hope you're not planning to go inside. With the sword, uh uh-uh, not unescorted anyway. Sorry stepped back. She glanced up and down the street. The nearest pedestrian was over a street away, heading in the opposite direction. She closed her hands around the edges of her half-cloak and drew it around her waist. Let me pass, she said quietly. How had that fat man spotted her? The man leaned on the railing. All this is just begging for some kind of conversation, friendly-like, he said. So, how about you and me go back to the alley? You lay down your sword, and I'll be gentle. Otherwise, things could get rough. And what would be the fun of... Sorry's left hand darted out. A dagger flashed between them. The blade entered the man's right eye and then his brain. He jerked back over the rail and fell, landing with a heavy thud beside the steps. Sorry walked up to him and retrieved her dagger. She paused, adjusting the belt that carried her dueling sword, then checked the street. Seeing no one close enough to have noticed anything awry in the deepening gloom, She climbed the steps and entered the inn. She was stopped before she had taken her second step 
coming face to face with a moaning boy hanging upside down. Two rough-looking women were taking turns to swing him back and forth. Every time he tried to reach up to the rope tied to his feet, he earned a knock on the head. One of the women grinned at Sorry. Hey now, the woman said, grasping Sorry's arm as she walked by. Sorry turned a cold eye on the woman. What? The woman leaned close, her breath a mist of beer as she whispered, You get in trouble. You just call for Erilter and Mees. That's us, right? Thank you. Sorry resumed her walk. She'd already seen the fat little man. What had the thug called him? Crupper. He'd seated himself at a table near the far wall, beneath the gallery. Through the crowded room, Sorry saw a space open at the bar, where she might take position and observe. She pushed forward. Since Crupper evidently knew of her, she decided to make no effort in hiding her attention. Often, that was exactly the kind of pressure that cracked a man's will. In a war of patience, Sorry smiled inwardly, the mortal is ever at a disadvantage. Crocus turned the corner and approached the Phoenix Inn. The course Mammoth had set for him was intimidating, the education extending far beyond books, to the etiquette of court manners, the functions of various officials, bloodlines and particular quirks among certain dignitaries. But he had vowed to himself he'd follow it through. His goal was one day to stand before that dull maiden, awaiting a formal introduction. Something in him mocked the image. There stands Crocus, the scholar, the sophisticated young promise, the thief. It was all too absurd, yet it dogged him, steeled his resolve. He'd come to it one day soon. Until then, however, there were other matters to attend to, things that needed redressing. As he came up to the inn steps, he saw a huddled shadow beneath the railing. Cautiously, Crocus moved closer. As Sorry reached the bar, the door slammed open on the other side of the room. She turned with everyone else to see a young, black-haired man standing there. Someone's murdered Chert, the man shouted. He's been knifed! Half a dozen patrons surged to the door, pushing past the young man and disappearing outside. Sorry faced the bar again. Catching the barman's eye, she said, Gretfallen ale, please, in a pewter tankard. The woman Irilta had called Mies appeared beside her, thumping two broad forearms on the bar as she leaned forward. Attend the lady, Scurv, Mies growled. She got taste. Mies dipped her head close to Sorry's. Good taste all round. Chert was a pig. Sorry stiffened. Her hand slipped down beneath her cloak. Easy, girl, he said in a low tone. We ain't wagging tongues. Around here, you take care of yourselves first. And I don't want no knife in my eye. We said we'd take care of you, didn't we? The ale arrived as ordered. Sorry raised a hand and closed it on the tankard's handle. You don't want to take care of me, Mies, she said quietly. Another person arrived on Mies's other side. Glancing at him, Sorry saw that it was the black-haired youth, his face pale. Damn it, Mies, he hissed. I'm having a really bad day. Mies chuckled and draped an arm over his shoulders. Scurve, serve us up a couple of them Gretfallen ales. Crocus here's earned the Rugistan's best. Mies turned her head and bent close to Sorry again. Next time she whispered. You don't want to show that kind of breeding. Not around here, anyway. Sorry frowned down at her drink. She had been careless, ordering the city's best. Then she took a mouthful. That's fine, she said. Fine indeed. Me grinned, nudging Crocus. The lady likes it just fine. Crocus leaned forward, offering Sorry a weary but warm smile. From outside came the klaxon of the guard. Scurve served up two ales. Sorry watched Crocus's gaze move down her body, then stop. The youth's smile tightened, his face whitening even more than before. As the tankard was set before him, Crocus averted his eyes and reached for it. Pay up before you drink that, Crocus, Scurve muttered. 
You're getting to be just as bad as Crupper. Crocus reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of coins. As he tried to count them, some slipped between his fingers and bounced on the bar. Of the three that fell, two clattered briefly, then stopped. The third coin spun and continued spinning. Sorry's eyes swung to it, as did Scurves and Mises. Crocus reached for it, then hesitated. The coin was still spinning, its momentum unchanged. Sorry stared at the coin, feeling echoes of power slam into her skull like ocean waves. From within, all at once, came an answering surge. Scurve shouted as the coin skidded across the bar, bounced once high into the air, then clattered to a stop directly in front of Crocus. No one spoke. Beyond their small ring, no one else had witnessed the event. Crocus thrust his hand forward and collected the coin. Not this one, he grated. Fine, Scurve answered in a similar hoarse voice. He reached shaking hands to gather in the other coins Crocus had laid on the bar. Beneath the counter, Sorry brushed her hand against her dagger's hilt and scabbard. It came away wet. So, Crocus had seen the blood. She would have to kill him. Only, her frown deepened, she knew she wouldn't. Crocus, my boy, came a shout from under the gallery. Mies sneered in that direction. The flopping fish himself, she muttered. Crapper calls, lad. Crocus snorted, having returned the coin to his pocket. He picked up his tankard. Later, Mies. So, she had found Opon's man, as easily as that. And he was connected to Crupper somehow. This was almost too simple. It made her suspicious. A lightly lad, Mies said. Me and a realtor. We look out for him, right? Sorry leaned against the bar, her eyes on the tankard in her hand. She'd have to play this very carefully. That burst of shadow sorcery, responding to the coin's influence, had been entirely instinctive. Right, Mies, she said. No worries on that count. Okay. Mies sighed. Okay, let's try for the cheap stuff now. Scurve? Daru beer, if you please. Earthenware, if you have it. Crouched against the second tier wall on the lakefront side was Quip's Bar, a common haunt of shipmen and fisher hands. The bar's walls were cut sandstone, and over time the whole edifice had developed a backward lean, as if withdrawing from the front street. Quip's now sagged against the second tier wall, as did the adjoining squatter shacks, constructed mostly of driftwood and hull planks, washed ashore from the occasional wreck out on Mole's Reef. Dusk brought a light rain to Darugistan, the mists crawling in from the water and onto the shore. Far out over the lake, lightning flashed, but too distant for thunder. Kalam emerged from Quip's bar just as a local greyface brought his burning pitch stick to a nearby gaslight, having moments earlier opened the copper valves. The lamp ignited in a flash of blue flame, that quickly evened out. Kalam paused outside the bar to watch the odd, grey-robed man continue on down the street. He squinted skyward, then moved up the street. He came to the last squatter shack, this one abutting a peculiar jag in the tier wall, and entered. Quick Ben looked up from his cross-legged position in the centre of the dirt floor. Any luck? No, Kalam said. The guild's gone to ground. Why? I've no idea. He went to the far wall and sat down on his bedroll. He leaned back against the ancient pitted stone and eyed his comrade. You think maybe the city council's moved to take out the local assassins? Quickben's gaze glittered in the gloom. You mean anticipating we try to make contact? Kalam looked away. I doubt they're idiots. They must know it's the Malazan way. Offer the guild a contract it can't refuse, then sit back and watch the rulers drop, like headless flies. Whiskey Jack suggested the plan. Dujak okayed it. Those two were talking the old emperor's language there, quick. 
The old man must be laughing in the abyss right now. The wizard shivered. An unpleasant image. Shrugging, Kalam continued. It's all academic anyway, if we can't find a local assassin. Wherever they are, it's not in Lakefront District, I'd swear to that. The only name I picked up that's got mystery around it is someone named the Eel. Not an assassin, though. Something else. Where next, then? Quick Ben asked. Kadrubi District? No, just a bunch of farmers and herders there. Hood knows the smell alone coming from that place is enough to cross it off the list. We'll try Daru, starting tomorrow. Kalam hesitated. What about your side of things? Quick Ben bowed his head. When he answered, it was a faint whisper. Almost ready. Whiskey Jack nearly choked when he heard your proposal. So did I. You'll be walking into the viper's den quick. You sure it's necessary? No. Quick Ben looked up. Personally, I'd rather we just dropped everything and ran. Away from it all. From the Empire. From Daruchistan. From war. But try convincing the sergeant to do that. He's loyal to an idea. And that's the hardest kind to turn. Kalam nodded. Honor. Integrity, all that expensive crap. Right, so we do it this way because it's the only way left to us. Hairlock's insanity has become a liability, but we can use him still one last time. Power draws power, and with luck, Hairlock's demise will do just that. The more ascendants we can lure into the fray, the better. I always thought that was something to avoid, Quick. The wizard's smile was strained. Tell me about it. But right now, the more confusion and chaos, the better. And if Taishren catches wind? Quick Ben's smile broadened. Then we're dead all that much sooner. So it goes. Kalam barked a short, humorless laugh. So it goes. The wizard cocked his head. The sun's past the horizon. Time to start. You want me out of here? Kalam asked. Quick Ben shook his head. No, I want you right where you are for this one. If I don't come back, take my body and burn it down to ash. Scatter the ash to the four winds and curse my name with all your heart. Kalam was silent. Then he asked in a growl, How long do I wait? Dawn, Quick Ben replied. You understand I would only ask this of my closest friend. I understand. Now, get on with it, damn it. Quick Ben gestured. A ring of fire sprang from the earth, surrounding the wizard. He closed his eyes. To Kalam, his friend seemed to deflate slightly as if something essential to life had disappeared. Quick Ben's neck creaked as his chin sank down to his chest. His shoulders slumped, and a long breath escaped with a slow hiss. The ring of fire flared, then dimmed to a lapping glimmer on the earth. Kalam shifted position, stretching out his legs and crossing his arms. In the gathering silence, he waited. A pale Murillo returned to the table and sat down. Someone's disposing of the body, he said, then shook his head. Whoever killed Chert was a professional with a real nasty streak, right through the eye. Enough, Krupper cried out, raising his hands. Krupper happens to be eating, dear Murillo, and Krupper also happens to have a delicate stomach. Chart was a fool, Murillo continued, ignoring Crupper, but hardly the type to attract such viciousness. Crocus said nothing. He'd seen the blood on that dark-haired woman's dagger. Who can say? Crupper waggled his eyebrows. Perhaps he was witness to some horrific horror. 
Perhaps he was stamped out as a man crushes a cute mouse underfoot. Crocus glanced around. His eyes returned to the woman standing with Mies at the bar. Dressed in leather armor with a plain dueling sword strapped to her hip, she reminded him of the time he had watched, as a young boy, a troop of mercenaries ride through the city. They had been the Crimson Guard, he recalled. Five hundred men and women, without a shiny buckle among them. His gaze remained on the woman. Like a mercenary, a killer for whom killing had long since lost its horror. What had Chert done to earn a knife in the eye? Crocus looked away, in time to see Ralik Nom enter the bar. The assassin approached the table, seemingly unconscious of the locals moving from his path. Carl intercepted him before he reached the table. The burly man slapped Ralik's back and leaned drunkenly against him. Nom, you old bastard. Ralik threw an arm around Cole's round shoulders, and together they came to the table. Crupper looked up. Oh, my dear comrades, Crupper invites you to join our familiar gathering. Waving his arms at the two empty chairs, he rocked back in his seat. To bring you up to date on our dramatic doings, the lad Crocus has been staring dreamily into space while Murillo and Crupper have discussed the latest natterings of the street rats. Cole remained standing, weaving unsteadily, a frown knitting his brows. Ralik sat down and reached for the pitcher of beer. What natterings are those? The assassin asked casually. The rumor that we've now allied with Moonspawn, Murillo said. Nonsense, of course, Cropper said. Have you seen anything to suggest such a thing? Murillo grinned. The moon hasn't moved away, has it? Not only that, there's that council tent stationed directly under it. Crocus spoke up. I heard from Uncle Mammoth that the councilmen haven't had any luck getting a message to whoever's in Moonspawn. Typical, Murillo commented, his eyes narrowing briefly on Ralik. Who lives in there? Crocus asked. Cole tottered and threw both hands down on the table to steady himself. He thrust his red face at Crocus and bellowed, Five black dragons! Within the warren of chaos, Quick Ben knew of the innumerable shifting pathways that led to doors. Though he called them doors, they were in fact barriers created where warrens touched, a calcretion of energy as solid as basalt. Chaos touched on all realms with gnarled fingertips bleeding power. The doors hardened wounds in the flesh of other worlds, other avenues of magic. The wizard had focused his talents on such doors. While within the warren of chaos, he had learned the ways of shaping their energy. He had found means of altering the barriers, of sensing what lay beyond them. Each warren of magic possessed a smell, each realm a texture. And though the pathways he took were never the same as those he had taken before, he had mastered the means of finding those he sought. He travelled now down one of those paths, a track of nothingness enclosed by the Warren's own accretions, twisting and fraught with contradictions. On one trail, he'd will himself forward, yet find himself moving back. He'd come to a sharp right turn, followed by another, then another, then yet another, all in the same direction. He knew it was the power of his mind that opened the pathways, but they had their own laws, or perhaps they were his yet unknown to him. Whatever the source of the shaping, it was madness to find. He came at last to the door he sought. The barrier showed as nothing more than a dull, slate-gray stone. Hovering before it, Quick Ben whispered a command, and his spirit took the form of his own body. He stood a moment, mastering the disconnected tremble of his ghost body, then stepped forward and laid hands on the door. Its edges were hard and warm. Toward the center it grew hot and soft to the touch. The surface slowly lost its opaqueness beneath the wizard's hands, becoming glassy like obsidian. 
Quick Ben closed his eyes. He had never before sought to pass through such a door. He was not even certain that it was possible. And if he survived into the beyond, was there any way to return? Past the mechanics of the one thing loomed his final, most difficult worry. He was about to attempt entry into a realm where he wasn't welcome. Quick Ben opened his eyes. I am direction, he said quietly. He leaned against the barrier. I am the power of will in a place that respects this and only this. He leaned harder. I am the Warren's touch. To chaos, nothing is immune. Nowhere is immune. He felt the door begin to yield. He lashed out one hand behind him, fending off a growing pressure. Only I shall pass, he hissed. Abruptly, with a strange thumping sound, he slipped through, energy flaring around his body. The wizard staggered over rough, parched earth. He regained his balance and looked around. He stood on a barren plain, the horizon off to his left humped with low hills. Overhead spanned a sky the color of quicksilver, a scatter of long, stringy clouds moving in unison and black as ink directly above. Quickben sat down, folding his legs and clasping his hands in his lap. Shadow throne, he said. Lord of shadows, I am come to your realm. Will you receive my presence as befits a peaceful visitor? From the hills came an answer, the howling of hounds. Chapter 12 Walk with me on thieves' road. Hear its song underfoot, how clear its tone in misstep as it sings you in two. Absalar's Cant, Drisbin, born 1135. Kneading his brow, Cropper sat reading in Mammoth's study. And in the calling down to earth, the god was crippled, and so chained in its place. In the calling down, many lands were sundered by the god's fists, and things were born and things were released. Chained and crippled was this god, Cropper glanced up from the ancient tome and rolled his eyes. Brevity! Cropper prays for brevity! He returned to the faded handwritten script. And it bred caution in the unveiling of its powers. The crippled god bred caution but not well enough, for the powers of the earth came to it in the end. Chained was the crippled god, and so chained was it destroyed. And upon this barren plain that imprisoned the crippled god... Many gathered to the deed. Hood, grey wanderer of death, was among the gathering, as was Decembry, then Hood's warrior, though it was here and in this time that Decembry shattered the bonds Hood held upon him. Also among the gathering were... Crupper groaned and flipped pages. The list seemed interminable, absurdly long. From this account, he half expected to see his grandmother's name among those listed. Finally. After three pages, he found the names he sought. And among those that came from the vaulted heavens of silver, the Tista Andi, dwellers of darkness in the place before light, black dragons numbering five, and in their league sailed red-winged Silana, said to dwell among the Tista Andi in their fang of darkness descending from the vaulted heavens of silver. Crupper nodded, muttering to himself. Descending fang of darkness, moonspawn, home to five black dragons and one red dragon? He shivered. How had Cole come upon this? True, the man hadn't always been a drunken lout, but even his past station, lofty as it was, hadn't been the scholarly kind. Who then had spoken through the old man's wine-stained mouth? That, Crupper sighed to himself, shall have to wait its answer. The significance, however, of Cole's bellowed claim lies in its evident truth, and as to how it pertains to the present situation. He closed the book and rose to his feet. Behind him he heard footsteps. I've brought you herbal tea, the old man said, as he entered the closet-sized room. 
Has Aladart's realm compendium been beneficial, Crupper? Beneficial indeed, Crupper said, gratefully accepting the earthenware mug. Crupper has learned the value of modern language. Such long-lipped dribbles common to those ancient scholars are a curse. Crupper is thankful to find extinct in our time. Aha, the old man said, coughing slightly and looking away. Well, do you mind if I ask what you were seeking? Crupper glanced up, the corners of his eyes crinkling slightly. Not at all, Mammoth. I thought to find mention of my grandmother's name. Mammoth frowned, then nodded. I see. Well, I'll not inquire as to your luck, then. Please do not, Crupper said, eyes widening. Luck is such a dreadful companion these days, with all awry as all happens to be. But thank you for understanding Crupper's need for circumspection. Not at all, Mammoth said, waving one hand. I didn't mean to. Well, yes, I did. Curiosity, you understand, the intellectual kind. Crupper smiled beatifically and sipped tea. Well, Mamet said, shall we return to the common room then and find respite before the hearth? They strode into the other chamber. Once seated, Crupper stretched out his legs and leaned back. How has your writing been coming along? he asked. Slow, Mamet answered, as one would expect, of course. It seemed Mammoth was working up to something, and so Crupper waited, idly wiggling his toes. A minute passed, then the old man cleared his throat and spoke. Crupper, have you seen much of my dear nephew lately? Crupper raised his eyebrows. Long ago, he said, Crupper made a promise to a man, the man being a concerned uncle to a young boy who found the streets an exciting playground. I, the lad dreamed of sword fights and dark deeds committed in alleys on behalf of princesses in disguise, or some such thing. Mammoth was nodding, his eyes closed. And to such promises, Crupper has availed of himself thoroughly, for he too loved the boy. And, as with any endeavor, survival is measured in ability, and so did Crupper take the lad under his silken wing with some success, yes? Mammoth smiled, still nodding. And so, to answer the uncle's question, indeed, Crupper has seen the lad. Mammoth leaned forward and fixed Crupper with an intense gaze. Have you seen anything odd in his actions? I mean, has he asked you any strange questions, made any requests? Crupper's eyes narrowed. He paused to drink. Bluntly, yes. For one, he sought the return of a fine cache of jewellery he acquired recently, for personal reasons, as he said. Personal reasons. Crupper wondered then, and wonders now. But the lad's seeming sincerity, nay, focused intensity, struck Crupper as laudable. Agreed. Would you believe Crocus has now expressed an interest in formal education I can't understand it. The boy's positively obsessed about something. Perhaps, then, Cropper should piece this together. Thank you, Mamet said, relieved. I would know where all this is coming from. So much ambition all at once. I fear it may soon burn itself out. If we can nourish it, however. By all means, Cropper said. There is more to life than petty thievery, after all. Mammoth grinned. Why, Crupper? I'm surprised to hear that coming from you. Oh, such comments are better left between you and Crupper. In any case, I believe Morillo knows something of all this. He intimated as much this evening while we dined at the Phoenix Inn. Mammoth asked, Is Morillo well? Crupper smiled. The net about the lad remains intact, he said. For one, Ralik Nom has taken the responsibility seriously indeed. Mayhap he sees something of his own lost youth in Crocus. In truth, Ralik is a man whose true nature escapes Crupper. 
fiercely loyal for certain, and one who, as you well know, honours his debts with such vigour as to humble those around him, excepting Krupper, naturally. Yet is it blood that travels his veins? One must wonder at times. A distant look had entered Mammoth's face. Krupper tensed. The air smelled of magic. He leaned forward and studied the old man seated across from him. Someone was communicating with Mammoth, and the warren that now pulsed in the room was familiar to Krupper. He sat back and waited. Eventually, Mammoth got swiftly to his feet. I have some research to do, he said distractedly. As for you, Krupper, Master Baruch wishes to speak with you immediately. I thought I sensed the alchemist's presence, Krupper said, rising with a soft grunt. Ah, the rigors of these fated nights ever urge us on. Until later, then, Mammoth. Goodbye, the scholar said, a frown on his face as he crossed the room. He entered the small chamber where Krupper had spent the past hour. Krupper adjusted the sleeves of his cloak. Whatever had happened, it had been enough to jar Mammoth's etiquette, and that alone hinted at dire events. Well, he murmured, best not keep Baruch waiting then. At least, he amended as he headed for the door, not for too long. Decorum demands that Krupper retain his sense of dignity. He shall walk fast, yes, but walk he shall for Krupper needs time to think, to plan, to scheme, to anticipate, to backtrack with some thoughts, to leap ahead with others, to do all the things necessary. First and foremost, Krupper must discern the nature of the woman who followed him, and who killed Chert, and who noted that Crocus saw the blood on her weapon, and who marked Ralik Nom as an assassin with his very arrival. She might well provide the key to everything and more, for the coin did indeed turn its face upon her, if only for a moment. And that, thinks Krupper, shall return to us all, for good or ill. He stopped and looked around, blinking rapidly. At the very least, he muttered, Krupper should leave Mammoth's room. He glanced back at the chamber Mammoth had entered. From within came the sounds of brittle pages being rapidly turned. Krupper sighed in relief, then left. Crone ruffled her singed feathers and hopped about in agitation. Where was that alchemist? She had a thousand things to attend to before the night was done, though in truth she couldn't think of any of them. Nevertheless, she disliked being kept waiting. The door to the study opened and Baruch strode through, gathering a robe about his considerable bulk. My apologies, Crone. I was otherwise indisposed. Crone grunted. Sorcery trailed from the man in thick, pungent streams. My master, Lord Anamanda Rake, she said without preamble, has commanded that I tell you what I told him of my adventures on the Rivy Plain. Baruch came up to where the great Revan paced on the map table. The alchemist frowned. You've been injured. Pride, no more. Hearken then to my story. Baruch raised an eyebrow. The old witch's mood was dark. He fell silent and she began. A small wooden puppet approaches from the north, a creation of soul shifting and sourced from a warren of chaos. Its power is immense, twisted, malign even to great ravens. It killed many of my kin as it slipped in and out of its warren. It evidently took pleasure in such acts. Crone snapped her beak in anger, then continued. It pursues a power I could not approach, and whatever this power, it strikes directly for the Gadrobi Hills. My lord and I are agreed in this. The power seeks something within those hills, yet we are not native to this land. Hence, we bring this news to you, alchemist. Two forces are converging on the Gadrobi Hills. My lord asks you why. Baruch's face had lost all its colour. 
he turned slowly and walked to a chair. Sitting down, he steepled his hands before his face and closed his eyes. The Malazan Empire seeks something it cannot hope to control, something buried within the Gadrobi Hills. Whether or not either force is capable of freeing that thing is another matter. Seeking is not the same as finding, and finding is not the same as succeeding. Crone hissed impatiently. Who is buried there, alchemist? A Jaghut tyrant, imprisoned by the Jaghut themselves. Generations of scholars and sorcerers have sought to find this barrow. None managed to discover even so much as a clue. Baruch looked up, his expression lined with worry. I know of one man here in Darugistan who has gathered all the available knowledge concerning this burial place. I must confer with him. I can give your lord this, however. There lies a standing stone in the Gadrobi Hills. I know its location precisely. It is almost invisible. Only its weathered top breaks the ground, perhaps a hand's span in height. The remaining twenty feet are beneath the earth. You will see the remnants of many pits and trenches that have been excavated around it, all fruitless. For while the stone marks the beginning point, it is not the entrance to the barrow. Where, then, is this entrance? That I will not tell you. Once I speak with my colleague, perhaps I can give you more details. Perhaps not. But the means by which the barrow is entered must remain a secret. This avails us nothing. My lord is extremely powerful, Baruch cut in. His intentions are anything but clear, Crone, no matter that we are allied. What lies within that barrow can destroy a city, this city. That I will not allow to enter Rake's hands. You shall have the location of the standing stone, for it is there that the hunters must first go. I have one question to ask, Crone. This puppet, are you certain it pursues this other power? Crone bobbed her head. It tracks, it hides when necessary. You assume both powers are Malazan. Why? Baruch grunted. <laughs> First, they want Darugistan. They'll do anything to win it. They've had access to vast libraries among the lands they've conquered. The Jaghut Barrow is no secret in and of itself. Second, you said both powers came down from the north. They can only be Malazan. Why one hides from the other is beyond me though I wouldn't doubt that there are competing factions within the Empire. Any political entity, as large as that one, is bound to be rife with discord. In any case, they pose a direct threat to Darugistan, and, by extension, to your Lord's desires to prevent the Malazan Empire from conquering us. Assuming that the powers are Malazan, seems warranted. Crone's displeasure was obvious. You will be kept informed of the activities on the Rivi Plain. My lord must decide whether to intercept these powers before they reach the Gadrobi Hills. She turned an angry eye on Baruch. He has received little assistance from his allies. I trust when we next speak that situation will be remedied. The alchemist shrugged. My first meeting with Anomanda Rake has proved my only meeting with him. Assistance demands communication. His tone hardened. Inform your lord that the present dissatisfaction exists with us as much as it does with him. My lord has been busy with his side of things, Crone muttered, flapping to the windowsill. Baruch stared at the bird as she prepared to leave. Busy? he asked darkly. 
In what way? In due time, alchemist, Crone groan purred. A moment later, she was gone. Baruch cursed, and with an angry gesture returned the window to its place and slammed the shutters. Doing this through magic and from a distance was not as satisfying as it would have been had he done it physically. Grumbling, he rose and walked to the mantelpiece. As he poured himself some wine, he paused. Less than half an hour ago, he had conjured a demon. It was not an ambitious conjuring. He had needed a spy, not a killer. Something told him he'd be calling upon far deadlier creatures in the near future. He scowled, then took a mouthful of wine. Mammoth, he whispered as he opened his warren. I need you. He smiled as a scene appeared in his head, of a small room on a stone hearth. Seated in the chair opposite his point of view was Crupper. Good. I need you both. The hound that approached Quick Ben was wide and heavy, its fur a pasty white. As it trotted up to the wizard, he saw that its eyes were also white. The creature possessed no pupils. It stopped a short distance away and sat. Quick Ben bowed. You are the hound called Blind, he said, mate to Baron and mother of Gear. I come seeking no harm. I would speak with your master. He heard a growl beside him and froze. Slowly he turned his head and looked down. Less than a foot from his right leg lay another hound, mottled brown and tan, lean and scarred. Its eyes were fixed on blind. Baron, he nodded. Another growl answered Baron's, this one behind the wizard. He turned further to see, ten feet away, a third hound, this one long, black and sleek. Its eyes fixed on him, glowed red. And Shan, he said quietly. He faced blind again. Have you found your quarry, or are you my escort? Baron rose silently beside him, its shoulders level with his chest. Blind stood, then trotted off to the left. She stopped and looked behind. Twin growls spurred Quick Ben after them. The land around them changed slowly, details slipping into sourceless shadows and re-emerging subtly altered. On what the wizard thought of as the north horizon, a grey forest climbed a slope to what might have been a wall. This wall was in place of sky. Maybe it was sky. But to Quick Ben, it looked strangely close, even though the forest was leagues away. Glancing overhead did not help him confirm or refute his feeling that this realm was bordered by a magical wall, for it, too, seemed close, almost within reach. Yet black clouds rode winds above him, skewing his perceptions and making him dizzy. Another hound had joined their company. This one, a male, was dark grey, one of its eyes blue, the other yellow. Though it didn't come close, Quick Ben judged that it was the largest of those around him, and its movement hinted at deadly speed. He knew it as Doan, firstborn to the pack's leader, Rude, and its first mate, Palik. Doan trotted alongside Blind for a time, then, when they came to the crest of a low rise, he bolted forward. Reaching the crest, Quick Ben saw their destination. He sighed. Just as the image carved upon the altar within the temples dedicated to Shadow Throne, Shadow Keep rose from the plain like an enormous lump of black glass, fractured with curving planes, rippled in places, with some corners glistening white as if crushed. The largest surface facing them, a wall, he supposed, was mottled and dull, as if it was a cortex, the weathered surface of obsidian. There were no windows as such, but many of the slick surfaces looked semi-translucent and seemed to glow with an inner light. As far as Quick Ben could see, there was no door, no gate, no drawbridge. They arrived, and the wizard exclaimed in surprise as Blind strode into the stone and disappeared. He hesitated, and Baron came as close to nudging him as Quick Ben allowed. 
he walked up to the mottled stone and held out his hands as he stepped into it. He felt nothing, passing through effortlessly, to find himself in a hallway that could have been found in any mundane estate. Barren of trappings, the corridor led straight forward for perhaps thirty feet and ended at double doors. Blind and Doan sat to either side of these doors, which now opened of their own accord. Quickben entered the room beyond. The chamber was domed. Opposite him stood a simple obsidian throne on a slightly raised dais. The dull, cobbled floor bore no rugs, and the walls were bare except for torches spaced every ten feet. Quickben counted forty, but the light was fitful, seeming to struggle against encroaching shadows. At first he thought the throne unoccupied, but as he approached, he saw the figure seated there. It seemed composed of almost translucent shadows, vaguely human in form, but hooded, preventing even the glint of eyes. Still, Quickben could feel the god's attention fixed solely on him, and he barely repressed a shiver. Shadow Throne spoke, his voice calm and clear. Shan tells me you know the names of my hounds. Quickben stopped before the dais. He bowed. I was once an acolyte within your temple, Lord. The god was silent for a time, then he said, Is it wise to admit such a thing, wizard? Do I look kindly upon those who once served me, but then abandon my ways? Tell me, I would hear from you what my priests teach. To begin upon the path of shadow, and then to leave it, is rewarded by the rope. I am marked for assassination by all who follow your ways, Lord. Yet here you stand, wizard. Quickben bowed again. I would strike a deal, Lord. The god giggled, then raised a hand. <laughs> no, Dishan, strike naught. Quickben stiffened. The black hound stepped around him and ascended the dais. She lay down before her god and eyed the wizard blankly. Do you know why I just saved your life, wizard? I do, Lord. Shadow Throne leaned forward. Shan wants you to tell me. Quickben met the hound's red stare. Shadow Throne loves deals. The god sighed and sank back. Acolyte, indeed. Well then, wizard, speak on while you can. I must begin with a question, Lord. Ask it. Does Gear still live? Shan's eyes flared, and she half rose before the god's hand touched her head. Now that, Shadow Throne said, is quite a question. You've managed something few, alas, have been able to do. Wizard, my curiosity is piqued. So, I answer you. Yes, Gear survives. By all means, continue. Lord, I would deliver into your hands the one who offended your hound. How? He belongs to Opon. Not him, Lord, but the one who led Gear to that chamber, the one who sought to take Gear's soul, and would have succeeded if not for Opon's mortal tool. In exchange for what? Quickben cursed inwardly. He could read nothing from the god's tone, and that made things even trickier than he'd expected. My life, Lord. I wish the rope's reward lifted from me. Anything else? Yes. He hesitated, then continued. I wish to choose the time and place, Lord. Otherwise, this one of whom I speak will escape your hounds through its warren of chaos. Only I can prevent that. Thus, it must be part of the deal. All that you need do is have your hounds ready. I will call upon you at the proper moment, providing you with the creature's precise location. The rest is up to your hounds. <laughs> You've planned this well, wizard, Shadow Throne said. As of yet, I can think of no way to kill both the creature and you. I commend you. 
How then do you intend to call upon me? Surely you'll not once again enter my realm. Lord, you will be contacted. I guarantee this, but I can say no more about it. And if I were to lay my powers upon you now, wizard, if I were to wring whatever lies hidden in that frail brain of yours, how would you prevent me? To answer that, Lord, you must answer my proposal first. Shan growled, and this time the god made no motion to still her. Quick Ben went on hastily. Given that you will seek to betray me at every opportunity, given that you'll hunt for the weaknesses in my plan, given all this, I would have your word that you will complete your part of the deal if all else fails you, Lord. Give me that, and I will answer your last question. Shadow Throne was silent for a long minute. Ah, well, he muttered. Your cunning is admirable, wizard. I am astonished, and I must admit, delighted by this duel. My only regret is that you departed the paths of shadow. You would have risen far. Very well. You have my word. The hounds will be ready. Now, why shouldn't I shred your brain here and now, wizard? Your answer, Lord, is in your very words. Quick Ben raised his arms. I did indeed rise far, Shadow Throne, in service to you. He opened his warren. You'll not have me, Lord, because you can't. Quick Ben whispered his word of recall, a word born of chaos. Power burst around him, and he felt as if a giant hand had closed around him. As it pulled him back into his warren, he heard Shadow Throne's scream of recognition. It is you, Delat, you shape-shifting bastard! Quick Ben smiled. He'd done it. He was out of reach. He'd done it. Again. Crupper was ushered into Baruch's study, with none of the delays he was so fond of confounding. Slightly disappointed, he took his seat and wiped his forehead with his handkerchief. Baruch entered. You took your time getting here, he growled. Well, never mind. Have you any news? Crupper laid his handkerchief on his lap and began carefully to fold it. We continue to protect the coin bearer as instructed. As for the presence of Malazan infiltrators, no luck. It was a major lie, but necessary. I am to convey a message to you, he continued. Most unusual in its source. Indeed, strange, in fact, was its delivery to Crupper. Get on with it. Crupper winced. Baruch was in a terrible mood. He sighed. A message to you personally, master. He completed folding his handkerchief and looked up. From the eel. Baruch stiffened. Then a scowl darkened his features. Why not? he muttered. The man even knows who my agents are. His gaze cleared and he watched Crupper. I'm waiting, he growled. Of course. Crupper shook loose his handkerchief and mopped his brow. Look to the streets to find those you seek. That and no more. Delivered to Crupper by the smallest child he'd ever seen. He stopped and shook his head. No. Such exaggeration would never do, not with Baruch's mood as foul as it appeared to be. A small child, in any case. Baruch stood, glowering at the dying embers in the fireplace, his hands clasped behind his back, fingers twisting a large silver ring. Tell me, Crupper, he asked slowly, what do you know of this eel? Little, Crupper admits, man, woman unknown. Origins are mystery. Designs perpetuating a status quo defined by aversion to tyranny, or so it said. Influence far-reaching. Even if one discounts nine out of ten rumors associated with the eel, his or her agents must number in the hundreds, all devoted to protecting Darugistan. 
It is said that Councilman Turban Orr is even now hunting them down, convinced they've ruined all his schemes. Mayhap they have, and for that we can all be relieved. Baruch seemed anything but relieved. Grappa thought he could almost hear the man's teeth grinding. However, he turned to Grappa and nodded. I have an assignment. For it, you will need to round up Morilio, Ralic, and Col, and take the coin bearer with you, just to keep him safe. Grappa raised an eyebrow. Out of the city? Yes. Paramount is the coin bearer. Keep him beyond anyone's reach. As for your mission, you will observe. Nothing more. Do you understand me, Krupa? Observe. To do anything else will be to risk the coin bearer falling into the wrong hands. While he is Opon's tool, he also is the means by which another ascendant can reach Opon. The last thing we need is gods battling on the mortal plane. Krupa cleared his throat. What are we to observe, master? I'm not sure. Possibly a foreign work party, digging here and there. Krupa started. As in road repairs? The alchemist frowned. I will be sending you to the Gadrobi Hills. Remain there until either someone comes or I contact you with further instructions. If someone comes, Krupa... You're to remain hidden. Avoid detection at all costs. Use your warren if need be. None shall find Krupper and his worthy, loyal comrades, Krupper said, smiling and waggling his fingers. Good. That will be all, then. Surprised, Krupper climbed to his feet. When are we to leave, master? Soon. I'll let you know at least a day beforehand. Is that sufficient time? Yes, friend Baruch. Krupa deems that more than enough time. Ralik appears temporarily indisposed, but with luck he shall be available. Get him if you can. If the coin bearer's influence turns against us, the assassin is charged with killing the boy. Does he understand this? We've discussed it, Krupa said. Baruch inclined his head and fell silent. Krupa waited a moment, then quietly left. Less than an hour after Quickben's soul had left the body seated on the hut's floor and journeyed into the shadow realm, it creaked back into life. Red-eyed with an exhaustion born of unrelenting tension, Kalam pushed himself to his feet and waited for his friend to come round. The assassin laid his hands on his long knives, just to be on the safe side. If Quick Ben had been taken, whatever controlled him might well announce its arrival by attacking anyone within range. Kalam held his breath. The wizard's eyes opened, the glaze slipping away as awareness returned. He saw Kalam and smiled. The assassin released his breath. Done? Success? Yes, on both counts. Hard to believe, isn't it? Kalam found he was grinning uncontrollably. He stepped forward and helped Quickbent to stand. The wizard leaned heavily against him, also grinning. He realized who I was just as I left. Quickbent's grin broadened. You should have heard him scream. Well, are you surprised? How many high priests burn the robes of their vestment? Not enough, if you ask me. Without temples and priests, the gods' bloody meddling couldn't touch the mortal realm. Now, that would be paradise, right, friend? Perhaps, said a voice at the doorway. Both men turned to see Sorry standing within the entrance, her half-cloak drawn about her slim body. She was wet with rain, and only now did Kalam notice the water dripping through cracks all around them. The assassin stepped away from Quick Ben to free his hands. What are you doing here? he demanded. 
You dream of paradise, wizard. I wish I'd heard the entire conversation. How did you find us? Quig Ben asked. Sorry stepped inside and pushed back her hood. I found an assassin, she said. I've marked him. He's in a place called the Phoenix Inn, in the Daru district. Are you interested? She asked, dully eyeing both men. I want answers, Kalam said in a low voice. Quick bend back to the far wall, to give the assassin room and to prepare his spells if need be, though he was in no real shape to marriage his warren at the moment. Nor, he noticed, did Kalam look up to a scrap, not that the assassin would allow that to stop him. Right now, he was at his most dangerous. That low tone had said it all. Sorry held her dead eyes on Kalam. The sergeant has sent me to you. A lie, Kalam interjected softly. Whiskey Jack doesn't know where we are. Very well. I sensed your power, wizard. It has a notable signature. Quickben was stunned. But I established a shield around this place, he said. Yes. I, too, was surprised, wizard. Usually, I cannot find you. It seems cracks appeared. Quick Ben thought about that. Cracks? He decided wasn't the right word, but Sorry didn't know that. She had sensed his whereabouts because she was what they'd suspected, a pawn of the rope. The Shadow Realm had been linked, however briefly and however tenuously, to his flesh and blood. Yet none but a servant of shadow possessed the necessary sensitivity to detect that link. The wizard moved to stand beside Kalam and laid a hand on the burly man's shoulder. Kalam threw him a startled glare. She's right. Cracks appeared, Kalam. She's obviously a natural talent in the ways of sorcery. Come on, friend. The girls found what we've been looking for. Let's move on it. Sorry pulled up the hood around her head. I am not accompanying you, she said. You'll know the man when you see him. I suspect it is his task to make his profession obvious. Perhaps the guild is anticipating you. In any case, find the Phoenix Inn. What the hell are you up to? Kalam demanded. I will be completing an assignment for the sergeant. She turned and left the hut. Kalam's shoulders slumped, and he let out a long breath. She's the one we thought her to be, Quick Ben said quietly. So far, so good. In other words, the assassin growled, if I'd attacked her, I'd be a dead man right now. Exactly. We'll take her out when the time's right, but for now we need her. Kalam nodded. Phoenix in? Damn right. And when we get there, the first thing I'm doing is buying a drink. Quick Ben smiled. Agreed. Raleigh looked up as the heavy set man entered the bar. His black skin marked him a southerner, which in itself was not unusual. What caught Raleigh's attention, however, was the horn handled silver pommeled long knives tucked into the man's narrow belt. Those weapons were anything but southern, and stamped on the pommels was a cross-hatched pattern, recognizable to all within the trade as the mark of an assassin. The man swaggered into the room as if he owned it, and none of the locals he shouldered aside seemed inclined to disagree with him. He reached the bar and ordered an ale. Raleigh studied the dregs in his own tankard. Obviously, the man wanted to be marked, Precisely by someone like Ralik Nom, a guild assassin. So, who was the bait then? This didn't fit. Ocelot, his clan leader, was convinced, along with everyone else in the guild, that Empire Claws had come into the city and now waged war against them. Ralik wasn't so sure. The man standing at the bar could as easily be seven cities as a traveller from Kalos. He had the look of Malazan Empire about him. Was he Claw? If so, 
Why show himself? Up until now, the enemy hadn't left a single clue or a single eyewitness as to their identity. The brazenness he now observed either didn't fit or marked a reversal of tactics. Had Volcan's order to go to ground triggered it? Alarm bells rang in Ralik's head. None of this felt right. Morilio leaned close to him. Is something wrong, friend? Guild business, Ralik replied. You thirsty? Morilio grinned. An offer I can't refuse. After a single bemused glance at Cole's unconscious form, slumped in the chair, the assassin left the table. What had all that been about five black dragons? He made his way to the bar. As he pushed through the crowd, he gave one youth a hard elbow to the back. The boy gasped, then surreptitiously slipped toward the kitchen. Raleigh arrived, called Skurve over, then ordered another pitcher. Though he did not look the man's way, he knew he had been marked by him. It was no more than a feeling, but one he had learned to trust. He sighed as Skurve delivered the foaming pitcher. Well, he had done what Ocelot had demanded of him though he suspected his clan leader would be asking for more. He returned to the table and conversed with Morilio for a time, plying his friend with the majority of the ale. Morilio sensed a growing tension around Raleigh and took his cue. He drained the last of his drink and rose. Well, he said, Crupper's scurried off, Crocus too, and Cole's once again dead to the world. Raleigh, I thank you for the ale, Time to find a warm bed. Until the morrow, then. Ralik remained seated for another five minutes, only once brushing gazes with the black man leaning against the bar. Then he rose and strode into the kitchen. The two cooks rolled their eyes at each other as he strode past. Ralik ignored them. He came to the door, which had been left ajar in hopes of a cooling draft. The alley beyond was wet, though the rain had passed. From a shadowed recess on the wall opposite the inn stepped a familiar figure. Ralek walked up to Ocelot. It's done. Your man is the big black one nursing an ale. Two daggers, hatch marked. He looks mean, and not one I'd like to tussle with. It's all yours, Ocelot. The man's pocked face twisted. He's still inside. Good. Head back in. Make sure you've been noticed. Damn sure, Nom. Ralek crossed his arms. I'm sure already, he drawled. You ought to draw him out, lead him into Talos' warehouse, into the loading grounds. Ocelot sneered. Falcon's orders, Nom. And when you head out, do it by the front door. No mistakes, nothing subtle. The man's an assassin, Ralek grated. If I'm not subtle, he'll know it's a trap and crawl all over me in seconds flat. You do as Falcon wills, Nom. Now get back inside. Ralek stared at his commander to make his disgust plain, then returned to the kitchen. The cooks grinned at him, but only for a moment. One look at Ralek's face was enough to kill any humour in the room. They bent their tasks as if prodded by a landmaster. Ralek entered the main room, then stopped dead in his tracks. Damn, he muttered. The black man was gone. Now what? He shrugged. Front door it is. He made his way through the crowd. In an alley on one side of which ran a high stone wall, Crocus leaned against the damp bricks of a merchant's house and gazed steadily at a window. It was on the third floor beyond the wall and behind its shuttered face was a room he knew intimately. There'd been a light on inside for most of the two hours he'd stood below, but for the last fifteen minutes the room within had been dark. Numb with exhaustion and plagued with doubts, Crocus pulled his cloak tighter around him. He wondered what he was doing here, and not for the first time. All his resolve seemed to have drained into the gutters along with the rain. Had it been the dark-haired woman in the Phoenix Inn? Had she rattled him that much? The blood on her dagger made it obvious that she wouldn't hesitate to kill him just to keep her secret intact. 
Maybe it was the spinning coin that had him so confused. Nothing about that incident had been natural. What was so wrong with his dream of being introduced to the Dahl Maiden? It had nothing to do with that killer woman in the bar. Nothing, he mumbled, then scowled. Now he was talking aloud to himself. A thought came to him that deepened his scowl. Everything had begun its mad unravelling the night he had robbed the maiden. If only he hadn't paused, if only he hadn't looked upon her soft, round, lovely face. A groan escaped him, and he shifted his feet. A highborn. That was the real problem, wasn't it? It all seemed so stupid now, so absurd. How could he have convinced himself that such a thing as meeting her was possible? He shook himself. It didn't matter. He had planned this. Now it was time to do it. I don't believe this, he muttered as he pushed himself from the wall and headed down the alley. His hand brushed the pouch tied to his waist. I'm about to put a maiden's ransom back. He came to the stone wall he'd been looking for and began to climb. He drew a deep breath. All right, let's get it done, he thought to himself. The stone was wet, but he had enough determination in him to scale a mountain. He climbed on and did not slip even so much as a single foothold. Chapter 13 There's a spider here in this corner, in that Her three eyes tiptoe in darkness, her eight legs track my spine, she mirrors and mocks my pacing. There's a spider here who knows all of me, her web my history full writ. Somewhere in this strange place, a spider waits for my panicked flight. The Conspiracy Blind Galan, born 1078 As soon as the guild assassin left the room, Kalam drained the last of his beer, paid up, and ascended the staircase. From the gallery railing, he studied the crowd below. Then, seeing that no one paid him much attention, he strode down the hallway and entered the last room on the right. He closed the door and locked it. Quickben was seated cross-legged on the floor within a circle of melted blue wax. The wizard was hunched over, bare-chested, his eyes shut and droplets of sweat trickling down his face. Around him the air shimmered, as if glossed with lacquer. Kalam walked around the wax circle to the bed. He took a leather satchel from a peg above the bedpost and set it down on the thin, straw-filled mattress. Peeling back the flap, he removed the contents. A minute later, he'd laid out the mechanisms for a goat's foot arbalest. The crossbow's metal parts had been blued, the narrow wooden stock soaked in pitch and dusted with black sand. Kalam slowly, quietly, assembled the weapon. Quick Ben spoke behind him. Done. Whenever you're ready, friend. The man left through the kitchen, but he'll be back, Kalam said, rising with the arbalest in his hands. He attached a strap to it and slung the weapon over one shoulder. Then he faced the wizard. I'm ready. Quick Ben also stood, wiping his forehead with a sleeve. Two spells. You'll be able to float, control every descent. The other should give you the ability to see anything magical. Well, almost anything. If there's a high mage kicking around, we're out of luck. And you? Kalam asked as he examined his quiver of bolts. You won't see me directly, just my aura, Quick Ben replied with a grin but I'll be with you all the way. Well, hopefully this'll go smoothly. We make contact with the guild, we offer the Empire's contract. They accept and remove for us every major threat in the city. He shrugged into his black cloak and pulled up the hood. You sure we can't just go downstairs and walk right up to the man? Lay it out? Kalam shook his head. Not how it's done. We've identified him, he's done the same with us. 
He's probably just made contact with his commander, and they'll arrange things to their liking. Our man should lead us now to the meet. Won't it be an ambush we're walking into, then? The large man agreed. More or less. But they'll want to know what we want with them first. And once that's out, I doubt the guild's master will be interested in killing us. You ready? Quick Ben raised a hand toward Kalam, then muttered briefly under his breath. Kalam felt a lightness come into him, rising to his skin and emanating a cushion of cool air that enveloped his body. And before his eyes, Quick Ben's figure formed a blue-green penumbra, concentrated at the wizard's long-fingered hands. I have them, the assassin said, smiling. Two old friends. Quick Ben sighed. Yes, here we are doing this all over again. He met his friend's gaze. Hood's on our heels, Cal. I can feel his breath on my neck these days. You're not alone in that. Kalam turned to the window. Sometimes, he said dryly, I have the feeling our empire wants us dead. He walked to the window, unlatched the shutters, then swung them inward and leaned both hands on the sill. Quick Ben came up beside him and rested a hand on his shoulder. They gazed out at the darkness, a brief sharing of unease passing between them. We've seen too much, Quick Ben said softly. Hood's breath, Kalam growled. What are we doing this for anyway? Maybe if the Empire gets what it wants, the Rujistan, they'll let us slip away. Sure, but who's going to convince the sergeant to walk out of the Empire? We show him he hasn't got any choice. Kalam climbed onto the sill. Good thing I'm not a claw anymore. Just soldiers, right? Behind him, Quick Ben touched his own chest and vanished. His disembodied voice held a note of wry amusement. Right. No more cloak and dagger games for old Kalam. The assassin pulled himself up, turning to face the wall, then beginning his climb to the roof. Yeah, I've always hated it. Quick Ben's voice was beside him now. No more assassinations. No more spying, Kalam added, reaching for the roof's edge. No more disguising spells. Clambering onto the roof, Kalam lay still. No more daggers in the back, he whispered, then sat up and scanned the nearby rooftops. He saw nothing, no unusual huddled shapes, no bright magical auras. Thank the gods, came Quick Ben's whisper from above. Thank the gods, Kalam echoed, then looked down over the roof's edge. Below, a pool of light marked the inn entrance. You take the back door. I've got this one. Right. Even as the wizard answered, Kalam stiffened. There he is, he hissed. You still with me? Quick Ben assented. They watched the figure of Ralik Nom, now cloaked, crossing to the far side of the street and entering an alley. I'm on him, Quick Ben said. A blue-green glow rose around the wizard. He rose into the air and flew out swiftly across the street, slowing as he reached the alley. Kalam climbed to his feet and padded silently along the roof's edge. Reaching the corner, he glanced down to the rooftop of an adjacent building, then jumped. He descended slowly, as if sinking through water, and landed without a sound. Off to his right, moving on a parallel path, was Quick Ben's magical aura. Kalam crossed the rooftop to the next building. Their man was heading for the harbour front. Kalam continued tracking Quick Ben's beacon, moving from one rooftop to the next, sometimes jumping down, at other times climbing. There was little subtlety about Kalam. Where others used finesse, he used the strength of his thick arms and legs. It made him an unlikely assassin, but he had learned to use that to his advantage. They now approached the harbour area, 
The building single-storied and large, the streets rarely lit except around the double-door entrances to warehouses, where the occasional private guard lingered. In the night air hung the taint of sewage and fish. Finally, Quick Ben stopped, hovered over a warehouse courtyard, then hurried back to Kalam, who waited at the edge of a nearby two-storied clearinghouse. Looks like the place, Quick Ben said, floating a few feet above Kalam. What now? I want a good line of sight to that courtyard. Follow me. Quick Ben led him to another building. Their man was now visible, crouching on the warehouse roof, attention down on the courtyard below. Cal, do you smell something bad about this? Kalam snorted. Hood, no. It's bloody roses out here. Take position, friend. Right. Ralik Nom lay down on the rooftop, his head out over its edge. Below was the warehouse's courtyard, flat, grey and empty. Directly beneath him, the shadows were impenetrable. Sweat trickled down Ralik's face. From the shadow below came Ocelot's voice. He's got you inside? Yes. And he's not moving? No. Listen, I'm sure there's more than one of them. I would have known if you'd been trailing me, and no one was. It stinks of Majory, Ocelot. And you know what I think about Majory. Damn it, Nom. If you'd just start using the stuff we gave you, you'd rank among the best of us. But to Hood's gate with that, we've got spotters. And unless there's a very good wizard around, we'd pick up on any magic. Face it. A note of malice entered Ocelot's voice. He's better than you. He tracked you all right, solo. What now? Ralik asked. Ocelot chuckled. <laughs> We're closing the circle, even as we speak. Your work's done, Nom. Tonight, the Assassin's War ends. In five minutes, you can head home. High above the city, a demon flapped on leathery wings, its green reptilian eyes surveying the rooftops below with a vision that detected magic as easily as it did heat. Though the demon was no larger than a dog, its power was immense, near par to the man who had summoned and chained it this very night. On the rooftops it saw two auras close together, one a man on whom spells had been cast, and the other a wizard, a very good wizard. In a ragged circle on either rooftops around these two, men and women moved inward, some betrayed by the heat of their bodies, others by items imbued with sorcery. Until now the demon rode the high night winds bored and resentful of its master, a mere mission of observation, for one of such power. But now the demon felt a surge of bloodlust. If only its master had been weaker, so that it could break the bonds and descend to the rooftops, then there would have been slaughter. The demon was musing on these thoughts, its eyes fixed on the scene below, when a booted heel rammed into the back of its small, round head. The creature spun, tumbling, then twisted round to face its attacker, rage blazing in its skull. A moment later, it was fighting for its life. The figure that closed with the demon possessed a blinding magical aura. Grappling, the surging energies of both collided, enwrapped like tentacles. The demon struggled against the savage pain constricting it as the figure pressed its attack. A cold that burned filled the demon's skull. A cold, alien in its breath of power, so alien that the demon could find no means of countering it. The two fell slowly as they fought, dueling in absolute silence with forces invisible to the city's inhabitants below, while around them other figures descended toward the warehouse, cloaks spread like sails, crossbows crooked in their arms, hooded faces angled downward and hidden beneath black masks. There were eleven in all that passed the demon and its attacker. None of the others paid any attention, and with this realization, the demon experienced an emotion it had never known before. Fear. Its thoughts turned from battle to survival, 
the demon tore itself from its attacker's grasp. Loosing a high-pitched cry, it flapped upward. The figure did not pursue, instead joining the others in their silent descent to the city. As the twelve shrouded assassins dropped toward the circle of men and women below, one splitting off and angling above the circle's two targets, they took careful aim with their crossbows and began a massacre. Kalam stared down at the assassin lying supine on the roof below, wondering what to do next. Were they waiting for him to initiate contact? A low growl escaped him. Something was wrong. He could feel it like fever in his bones. Damn it, Quick. Let's get out of here. Wait, came Quick Ben's disembodied voice. Oh, damn he said softly then. In front of Kalam, two brightly glowing shapes dropped down onto the roof below, landing behind their mark. What in Hood's name? Then he felt a slight tremor on the flat tiles beneath his hands. Kalam rolled onto his back, hearing a quarrel whiz past. Framed by his knees, a cloaked figure stood about thirty feet away. After missing with the quarrel, the figure raced forward, Another landed behind the first, near the roof's far edge. Galam scampered. He dropped down over the roof's edge. Quickben floated above him. The spell of deflection he'd raised about himself was a high-order majory, and he was certain he remained unseen by these new assailants. He watched as the approaching figure slowed, then padded cautiously to the roof edge, where Kalam had dropped from sight. Daggers gleaming in both gloved hands, the new assassin reached the edge and crouched. Quickben held his breath as the figure leaned forward. Kalam hadn't gone far. He gripped the roof's gables. When the attacker's upper body came into view, blotting out the stars behind it, he surged upward on the strength of one arm, his other shooting up to close on the assassin's neck with a vice-like grip. Kalam jerked the assassin downward, at the same time bringing up his knee. The attacker's cloth-wrapped face met his knee with a crunch. Kalam, still gripping the gable with one hand, gave the now limp figure a shake, then sent the body spiraling down to the street below. Gasping, he pulled himself back onto the roof. At the far end, he saw the second assassin whirl around. Growling, Kalam surged to his feet and sprinted at the figure. The unknown assassin stepped back as if startled, then brought a hand down and promptly vanished. Kalam slid to a stop and stood crouched, both hands hanging at his sides. I see her, Quick Ben whispered. With a hiss, Kalam spun in a full circle, then danced to one side, putting his back to the roof's edge. I don't. She's putting energy into it, Quick Ben said. I keep losing her. Wait, Cal. The wizard fell silent. Kalam's head snapped with every muted sound. His breath gusted in and out from his nostrils. His hands twitched. Wait. A low rumble came from his chest. Wait for what? A knife in his throat? All at once, the night exploded with sound and fire. The attacker burst into view immediately in front of Kalam, dagger flashing at his chest. Smoke and sparks rained from her, but she moved as if unaffected. Kalam twisted to one side, trying to avoid the blade. The dagger tore through his shirt below his ribs, sinking deep into his flesh, then ripping sideways. He felt a hot gush of blood as he drove a fist into the woman's solar plexus. She gasped, reeling back, threads of blood whipping from the dagger in her right hand. Kalam charged forward with a snarl. He closed, and ignoring the assassin's dagger, punched into her chest again. Ribs cracked. His other hand flat-palmed her forehead. The assassin sprawled backward, landing with a thump on the roof. Her body stilled. Kalam sank to one knee, drawing in gulps of air. Wait, you said. Damn it! What the hell's wrong with you, Quick? He pushed a knot of cloth into the wound below his ribcage. Quick! There was no reply. 
He tensed, then turned and scanned the lower rooftops. Bodies lay scattered here and there. The warehouse roof, where he'd seen two figures land behind their mark, was empty. Groaning softly, he sank down onto his knees. With the woman's attack, he'd heard something amid the flashing fires. A boom, no, two booms, very close together. An exchange of magic. His breath caught. Was there a third assassin? A wizard? Quickben had damaged this one, but someone else had damaged Quickben. Oh, Hood, he whispered, glaring about. Raleigh's first intimation of trouble was a sharp blow between his shoulder blades. The breath burst from his lungs, carrying with it the ability to move. His back throbbed, and he knew he'd been hit by a quarrel, but the Jazzerain armor under his shirt had withstood the impact. The quarrel's spiked head had pierced the iron, but had been too spent to push farther. Through the thumping pulse in his ears, he caught a pair of footsteps approaching him from behind. From the shadows below came Ocelot's voice. Nom! What's happening? Behind Ralik, the footsteps stopped, and there came the soft clacking of a crossbow being cocked. Ralik's wind returned, the numbness receding from his body. His own weapon lay beside him, ready. He waited. Nom! A soft footfall sounded behind him, and to the left. In one motion, Ralik rolled onto his back, grasped his crossbow, sat up, and fired. The assassin, less than fifteen feet away, was thrown back by the quarrel's impact, its weapon flying. Ralik heaved himself to one side, only now seeing the second attacker well behind the first. The figure crouched and fired its crossbow. The quarrel caught Ralik's upper chest on the right, then ricocheted up past his head to disappear into the darkness. The blow left his right arm numb. He struggled to his feet, unsheathing his knife, the hooked blade a blue flicker in the night. The assassin opposite him took a careful step forward, then backed away to the far edge and dropped over the side. Hood's breath! came Ocelot's voice beside Ralik. He turned but saw no one. He saw my magic, Ocelot said. Good work on the first one, Nom. Maybe we can finally determine who these people are. I don't think so, Ralik said, his eyes on the motionless body. An incandescent shimmer now wreathed it. As the body disappeared, Ocelot cursed. Some kind of recall spell, he said. Suddenly the clan master appeared in front of Ralik. His face twisted into a snarl as he glared about. We set the trap. We end up dead. Ralik did not reply. He reached over his shoulder, pulled out the quarrel, and tossed it to one side. The trappers had become the trapped, that was true. But he felt certain that the man who'd followed him had nothing to do with these newcomers. He turned and gazed up at the roof where his follower had been stationed. Even as he watched, there was a flash of red and yellow light and a double thunderclap. And in that instant, Ralik saw a silhouetted figure at the roof's edge, defending itself from a frontal attack. The flash winked out, leaving only darkness. Majory, Ocelot whispered. High-power stuff, too. Come on, we're getting out of here. They left quickly, climbing down into the warehouse court. Once she had marked them, Sorry could find the fat little man and the coin-bearer effortlessly. Though she'd intended to trail this crupper after leaving Kalam and Quickben in the hut, something had drawn her instead to the boy. A suspicion, a sense that his actions were, at least for now, more important than Krupper's meanderings. The coin-bearer was the last of Opon's influence, and the god's most vital player in the game. Thus far, she had done well in eliminating the other potential players. Men like Captain Parron, who had been the adjunct's aide, and by extension, a servant to the Empress. And there had been that claw leader in Pale, the one she had garroted. On her path to the bridge burners, others had been removed as well, but only as necessary. She knew that the boy would have to die, yet something within her seemed to be fighting that conclusion and it was a part of her she could not recognize. She'd been taken, 
born a killer two years ago on a coastal road. The body she dwelt within was convenient, suitably unmarred by the events of a dramatic life. A young girl's body, a young girl whose mind was no match for the power that overwhelmed it, obliterated it. But was it obliterated? What had the coin touched inside her? And whose voice was this that spoke with such power and determination in her head? It had come upon her before, when Whiskey Jack had uttered the word, see her. She tried hard to remember any dealings she might have had with a seer in the last two years, but none came to mind. She pulled her cloak tighter about her shoulders. Finding the boy had been easy, but as to what he was up to, that was another matter. On the surface it looked no more complicated than a simple theft. Crocus had stood in an alley studying a lighted window on the third floor of an estate, waiting until the light went out. Wrapped in unnatural shadows as she was, he had not seen her as he scaled the slick wall she leaned against. He climbed with impressive grace and skill. After he had gone, she found another vantage point, which allowed her full view of the room's balcony and sliding doors. This had meant entering the estate's garden, but there had been only one guard patrolling the grounds. She had killed him effortlessly, and now stood beneath a tree with her eyes on the balcony. Crocus had already reached it, had picked the lock, and he was quite good, she had to admit. But what thief would then spend close to half an hour in the chamber he was robbing? Half an hour, and still counting. She'd heard no alarms, seen no lights spring to life behind any of the estate's other windows, nothing to indicate that anything had gone wrong. So what was Crocus doing in there? Sorry stiffened. Sorcery had burgeoned in another part of Darugistan, and its flavor was known to her. She hesitated, unable to decide. Leave the lad and investigate this new, deadly emanation? Or remain here until Crocus re-emerged or was discovered? Then she saw something behind the balcony sliding doors that ended her indecision. Sweat ran down Crocus's face, and he found he had repeatedly to wipe it from his eyes. He had beaten the new triggers to get inside, the one on the balcony, the tripwire at the latch, and now padded to the makeup table. Once there, he froze, unable to move. Idiot! What am I doing here? He thought to himself. He listened to her soft, regular breathing behind him. Like the breath of a dragon. He was certain he could feel it gusting against the back of his neck. Crocus looked up and scowled at his own reflection in the mirror. What was happening to him? If he didn't leave soon... He began to remove his bag's contents. When he'd finished, he glanced again at his own face. To see another behind it, a round, white face watching him from the bed. The girl spoke. Since you're putting it all back, I prefer the proper arrangement. My makeup jar goes to the left of the mirror, she said in a whisper. The hairbrush goes to the right. Have you my earrings as well? Just leave them on the dresser. Crocus groaned. He had even forgotten to cover his face. Don't try anything he growled. I've returned everything, and now I'll leave. Understand? The girl pulled her blankets about her and moved to the bed's end. Threats won't work, thief, she said. All I need do is scream, and my father's master guardsman will be here in seconds. Would you cross your dagger with his short sword? No, said Crocus. I'd put it to your throat instead. With you as a hostage, with you between me and the guard, will he swing his blade at me? Unlikely. The girl paled. As a thief, you'd lose a hand, but kidnapping a highborn, it'd be the high gallows for you. Crocus tried to shrug casually. He glanced at the balcony, gauging how fast he could be outside and then up on the roof. That new tripwire was a nuisance. Stay where you are, 
the girl commanded. I'm lighting a lantern. Why? Crocus demanded, fidgeting. To see you better, she replied, and light bloomed in the room from the lantern in her lap. He scowled. He hadn't noticed it there so close at hand. She was ruining his plans, even as he made them. What's the point in seeing me better? He snarled. Just call your damn guards and have me arrested. Be done with it. He pulled the silk turban from his shirt and dropped it on the tabletop. That's all of it, he said. The girl glanced at the turban and shrugged easily. That was to be part of my costume for the fate, she said. I've since found a nicer one. What, he hissed, do you want with me? Fear showed momentarily on her face at his desperate outburst. Then she smiled. I wish to know why a thief who succeeded in stealing all my jewels should now be returning them. That isn't something thieves usually do. With good reason, he muttered, more to himself than to her. He stepped forward then stopped as she jerked back onto her bed, her eyes widening. Crocus raised a hand. Sorry, didn't mean to frighten you. Only, I want to see you better, that's all. Why? He was at a loss for an answer to that. After all, he couldn't very well tell her he'd fallen madly in love with her. What's your name? He blurted. Chalice Dahl. What's yours? Chalice. Of course, he said, rolling his eyes. You would be named something like that. He glared at her. My name? None of your business. Thieves don't introduce themselves to their victims. Her eyebrows rose. Victim? But I'm no longer a victim, am I? You've settled that by returning. I'd think she said slyly. You're more or less obliged to tell me your name, considering what you're doing. And you must be the type who treats obligations seriously, no matter how strange they seem. Crocus frowned at that. What was she talking about? What did she know about how he looked at obligations? And why was she right? My name, he sighed, defeated, is Crocus Younghand. And you're the daughter of the high-born Dahl, who all those suitors are lining up to be introduced to. But one day, you'll see me in that line, Chalice, and only you will know where you last saw me. It'll be a formal introduction, and I'll bring a gift, as is correct. He stared at her, horrified by his own words. Her wide eyes held his, emotion bright in them, emotion he had no hope of understanding. Then she burst out laughing. She immediately clapped her hand over her mouth, then jolted forward on the bed. You'd better go, Crocus. Someone will have heard me. Quickly, and beware the tripwire. Crocus moved woodenly to the balcony's sliding doors. Her laughter had been the final punctuation to all his dreams. He felt dead inside, except for a cynic's chuckle that might have been his own, given the odd look she threw him. Her blankets had fallen down around her, and once again she was naked. It astonished him in a distant way that she hadn't even seemed to notice. A voice came from beyond the door, leading to the hallway, indistinct. The girl hissed. Hurry, you fool! Alarm bells jangled in his head, awakening him. He had to move, and fast. Crocus stepped over the tripwire and opened the door. He paused to glance back at her and smiled as she clutched the blankets to her neck. Well, at least he'd won that much. A knock sounded on the opposite door. Crocus emerged onto the balcony and hitched himself up onto the railing. He looked down into the garden and almost fell. The guard was gone. In his place stood a woman, and though she was cloaked, something about her triggered instant recognition. The woman from the bar, and she was looking right at him with dark eyes that burned him deep inside. The door in the room opened and Crocus shook himself. Damn that woman, anyway, damn both of them. He grasped the eaves above his head and swung lithely up and out of sight. 
Kalam crouched motionless in the middle of the rooftop, a knife in each hand. Around him was silence, the night air tense and heavy. Long minutes passed. At times he convinced himself he was alone, that Quickben and the other wizard had left the roof, that they hunted each other in the sky overhead, or in the alleys and streets below, or on another roof. But then he'd hear something, a drawn breath, a scuff of cloth against leather, or a wisp of wind would brush his cheek on this windless night. Then, before his eyes, the darkness was shattered. Two shapes appeared hovering over the rooftop. The assassin had found Quick Ben, attacking with a bolt of fire that seemed to stun the wizard, then swiftly closing the distance between himself and the dazed man. Kalam surged forward to intercept. Quick Ben vanished, then reappeared immediately behind the assassin. The blue flash of power bursting from the wizard's hands struck the magic-wielding assassin full in the back. Clothes aflame, the man tumbled through the air. Quick Ben whirled to Kalam. Come on, get moving! Kalam ran, his friend flying beside him. As they reached the roof's edge, he turned for a last look. The assassin mage had somehow snuffed the fire from his clothes and was regaining his balance. At the far edge, two of his comrades appeared. Jump, Quick Ben said. I'll stall them. With what? Kalam demanded, tottering on the edge. In answer, Quick Ben produced a small vial. He spun in the air and hurled it. Kalam cursed, then jumped. The vial struck the rooftop and shattered with a thin tinkle. Beyond, the three assassins paused. Quick Ben remained his eyes on the white smoke rising from the glass shards. A figure took form within the smoke, growing in size. Its shape was almost insubstantial, the smoke stretching like threads in places, curling like wool in others. All that was visible within it was its eyes, two black slits, which it swung to Quick Ben. You, it said, its voice that of a child, are not Master Tashrin. That's right, Quick Ben said, but I'm in his legion. Your service remains with the Empire. He pointed across the roof. There are three who are the Empire's enemies, demon, Tista Andy, here to oppose the Malazan Empire. My name is Pearl, the Korvala demon said softly, then turned to the three assassins who had spread out along the far edge. They are not fleeing. Pearl said, with a note of surprise. Quick Ben wiped sweat from his forehead. He glanced down. Kalam was a vague shape waiting in the alley below. I know, he said to Pearl. That observation had unnerved him as well. One of Teishren's Korvalari could level a city if it so chose. They accept my challenge, Pearl said, facing Quick Ben again. Should I pity them? No, he answered. Just kill them and be done with it. Then I return to Master Tashren. Yes. What is your name, wizard? He hesitated, then said, Ben Adafon Delat. You are supposed to be dead, Pearl said. Your name is so marked on the scrolls of those high mages who fell to the Empire in seven cities. Quick Ben glanced up. Others are coming, Pearl. You're in for a fight. The demon lifted its gaze. Above them, glowing figures descended, five in the first wave, one in the second. This last one radiated such power that Quick Ben shrank back, his blood chilled. The figure had something long and narrow strapped to its back. Ben Adafon Delat? Pearl said plaintively. See the last one who comes. You send me to my death. I know, Quick Ben whispered. Flee then. I will hold them enough to ensure your escape. No more. Quick Ben sank down past the roof. Before he passed from sight, Pearl spoke again. Ben Adafon Delat, do you pity me? Yes, he replied softly, 
then pivoted and dropped down into darkness. Raleigh walked down the center of the street. On either side of the wide corridor rose columns from which gas torches jutted, casting circles of blue light onto the wet cobblestones. The light rain had returned, coating everything in a slick sheen. To his right and beyond the resident houses lining that side of the street, the pale domes of the high Thalanti on the hill glistened against the deep grey sky. The temple was among the oldest structures in the city, its founding blocks over 2,000 years old. The Thalanti monks had come, like so many others, carried on the wings of the rumour. Raleigh knew less about the story than did Murillo and Cole. One of the elder peoples was believed to have been entombed among the hills, an individual of great wealth and power, that was the extent of his knowledge. But it had been a rumour with many consequences. If not for the thousands of shafts sunk into the earth, the caverns of gas would never have been found. And while many of those shafts had collapsed or had been forgotten over the centuries, still others remained, now connected by tunnels. In one of the many chambers that honeycombed the ground beneath the temple, waited Vorkan, master of assassins. Raleigh imagined Ocelot making his descent, burdened with the news of disaster, and it brought a smile to his lean face. He'd never met Vorkan, but Ocelot suited those catacombs, just another of the city's rats rushing about beneath his feet. One day, Raleigh knew, he had become a clan leader, He'd meet Forkan face to face somewhere below. He wondered at how it would change him, and travelling down this path soured his thoughts with displeasure. He had no option. Once, he thought, as he approached the block of the Phoenix Inn long ago, there'd been choices he could have made that would have sent him on a different path. But those days were dead, and the future held only nights, a stretch of darkness that led down to the eternal dark. He would meet Vorkan, eventually, and he'd swear his life to the Guildmaster, and that would be that, the closing of the final door. And his sense of outrage at the injustices around him, the corruptions of the world, would wither in the unlit tunnels beneath Darujistan. In the exactness of the methods of assassination, his final victim would be himself. And this, more than anything, made his and Murillo's scheme the last act of humanity he'd ever make. Betrayal was the greatest of all crimes in Raleigh's mind, for it took all that was human within a person and made it a thing of pain. In the face of that, murder itself was surcease. It was quick, and it ended the anguish and despair of a life without hope. If all went as planned, Lady Simtal and those men who had conspired with her in the betrayal of her husband, Lord Cole, would die. Could that right the wrong? Could it even the scales of retribution? No, but it might return to a man his life and his hope. For himself, Raleigh, such gifts had long since been lost, and he was not the kind of man to stir the ashes. No embers survived, no flame could be born anew. Life belonged to other people, and his only claim to it was his power to take it from them. Nor would he recognize hope if it came to him. Too much a stranger, too long a ghost. As he neared the inn's entrance, Raleigh saw Crocus approaching from down the street. He increased his pace. Crocus, he called. The boy flinched. Then, seeing Raleigh, he stopped and waited. Raleigh took his arm and steered him toward the alley without saying a word. Once in the shadows, he tightened his grip, swung Crocus round, and pulled him close. Listen to me, he hissed, his face inches from the boy's own astonished visage. The guild's best was slaughtered tonight. This isn't a game. You stay off the rooftops. Do you understand me? Crocus nodded. And tell your uncle this. There's a claw in the city. The boy's eyes widened. And, Raleigh continued, there's someone else. Someone coming down from the sky, killing everything in sight. Uncle Mahmud, just tell him. And now, listen carefully, Crocus. 
What I'm about to say is from me to you, one to one. Understand? Crocus nodded again, his face pale. You stay on this path and you'll end up dead. I don't give a damn how exciting it all seems. What's excitement to you is desperation to others. Stop feeding off the city's lifeblood, lad. There's no hero's role in sucking others dry. Am I understood? Yes, Crocus whispered. Ralik released the boy's arm and stepped back. Now, leave. He shoved Crocus up the street, watching the boy stagger away and disappear around a corner. He drew a deep breath, surprised to find his hands trembling as he loosened his cloak's collar. Murillo stepped from the shadows. I'm not sure it'll work, friend, but it was a good try. He laid a hand on the assassin's shoulder. Master Baruch has a job for us. Krupa insists we bring Crocus along. Ralik frowned. Along? Are we leaving Darugistan, then? Afraid so. Go without me, Ralik said. Tell Baruch I can't be found. Everything's at a critical juncture, our planning included. Something else happening, Nom. You heard the message I gave Crocus for his uncle? Marilio shook his head. I came late to your scene. Saw you dragging the lad into the alley. Well, Ralik said, let's go inside. It's been a night to make Hood smile, friend. Together, the two men strode from the alley. In the street outside the Phoenix Inn, dawn's light crept through the mists of the lingering rain. In the center of the rooftop lay a large patch of ash and bone that crackled faintly and cast out the occasional hissing spark. Anomanda Rake slammed his sword into its sheath. I sent twelve of you, he said to the black cape figure standing beside him, and I see but eight. What happened, Serat? The Tista Andy woman was clearly exhausted. We've been working hard, Lord. Details, Rake said abruptly. Serat sighed. Jekaral has a broken neck and three cracked ribs. Boral's face is a mess. Broken nose, broken cheekbone, broken jaw. Who were they fighting? Rake asked, turning to his lieutenant in exasperation. Has the guildmaster come out of hiding? No, lord. Both Jacaral and Borald fell to a single man, not of the city's guild. Rake's eyes flashed dangerously. Claw? Possibly. He was accompanied by a high mage, the one who gave us this Korvala to play with. It had the smell of empire about it, Rake muttered, his gaze on the smoldering patch that had begun to eat its way into the roof. One of Tashrin's conjurings, I should think. A savage grin flashed. Pity to have disturbed his sleep this night. Dashtel was struck by a poisoned quarrel, Serat said. One of the guild's assassins managed that. She hesitated. Lord, we were hard-pressed in Brood's campaign. We're in need of rest. Mistakes were made this night. Some of the guilds slipped through our fingers, and had you not answered my request, we would have suffered more casualties destroying this demon. Rake placed his hands on his hips and surveyed the morning sky. After a moment he sighed. Ah, Surat, don't think me insensitive, but the guild master must be flushed. This guild must be shut down. He eyed his lieutenant. This claw you encountered, do you think a meat was being established? Not a meat, Surat answered. A trap. Rake nodded. Good. He paused, his eyes matching Surat's with a shade of violet. Return to Moonspawn, then. Have the High Priestess herself attend to Jacaral. Surat bowed. Thank you, Lord. She turned and gestured to the others. Oh, Rake said, raising his voice to address his cadre of assassin mages. One last thing. You've done well. 
exceptionally well. You've earned a rest. Three days and nights are yours to do with as you please. Surat bowed again. We will mourn, Lord. Mourn? The poisoned quarrel killed Dashtor. The poison was the product of an alchemist, Lord. One of some ability. It contained Parold. I see. Will you return with us? No. The lieutenant bowed a third time. As one, the eight Tista and E raised their hands, then vanished. Rake glanced down at the sizzling patch just as it ate through the roof and fell into darkness. There came a faint crash from below. Lord Anomanda Rake swung his gaze back to the sky, then sighed. Sergeant Whiskey Jack rocked his chair onto its back two legs and anchored it against the crumbling wall. The small, dingy room reeked of urine and damp. Two single beds, wood-framed with burlap mattresses stuffed with straw, ran along the wall to his left. The three other rickety chairs had been pulled up around the lone table in the room's center. Above the table hung an oil lantern, which shone down on Fiddler, Hedge, and Mallet as they sat playing cards. They'd done their work, finishing with the coming of dust just outside Majesty Hall. Until the alliance with the Maranth, the Malazan saboteur had been nothing more than a glorified sapper, a digger of tunnels. Maranth alchemy had introduced to the Empire a variety of chemical and powder explosives, most of which detonated when exposed to air. Applying a slow-working acid, wormholed the unfired clay shells. Sabotage had become an art, the precise equation of clay thickness and acid strength was tricky, and few survived to learn from their mistakes. To Whiskey Jack's mind, Hedge and Fiddler were terrible soldiers. He had trouble recalling the last time they'd unsheathed their short swords. Whatever discipline that had been part of their basic training had disintegrated through years in the field. Still, when it came to sabotage, they had no equals. Through hooded eyes, Whiskey Jack studied the three men sitting at the table. It had been some minutes since any of them had made a move or said a word. One of Fiddler's new games, he decided. The man was forever inventing new ones, improvising the rules whenever they gave him an edge. Despite the endless arguments, Fiddler was never short of players. And that's what boredom can do, he said to himself. But no. It was more than just boredom. Waiting gnawed, especially when it had to do with friends. Quick Ben and Kalam might be face down in some alley for all they knew, and that made it hard. Whiskey Jack's gaze strayed to one of the beds, on which lay his armor and longsword. Rust stained the Holberg's tattered chain like old blood. The links were missing in some places, torn in others. In his bones and muscles, the memory of that damage remained. Every cut, every blow now haunted him with aches, greeting him each morning like old comrades. The sword, with its plain leather-wrapped grip and stub hilt, lay in its hide over wood scabbard, the belt and straps draped over the bedside. That weapon had come to him after his first battle, found amid a field of dead. He'd still had the chalk of his father's quarry on his boots then, and a world's promise stretched out before him on the banners of empire. The sword had come to him shiny, without even so much as a nick in its honed blade, and he had taken it as his own personal standard. Whiskey Jack's gaze lost its focus. His mind had stepped into the grey, muddy tracks of his youth, where he walked with the familiar path, lost and blinded by an unidentifiable sorrow. The door flew open, carrying into the room a gust of steamy air and then trots. The bar guest's cold dark eyes met the sergeant's. Whiskey Jack stood quickly. He went to the bed and retrieved his sword. At the table, the others remained intent on their card game, their only betrayal of anxiety, a subtle shifting of chairs. Whiskey Jack pushed past Trotz and closed the door to a crack, through which he looked. Across the street, at the mouth of an alley, 
two figures crouched, the larger leaning heavily against the other. Whiskey Jack's breath hissed through his teeth. Mallet, he said over his shoulder. At the table, the healer frowned at the two saboteurs, then carefully set down his cards. The two figures in the alley crossed the street. Whiskey Jack's hand crept to grip his sword. Which? Mallet asked as he rearranged the blankets on one of the beds. Kalam, the sergeant replied. The two men reached the door and he swung it wide to let them through, then shut it again. He beckoned at Trotz, who walked over to the curtained window, pulling back a corner to watch the street. Kalam was pale, sagging against Quick Ben. The assassin's dark grey shirt was soaked with blood. Mallet moved to help the wizard, and together they carried Kalam to the bed. As soon as the healer had him laid out, he moved Quick Ben away and began removing Kalam's shirt. Quick Ben shook his head at Whiskey Jack and sat down in the chair Mallet had occupied. What's the game? he asked, picking up Mallet's cards and frowning as he studied them. Neither Hedge nor Fiddler replied. No idea, Whiskey Jack said, as he walked over to stand behind Mallet. They just sit and stare. Quick Ben grinned. Ah, a waiting game, right, Fid? He leaned back comfortably and stretched out his legs. Mallet glanced up at the sergeant. He'll be down for a while, the healer said. The wound is clean, but he's lost a lot of blood. Crouching, Whiskey Jack studied the assassin's pallid face. Kalam's gaze remained sharp, focused on the sergeant. Well, Whiskey Jack demanded, what happened? Quick Ben answered behind him. Had a bit of a mage duel out there. Kalam nodded in confirmation. And? Whiskey Jack asked, straightening to glare at the wizard. Quick Ben wilted slightly in his chair. It went sour. I had to release an empire demon to get us out alive. Everyone in the room went still. At the window, Trotz turned and made a tribal warding gesture, tracing the woad lines on his face. Whiskey Jack's voice was soft. It's loose in the city. No, the wizard answered. It's dead. Who did you run into? Whiskey Jack bellowed, throwing up his hands. Not sure exactly, Quick Ben said quietly. Whatever it was, it took care of the demon in less than a minute. I heard the death cry when we were only a block away. Assassin Mages, Sergeant, coming down out of the sky, seemed intent on wiping out the city's guild. Whiskey Jack returned to his chair and dropped into it, the wood complaining beneath him. From the sky, Tister Andy. Yes, Quick Ben muttered. We thought that. The sorcery had that flavor. Old, dark, and icy cold. Corralled Galane. From what we saw, Kalam added, they did a damn good job. No contact established, Sergeant. It was messy up there. So the moon's active here. Whiskey Jack paused, then pounded his fist on the chair's arm. Worse, the moon's lord is a move ahead of us. He reckoned we'd try to contact the gill. So what does he do? He takes out the guild, Kalam said. How's that for arrogance? Whatever arrogance that lord has, Whiskey Jack said, grimacing, he's earned it. I'll give him that. I wonder how good this city's guildmaster is. Good enough to take on Tister Andy? Unlikely. And about the other thing, Quick Ben said. It worked. The sergeant stared at the wizard for half a dozen seconds, then nodded. We also ran into sorry, Kalam said wincing as Mallet placed a hand on his wound. The healer muttered under his breath. Well, I sent her after some fat man she thought was important. How come she ran into you two? Quick Ben's brows had risen. So she told the truth then. We don't know how she found us, but she'd found the man we were looking for and gave him to us. Mallet raised his hand. Where the wound had been, there was now a pink scar. Kalam grunted his thanks and sat up. 
Whiskey Jack tapped his fingers against the chair's arm. If we only knew who was running this damn city, we could try it ourselves. The assassin sniffed. If we start taking out council members, maybe we'll flush out the real rulers. The sergeant frowned. Not bad, he said, rising to his feet. Work on that. The Moon's Lord knows we're here now, with that demon popping up. We'll have to move fast. Fiddler spoke up. We could blow up Majesty Hall, he said, smirking at Hedge. You've got enough munitions to manage that? Whiskey Jack asked. Fiddler's face fell. Well, uh, we've got enough to take out an estate, maybe. But if we pull up some of the mines we planted... Whiskey Jack sighed. This is getting absurd. No, we leave things as they are. He watched the non-existent card game. It seemed to involve complete immobility. A standoff. The sergeant's eyes narrowed. Were they trying to tell him something? Orange and yellow hues lit the eastern horizon, casting a coppery sheen upon the city's bricks and cobbles. Apart from the dripping of water, the streets were quiet, though the first emergings of citizenry were minutes away. Soon those farmers who had depleted their supplies of grains, fruits and root crops would take to their carts and wagons and depart the city. Merchant shops and stalls would open to catch the morning wave of shoppers. Throughout Darujistan, the grey faces prepared to shut the valves feeding gas to the torches lining the major avenues. These figures moved in small groups, gathering at intersections, then dispersing with the day's first bell. Sorry watched Crocus wearily ascend a tenement's front steps. She stood half a block down the street, within shadows that seemed reluctant to disappear despite the growing light. A short while earlier, she had felt the Empire Demon's death strike her almost physically, deep in her chest. Normally demons fled back to their realm once enough damage had been inflicted on them, enough to sever the links of summoning. But the Korvala had not been simply cut down or forcibly dismissed. There had been a finality to its end that had left her shaken, a death in truth. She still recalled its silent, despairing scream ringing in her head. All the ambivalence surrounding the coin-bearer was gone, driven away. She knew now she would kill him. It had to be done, and soon. All that remained before she could do so was the mystery of his actions. To what extent was Opon using the boy? She knew he'd seen her in the Dahl's garden just before he had escaped to the estate's roof. Seeing the light come on behind the balcony sliding doors had clinched her decision to continue following Crocus. The Dahl family was powerful in Darugistan. That the boy seemed to be involved in a clandestine love affair with the daughter was an outrageous proposition. Yet what else could she conclude? So the question remained. Was Opon working through the boy directly, insinuating a peculiar influence with the city council? What powers of influence did this young maiden possess? Only a matter of position, of possible scandal. Yet what was the political position of Councilman Estrasian Dahl? Sorry realized that even though she had learned much of Darugistan's political arena, she still did not know enough to second-guess Opon's moves. Councilman Dahl was Turban Orr's principal opposition on this proclamation of neutrality business. But what did that matter? The Malazan Empire could not care less, unless the proclamation was no more than a feint. Was this Turban Orr seeking to lay the groundwork for an empire-backed coup? The answers to such questions would be slow in coming. She knew she'd have to exercise patience. Of course, patience was her finest quality. She had hoped that showing herself to Crocus a second time, there in the garden, might trigger panic in the lad. Or, at the very least, annoy Opon if indeed the god's control was as direct as that. Sorry had watched on, from the shadows she drew around her, as the assassin named Ralik took the lad to task. She'd also lingered to catch the conversation between Ralik and Murillo. It seemed the boy had protectors, 
and an odd lot they were, assuming that the fat little man Crupper was some kind of group leader. Hearing that they were to take Crocus out of the city on behalf of their master made the whole situation even more intriguing. She knew she'd have to make a move soon. The protection offered by Crupper and this Murillo would not impede her much, she expected. Though Crupper was certainly more than he seemed, violence hardly seemed his major skill. She would kill Crocus then, outside the city. As soon as she discovered the nature of their mission and who their master was. As soon as everything had fallen into place. Sergeant Whiskey Jack would have to wait a while longer for her return. Sorry smiled at that, knowing full well how relieved the whole squad would be that she was nowhere to be seen. As for that whole matter, the threat presented by Quick Ben and Kalam, well, everything in its own time. Alchemist Baruch's savage migraine was ebbing. Whatever presence had been unleashed in the city was gone. He sat in his reading chair, pressing a cloth-wrapped chunk of ice against his forehead. It had been a conjuring. He felt certain of that. The emanation stank of demonry. But there'd been more. The moment before the presence vanished, Baruch had experienced a mental wrench that came close to driving him into unconsciousness. He had shared the creature's final death scream, his own shriek echoing down the hall and bringing his men-at-arms shouting to his Baruch felt a wrongness deep within him, as if his soul had been battered. For a single brief second, he had looked upon a world of absolute darkness, and from that darkness came sounds, the creak of wooden wheels, the clank of chains, the groans of a thousand imprisoned souls. Then it was gone, and he found himself sitting in his chair, rolled kneeling at his side with a pail of ice from the cellar. He now sat in his study, alone, and the ice pressed against his brow was warm compared to what he felt in his heart. There was a knock at the door, and Roald entered, his face creased with worry. Lord, you have a visitor. I have, at this hour. He rose shakily to his feet. Who is it? Lord Anamanda Rake, Roald hesitated, and... Another. Frowning, Baruch waved a hand. Bring them in. Yes, Lord. Rake entered, holding a dog-sized winged creature by the nape of its neck. The creature twisted and hissed, then turned pleading eyes to Baruch. This thing was following me here, Rake said. Yours? Startled, Baruch managed a nod. I thought as much, Rake said, releasing the demon to flap across the room and land at the alchemist's slippered feet. Baruch gazed down on it. The demon was trembling. Rake strode to a chair and sat, stretching out his long legs. A busy night, he said. Baruch gestured and the demon vanished with a faint popping sound. Indeed, he said his voice hard. My servant was on a mission. I had no idea it would involve you. He went to stand before the Tista Andii. Why were you in the middle of an assassin war? Why not? Rake answered. I started it. What? He smiled up at Baruch. You don't know the Empress as well as I do, Baruch. Please, explain. Color had risen in the alchemist's face. Rake looked away. Tell me this, Baruch, he said, turning to meet the alchemist's gaze. Who in this city is most likely to be aware of your secret council? And who might benefit the most from your removal? And, most importantly, who in this city is capable of killing you? Baruch did not answer immediately. He walked slowly to the table where a newly painted map had been laid out. He leaned over it, hands resting on the edge. You suspect the Empress might seek out Vorkan, he said, a contract to offer. 
On you and the rest of the High Mages, Rake said behind him. The Empress has sent a claw here, not so much to worry your city's defenses, but to establish contact with the Master Assassin. I wasn't entirely certain that I was right in this, but I meant to prevent that contact. Baruch's eyes remained on the map's red wash. So you sent your own assassins to wipe out her guild, to flush her out. He faced Rake. And then what? Kill her? All on the basis of some suspicion of yours? This night, Rake said calmly, we prevented the claw from making that contact. Your demon's report will confirm this. Besides, you aren't suggesting that the death of Vorkan and the decimation of the city's assassins is a bad thing, are you? I fear I am. Baruch was pacing, struggling against a growing sense of outrage. I may not know the Empress as well as you, Rake, he said, gritting his teeth, but I do know this city far better than you ever will. He glared at the Tista Andy. To you, Darugistan is just another battleground for your private war with the Empress. You don't give a damn about how this city survives, how it has managed to survive three thousand years. Rake shrugged. Enlighten me. The city council has its function, a vital one. They are the city's machine. True, Majesty Hall is a place of pettiness, corruption, endless bickering. But despite all that, it's also a place where things get done. What's that got to do with Vorkan and her gang of killers? Baruch grimaced. Like any burdened wagon, the wheels require grease. Without the option of assassination, the noble families would have long since destroyed themselves taking the city with them through civil war. Secondly, the guild's efficiency provides a measure of control on vendettas, arguments, and so forth. It is the guaranteed option of bloodshed, and bloodshed is messy, usually too messy for the nobility's sensibilities. Curious, Rake said. Nevertheless, don't you think that Forkan would listen very carefully indeed to an offer from the Empress? After all, Lassine has the precedent of handing over the rule of a conquered city to an assassin. In fact, at least a third of her present high fists come from that profession. You are missing the point. Baruch's face was dark. You did not consult us. And that cannot be tolerated. You haven't answered me, Rake retorted, in a voice quiet and cold. Would Vorkan take the contract? Could she manage it? Is she that good, Baruch? The alchemist turned away. I don't know. That's my answer to all three questions. Rake stared hard at Baruch. If you were indeed nothing more than an alchemist, I might believe you. Baruch's smile was wry. Why would you think me anything but? Now it was Rake's turn to smile. There are few who would argue with me without flinching. I am unused to being addressed as an equal. There are many paths to ascendancy, some more subtle than others. Baruch walked over to the mantel above the fireplace, took a carafe, then went to the shelf behind his desk and retrieved two crystal goblets. She's a high mage. We all have magical defenses. But against her... He filled the goblets with wine. Rake joined the alchemist. He accepted the glass and raised it between them. I apologize for not informing you. In truth... The thought hadn't crossed my mind as being especially important. Until tonight, I was acting on a theory, nothing more. I didn't consider the ripples a grounded guild might cause. Baruch sipped his wine. 
And Amanda Rick, tell me something. There was a presence in our city tonight, a conjuring. One of Tashrin's Korvala demons, Rake answered, released by a claw wizard. He took a mouthful of the tart liquid, let it roll for a moment, then swallowed with satisfaction. It's gone. Gone? Baruch asked quietly. Where? Out of Tashren's reach, Rake said, a tight smile on his lips. Out of anyone's reach. Your sword, Baruch said, repressing a shiver as the memory of that closing vision returned to him. The creak of wheels, the clank of chains, the groans of a thousand lost souls. And darkness. Oh, yes, Rake said, refilling his goblet. I received the two pale wizards' heads, as you promised. I admire your efficiency, Baruch. Did they protest? Baruch paled. I explained to them the options, he said quietly. No, they didn't protest. Rake's soft laugh chilled the blood in Baruch's veins. At the distant sound, Cropper rose. The small fire flickered steadily before him, but its heat seemed less. Ah, he sighed. Cropper's hands are near numb, yet his ears are as sharp as ever. Listen to this faint sound in the very nether regions of his present dream. Does he know its source? Perhaps, Kral said beside him. Startled, Cropper turned, his eyebrows rising. Cropper thought you long gone, Eldering One. Nonetheless, he is thankful for your company. The hooded god nodded. All is well with the child Tatasail, the Rivi protector, and she grows swiftly, as is the nature of soul taken. A powerful warlord now shelters her. Good, Krappa said, smiling. The noises in the distance drew his attention again. He stared out into the darkness, seeing nothing. Tell me, Krappa. Kral said, what do you hear? The passing of a great wagon or some such thing, he replied with a frown. I hear its wheels and chains and the groaning of slaves. Its name is Dragnipur, Kral said, and it is a sword. Krupper's frown deepened. How can a wagon and slaves be a sword? Forged in darkness, it chains souls to the world that existed before the coming of light. Krapa, its wielder, is among you. In Krapa's mind, his deck of dragons rose. He saw the image of half-man, half-dragon, the knight of High House Darkness, also known as the Son of Darkness. The man held aloft a black sword trailing smoky chains. The night is in Darugistan, he asked, fighting a shiver of fear. In Darugistan, Kral replied. Around Darugistan, above Darugistan. His presence is a lodestone to power, and great is the danger. The elder god faced Krapa. He is in league with Master Baruch and the Torad Kabal. Darugistan's secret rulers have found a two-edged ally. Dragnipur tasted a demon soul this night, Krapa, in your city. It is never thirsty for long, and it will feed on more blood before this is done. Can anyone withstand it? Krapa asked. Kral shrugged. None could when it was first forged, but that was long ago. I cannot answer for the present. I have one other piece of information, Krapa. A small piece, I'm afraid. Krapa hearkens. 
The journey, Master Baruch, is sending you on to the Gadrobi Hills. Elder magic brews anew after so long. It is Telan of the Imas, but what it touches is Omto's Felak, Jaghalt Elder Magic. Krapa, stay out of their way. Especially guard the coin bearer. What is about to come is a danger as grave as the knight and his sword, and as ancient. Step carefully, Krapa. Krapa always steps carefully, Eldering One. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.